morning. Today, Sarah has a one-man show, so to say, because she's also administrating the, the technical part. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's okay. Uh, because... Good morning, Dr. Rushin. I, I, it's nice to meet you. Good <laughs> morning. Uh, I'm still here. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking forward to All the I'm time. Looking the paper. Uh, Lucia, you are very quiet. I haven't heard a word from you. <laughs> Good morning, Harry. <laughs> But your, your smile lights up the whole of Zagreb, so it doesn't, <laughs> doesn't make any difference. I know I've been saying that to you, but only for about 20 years, you know, so. <laughs> oh, dear, oh, dear. And I think of Zagreb, I think of your beautiful smile, Lucia. It's Thank you. <laughs> I, you know, I was just thinking, it's, we must know each other for nearly, I mean, you were just a, I think you were an undergraduate when I met you first. In fact, yes. you were. Yeah. Uh, I think it was uh, 2000. Yes, I know. It's, it really is 20 years. <laughs> That's amazing. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Uh, well, we're still here, Lucia. Still, st still doing the dance, you know. It's great. Yeah. And who? Walter is connecting. Ah, excellent. So, so I got your message. Thank you, Vera. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh -huh, very good. What did you say? Hello, everybody. <laughs> ah, <laughs> Dr. Stanislav, how are you? Well, never better. Excellent. Yes, be, being so close to my dear wife. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, well, that's a, that's good news, I would think, you know, for everybody. <laughs> yeah. For a change, some good news. <laughs> yeah. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Well, I hope you had a good night's sleep last night. Um, I, I certainly did. You did? Yes, I did. Thank you. Yes, I, I drank. I, I, we also, we, we were a bit tired yesterday. It was a long day. It was a long day. It yes. was a long day, yes, yes. But... Uh, Today is a pretty long day. Well, it ends what, about two o'clock or something, but it's two. It's a pretty big session today. Yes, it's like yesterday's one, seven papers. Yes, exactly. But, uh, or today six, maybe, I don't know. But yeah. uh, I think it's better that uh, it, it, instead of this Andrea Daru, who is ill and cannot participate, yeah. that Sarah jumps in so that the second session when people are more tired, Uh, will be shorter then. Exactly. Do you, do you want me to announce that, Vera? That, uh, yes, please. Yeah, yeah, just yes. change the program, yeah. Uh, well, that's, 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 some people react badly to the, to the uh, vaccine, you know. I, I was talking to a, a PhD student of mine yesterday, and he's only uh, 27. And oh. he had the Pfizer and he reacted very badly to it. Um, young men, apparently. And then young women with uh, AstraZeneca. So, oh. So, you know, I'm, for once, I'm relieved that I'm not a young man or a young woman. <laughs> so far anyway it's, but it's, these reactions it's so individual you cannot predict oh, anything yeah. and you, you can drive uh, any conclusions yeah so uh, well I don't know we're, we're, we seem to be behind the rest of Europe but we're catching up slowly so I haven't had my second jab yet but uh, they're saying now that in Ireland they will narrow the gap from 12 weeks to 8 weeks for Oh, really? It, it yeah. might be here as well. We need also the second round. Yeah. We didn't get it yet, and we should do it now soon, I think this month. Okay. I, I got my invitation for a second July, but uh, now as they are shortening the periods, maybe I'll get it uh, earlier. Well, that's, that's good. Yeah, I don't know when mine would have... It should have been sometime late July, I think, so... Perhaps it'll be around my birthday instead or something. You should come to Hvar. You can get your vaccine here in Croatia as well. Oh, no, don't know. tell me. Don't tell me, my love. <laughs> you, 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 you'll be saying to Stanislav, oh my God, I think he's actually coming. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> oh well, no, I'm my 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 heart is set on November, Vera. That's what I'm really hoping for. Uh huh. I mean, for Zagreb, you know. Good morning to everybody. Good, Good morning, morning Nikolai. Nikolai. How are you? Hello, yeah. Hello, everybody. How are you? Harry, nice. Harry, yeah. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, oh dear. Yeah, I think. <laughs> Did you sleep well yesterday, Nikolai? That was a long day. Indeed, yeah, because after six, I had another, another point, uh, appointment at the uh, embassy of France in Bucharest. Oh. And uh, well, I came back to the home around 12 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a nice appointment. <laughs> yeah. And the night was extremely, um, the sleep was extremely fast. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Very good. Yeah. I'm being too tired. Oh. Mm. Well, I'm sure it's sunny in Zagreb and Bucharest and Bratislava, but it's rather dull here. I'm sorry to say. Uh, it's sunny, but it will change. It will it will uh, start to rain, I think, in the evening. But I hope it's just temporarily. We had a lot of rain this uh, spring, so. Oh, okay. Yeah, the same in Bucharest. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh huh. The same cloud. <laughs> right. <laughs> I assure you, we are the experts on rain. <laughs> oh, of course, you're right. Of course. I think it's true that, you know, even if you're away for a very short time um, and you come back, you're landing in Ireland, you just, as you're coming in, you think, oh my God, it's so green and it's so wet, you know, it's extraordinary. It really is very green, I think, especially in the summer, it's greener than other. You can count on the rain, that's for sure. Yeah. yeah. Right. <sighs> Here comes Peter. Okay. Yeah. Yesterday I was playing with Zoom, but and I did something which I didn't uh, turn back. Good morning, Peter. Good, Good morning. morning, Peter. Hi, everybody. I switched left and right side, so it's opposite to that, but never mind. <laughs> I don't have a PowerPoint, so. Oh, very good. <laughs> oh, dear, oh, dear. <laughs> well, I yesterday when I was giving my paper, I was I, I think it went the music examples went fine, but Viera will tell you that uh, when it comes to anything technical, you know, it's bound to go wrong. And 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 uh, in my case, and it was late on Wednesday night, I think, or whatever night. Well, sorry, where are we now? Saturday. So late on Thursday night, I was zooming with friends and and just said, can can you just do you mind for one moment, I just see if you can see as well as hear these examples? And they were going, can't see them. <laughs> we can hear them, we can't see them. So I had had a conference last week and a wonderful technical assistant, a young guy in Belfast. And at 10 o'clock on Thursday night, I sent him an email and he said, sure, I can fix this for you right now. And that was so kind, you know, but... Uh, so and that it, was a similar problem which we had yesterday also. Yeah. It could be heard but not seen. Exactly. But, uh, later I spoke with Sarah and I think we, uh, well, we managed it yesterday already, but the easier way would be another one. But, well, yeah. you learn, you learn all the time. So. Yes, you do. Yes. And then you forget again and you have to go looking for help again. At least that's my experience. You have to Zoom every day then. <laughs> Well, it's getting like that these days. Ha, Petra, bok, dobro jutro. Hi, dobro jutro. Good morning, Petra. Good morning, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. Emesha is also here. Who is here? Emesha Shofalvi. Hello. I can't see her. Uh, she, she will just... Oh, yeah. She's in con process of connecting. Oh, excellent. <laughs> Okay. Oh, I can see her. I can see her now. Bill is also. Bill is here. Yes, I see Bill and his dogs. Hello. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Amisha. Good morning. Good morning. Oh. Ah, domagoi. Dobro jutro. Yeah. 
Be good. Katya is approaching. <laughs> You're like an air traffic controller, Vera. <laughs> yes. Now I want people to collect to, to see them in order to make a photo. <laughs> oh, right. Very good. Hello, Amesha. <laughs> Hi, Amesha. Uh, in the car. Oh. <laughs> Amesha is following us in the car. She's driving. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what a freak. <laughs> I'm not driving. It's my husband who's driving. I'm oh. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, but you are in the... too much of networking. <laughs> uh, you, you are, but you are in the car with him, aren't you? Yes, yes oh, I'm oh, sorry. That's it. We're on our way, but I will be in 20 minutes. I will be able to put my uh, real camera on. <laughs> okay, no problem. <laughs> I didn't, want, I didn't want to miss this uh -huh. day. Uh, yes, of course. Very good. You didn't want to miss Peter Bozo. <laughs> <laughs> He's the first one today. So, uh, well, we're almost at the hour. It's all, well, it's, it's just coming up to. Uh, yes. Eight o'clock in my case. Inya, dobro jutro. Dobro jutro. <laughs> Kako ste? Dobro. Evo, okay. dopravila u Hrvatsku. <laughs> ali... A došli ste u Hrvatsku? Došla sam, došla sam, ali nam je trebalo valjda dva dana. <laughs> Eto, super. Kak... Kako je bebica? Dobro, velika. Ima dve i pol godine. Sad je sa bakom i dedom. <laughs> A, bravo. Aha. Znam. Puno <laughs> vremena je prošlo. Da. Kako ste vi? Evo, radno. Radno, vidim. Inja, da. da iskoristim priliku, mogu li vam poslati jedan tekst za Irasum za recenziju? Kako da ne? Dobro, o, hvala. Odlično. Ok, da. dobit ćete ovih dana. Može, može. Odlično. Kako ide sve? Ima puno ljudi? Vidim je, je, je. Evo, 50 referenata, 46 referata, odnosno 45, jer je danas otpala jedna, pa ćemo imati 20 minuta kraće dan. Mm -hmm. Dobro, super. Tako da, ovaj, ali prije vas će uskočiti Sara umjesto nje, pa dobro, to, to će sad najaviti kolega. Okay. Lili, hello, good hello. morning. Good morning. <laughs> good morning. Lili. Domagoj, kako je? Domagoj, okay. ču, čujemo se. Vera, do you want to take your photograph? Because it's... It's just coming up to the hour. It's just past yes. It's nine. it's one minute past nine. Yeah, yes. I uh, I need my early morning photo. Please show yourself if if possible. So, in order to make a print screen. <laughs> well done, Amesha. She's doing it in the car. It's excellent. Okay. <laughs> Bravo. 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 Okay. Well then. Thank it, you. If everybody is agreeable, we'll, we'll begin. Um, welcome to the, uh, I suppose you could say the penultimate uh, session of this uh, wonderful conference. Uh, we have two sessions this morning and this afternoon, both on publishers, institutions and cities. And uh, it's a great uh, joy as well as a privilege to uh, chair, these, uh, chair this first session, rather long session. Um, and I just have one uh, item of business to report. Unfortunately, Andrea Daru from Budapest has had to withdraw because of illness. Although I'm sure I'm assured that she, she will be better soon. So um, very sorry, Andrea, if you're looking in uh, that you can't be with us this morning. Um, and Sarah Rees, who was to speak this afternoon, uh, has very gallantly agreed uh, to speak uh, in Andrea's place. So she will be speaking at 10 o'clock this morning, so just about an hour from now. So thank you, Sarah, very much for that. I think you have your hands full because I gather you're also acting as host uh, for the sessions today. Um, our first speaker this morning is my dear friend and colleague, Peter Bozo, uh, who is, as you will, many of you will know, a very distinguished research 
uh, fellow at the Institute for Musicology in the Research Center for the Humanities uh, of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences in Budapest. And, uh, he's speaking this morning on a, on a topic which is, I would say, central to his, his research. As you know, he's a very distinguished scholar um, of operetta and indeed of Franz Liszt. And his topic this morning is called Operetta in the Budapest Folk Theatre, Yeno Rakoji and his network for vernacularizing an international musical theatrical genre. So please welcome Peter Bozo. Thank you, Harry, for this very kind introduction. First, I would uh, share my slideshow because I have a presentation. Can you see my slideshow? Okay. Yes. Just put the whole screen. Yes, yeah. perfect. Okay. <laughs> so, dear colleagues, <clears throat> in my paper, I would like to point out what kind of role Yanu Rakoshi played in vernacularizing the international genre of operetta in Budapest, mainly, but not exclusively, as the director of the Budapest Folk Theatre. At first, I will briefly introduce Rakosh's figure and his long career spanning from the Austro-Hungarian Compromise to the interwar period. In the second part of my paper, in accordance with the subject of uh, the present conference, I will show you how the members of his family might have contributed to his theatrical activity as a network during the late 19th and early 20th century. Finally, I will provide a summary about the diverse facets of his activity as a theater director, with particular respect to the practice, how performing materials were obtained. Without doubt, Yanu Rakoshi was a key figure of the Budapest intellectual life during the period of the late Austro-Hungarian monarchy. It should be noted, however, that he came not from the capital. He was born in, 19, in 1842 in Achad, a relatively small village near the austria hungarian border. His mother tongue was German. Nevertheless, despite the fact that as a schoolboy he wrote German verses, he became an assimilated Hungarian and perfectly mastered his adopted language as it is attested by his literary works. From a biographical point of view, the most important of these literary works is his three-volume three memoirs entitled Recollections, which was published in 1926. It should be noted, however, that at the time he was writing this work, he was more than 80 years old. But it's more he evaluated the events of his life quite subjectively. Another factor which affected his posthumous reputation was his conflict with the more younger generation of modernist bourgeois writers who grouped around the literary journal Nugat. During World War I, he even had a heavy debate uh, in the press with the poet Ende Adi, an important representative of Hungarian literary modernism at the beginning of the 20th century. This was more than a mere literary debate. It was rather a public confrontation of different political ideologies. As a consequence of this press debate and Rakosh's conservative nationalist views, he usually assessed quite negatively uh, by later gener generations and not without reasons. However, I don't want to deal here with his early 20th century political views, but rather with his late 19th century activity concerning the Budapest Folk Theatre. It's important to know that Rakoshi began his career as a journalist. Between 1867 and 69, he wrote political feuilletons for the daily newspaper Pesti Naplo about the Viennese government's Hungarian politics. In 1868, he also played an important role in the foundation of the satirical newspaper Por Samyanko, and he became a member of its editorial staff. Then in 1869, he launched a new daily newspaper entitled Reform, whose editor-in-chief became himself. 
By far his most important contribution to the history of Hungarian press was, however, when he founded the daily newspaper Budapest Hirlap, edited by himself between 1881 and 1925 for a quite long time. In this post, he exerted a significant influence on local political and intellectual life. It's obvious that Rakosh's journalist activity and his press connections contributed in a significant measure to the success of his theatrical enterprise. Premiers of the Fox Theatre were regularly reviewed in the different press organs, so it was not indifferent what kind of reviews were published following the first performance of, of a piece. It should be noted that in the middle of the 1860s, he already had some connections with the National Theatre as a playwright. His first stage work, a comedy entitled As Opus, was premiered there in 1866. His theatrical connections proved to be particularly useful later when he had to engage a theatre company, actors, singers, and a complete orchestra for the Fox Theatre. It was following his early journalist activity that he became director of this newly founded institution in 1875. In order to understand the significance of this institution, you have to know the local theatrical landscape around 1870. Budapest was at that time a multi-ethnic city where both German and Hungarian language pop population had its own theaters. Until 1860, there were several German theaters in the capital, but only one Hungarian institution, the stately subsidized national theater. The main difference between these stages was not their repertoire, but their language, so much so that both the German and Hungarian theaters played serious and entertaining repertoire, spoken plays as op and operas, folk plays and operettas. Between 1860 and 1870, however, important changes in the theatrical landscape took place. In 1861, a new Hungarian institution providing entertaining repertoire was established, the Buda Folk Theatre, Budai Nipsinghans, which, however, went bankruptcy in 1870. In the same year, the past German theatre was burned down, and German performances were prohibited by the authorities in Buda. The last German theater in Pest was founded in 1869. It was called the Deutsche Theater in the Volgasse, the Wool Street German theater, and functioned until 1889. At the beginning of the 1870s, two important theatrical projects were begun in Budapest. First, the erection of a new independent Hungarian Royal Opera House which was opened in 1884. Second, a new Hungarian theater in order to take over the popular repertoire of the National Theater. The result of this latter project became the Budapest Folk Theater, which was designed by the Viennese film Feiner und Heimer, as so many similar buildings of the one-time monarchy. And it was opened, as I mentioned, in October 1875, in the same year when the Royal Academy of Music was established with Francis' support. The Folk Theatre as a company worked until 1908, from which year its building was used by the company of the National Theatre right until 18, 18, uh, sorry, 1965, when it was demolished because of the construction of the local underground railway. Officially, Rakoshi fulfilled the post of director at the Fox Theater from October 1875 until 1881. It should be noted, however, that he exerted a decisive influence on the theater's activity right until 1897. This can be explained by the fact that from 1881, when he resigned, his post was fulfilled by one of his brother-in-laws, Lajos Eva, who was Rakosh's right hand already between 1875 and 1881 as superintendent, secretary, and translator of theater pieces. Eva began his career as a journalist, just as Rakosh, and they first met each other as members of the editorial staff of the Daily Reform. As Eva's case demonstrates, 
Rákosi's family connections contributed in a significant measure to his success as a theater director and to his influence on Budapest uh, intellectual life. Of course, Eva is not the only member of the Rákosi family who acted as part of this important network. In fact, Rákosi had several reputed and influential relatives, so much so that they were frequently referred to by their contemporaries as the Holy Family. His sister, Sidi Rákosi, was a celebrated actress of the Budapest National Theatre, but she was also a pedagogue and led an important actor school. His brother, Viktor Rákosi, was a writer, journalist, humorist, as well as a member of the Hungarian parliament. His other brother-in-law, Zsolt Böti, became a famous literary historian, but he also worked as a critic of theatrical performances. Special attention should be paid to Jenő Rákosi's nephew, László Böjti. He was not only a writer and journalist, but he also became a highly influential theater director, just as his uncle. In 1897, when Lajos Eva resigned from the post of director of the Fox Theater, the Rákosi family founded a new private operator theater called Magyar Színház, already mentioned yesterday by Bill Everett. It was László Böjti, who became director of this new theater, but only for a short time. In 1900, he led the National Theater until 1902, when he had to resign because of a scandalous love affair. In 1903, he became director of the newly founded Kirai Sinhas, another important Budapest Operetta Theater, which he led until 1907, when he again took over the direction of the Magyar Sinhas. His career as a theater director reached its peak following World War I, between 1918 and 1925, when he led the most influential trust of Budapest theatrical life, the so-called Union LTD, Unio RT, which comprised almost every operetta theatres of the capital. And now, after this sketchy overview of Jenő Rákosi's family network, let's see what he did as the director of the Budapest Folk Theatre. You have to know that the program of this institution was dedicated almost exclusively of two genres, the Neipsinmi or folk play, the local variant of the Viennese Folkstück, that is spoken plays with musical interpolations in a popular folk like Hungarian style, and the international genre of operetta. As a playwright and translator, Rakoshi contributed to both genres. For his theater, he translated operetta librettos from three languages, French, German, and English. Among the pieces he translated from French, we find, among others, Jacques Offenbach's La Boulangère à des Etudes, premiered in 1876 as Atalé Roche Emmanuel Chabrier's L'Etoile, premiered in 1877 as Achillag. Charles Lecoq's Japanese operetta entitled Koziki, premiered in 1877, and Robert Blanquette's Les Cloches de Corneville, which was first performed at the Folk Theatre as a Corn Corneville Harangok in 1877. He also made Hungarian translations of such German librettos as Franz Suppe's Fatinica, premiered in 1880, or Johann Strauss Jr.'s Indigo on the Filzig Reiber. The latter piece was first performed at the Fox Theatre in 1893 as Indigo is a Nagyvel Furthermore, he was the translator of some of the few British operettas by Gilbert and Sullivan performed in Budapest. HMS Pinafore was premiered at the Folk Theatre in 1881 in Rákosi's translation as a Pandifor Capitana, just as the Mikado, whose first performance as a Mikado took place in 1886. At that time, there were not too much people in Budapest who spoke English. Rákosi, however, did know also this language, but his more, he also translated some, some of Shakespeare's plays into Hungarian. Besides his translation, he also acted as a stage manager in the case of several productions of his theater. These pieces included, among others, Offenbach's Madame Favar, which was staged as Favar Asson in 1879, and La Fille du Tambour Major, premiered in 1880 as, as Ezra Dobos Lánya. 
Lyon versus Le Droit du Seigneur, premier in 1880 as a pre as well as Franz Suppé's Fatinitsa, whose translator was, as I already mentioned, uh, Rakoshi himself. His activity of stage manager is documented by the extant stage manuals of the folk theater performances kept today at the theater department of the Seicheni National Library. Rakoshi was also one of the first authors who wrote librettos for Hungarian operetta composers. His Titila Hadnag was premiered in 1880 with music by Ferenc Puksh, conductor of the folk theater, but later it was also set to music by Lajos Sherli, whose piece of the same title was premiered at the institution in 1891. It was Rakoshi who wrote the libretto of a Fekete Hayu, premiered in 1883 with Count George Banff's music, as well as Anej Kirai, first performed in 1890 with music by Béla Sabados. Besides his operetta librettos, Rakoshi also wrote folk play texts such as Sepionka, premiered in 1881, or Magdalena, first performed in 1884. The songs of these two pieces were composed by Alec Erkel and Lyle Shirley, respectively, who were both conductors of the folk theater. In his recollections, Rakoshi claimed that he was the first among Hungarian theater directors who made a contract with the Paris Société des Auteurs Compositeurs Dramatiques, that is, the French Chamber of Dramatic Authors and Composers, concerning the performing rights of pieces by French authors. He also attached that with this contract, he put an end to Mr. Eirich's tyranny. Mr. Eirich, whose full name is Oscar Friedrich Eirich, was a Viennese advocate, but he, he also had a theater agency. And it is a fact that before Rakosch's contract with the Société des Auteurs Compositeurs Dramatiques, it was Eirich's Viennese Theater Agentur, which transmitted the performing materials of French pieces to Budapest. Due to the French-Hungarian contract, however, Rakoshi became able to obtain the librettos, vocal and full scores, as well as orchestra parts directly from French uh, publishing houses, and he gained exclusive performing rights of the pieces in question in Budapest. Lots of contracts made by Rakoshi with different French publishing houses survived at the archives of the capital city of Budapest. For example, at this picture, you can see Rakosh's contract with the publishing house Shudan Per Efis from 1882 concerning the performing rights of Offenbach's opera Le Conz Dorfman, which was first performed in Hungary in the Budapest Folk Theatre in the same year. Interestingly enough, it was played with the genre designation Operetta, with spoken dialogues and without the Giulietta Act. But among the contracts, there are lots of documents attesting that even performing materials and rights of true operettas were obtained directly from Paris. In contrast to French pieces, obtaining the rights of works by British authors remained, however, a problematic issue. As an example, I will quote here an undated letter written by Ivan Rele, the superintendent of the Folk Theatre Administration to Istvan Clay, a member of the Folk Theatre Committee. Rele wrote the following concerning the performing materials of Gilbert and Sullivan's operetta, The Human of the Guard, which was premiered at the Folk Theatre in April 1889. <clears throat> I quote, we were unable to secure the performing rights by contract since in this issue, namely concerning the performing rights, there is no international treaty between our monarchy and the British government. So we can only repeat to your Lordship the same, what we already explained in a detailed way at the time when the first performance of the Mikado took place. Well, what happened uh, with the Mikado and what does this mean? The Mikado, which was premiered at the Fox Theatre in December 1886 with enormous success, was staged in a pirated version. 
as it is attested by the recollections of George Valery and other stage manager active at the Fox Theatre, and by the extent performing full score of the Fox Theatre performances, the direction of the institution bought the vocal score of the piece in Vienna, where it was first performed in September 1886, and two conductors of the theatre, Alec and Jule Erkel, reorchestrated the music. Well, uh, as a conclusion, uh, I think it's no exaggeration to say that Jenő Rákosi played a key role in vernacularizing the international genre of operetta in Budapest. It's a, a strange contradiction, however, that he regarded this international genre and his folk theater not as a mere entertaining, but as the vehicle of Hungarian nation building. He even claimed about the institution that I quote, it was there that the people of Pest learned to laugh and cry in Hungarian, end of quote. At the same time, however, he also admitted that the orchestra of his theater comprised mostly Austrian and Czech musicians. By the way, Emperor Franz Joseph I was also present at the opening performance. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Peter. That was absolutely fascinating. And uh, all sorts of links with uh, uh, Bill's paper yesterday and a tremendously uh, exciting for me uh, personally, uh, insight into the, into the international complexion of, of Rakushi's uh, work. Um, I, I'm very sorry that we must, I think, defer all discussion until the end of the, of the session, but thank you very much indeed for that wonderful paper. Perhaps, uh, Peter, you could um, uh, take away your, your slideshow at this point so that we, we can move to the next. Sure. Okay, of yeah. course. Thank, thank you very much. So um, our second uh, speaker this morning is uh, Dr. Peter Wuxin, uh, who is a hymnologist and uh, church music historian. And he is uh, appointed to the Institute of Musicology uh, at the Slovak Academy of Sciences in Bratislava. And uh, Dr. Rushin will speak this morning on the role of Matica Slovenska and St. Adalbert's association in the collection of Slovak Catholic hymns in the second half of the 19th century. So please welcome Peter Rushin. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. White, <laughs> for the introduction. It's a big privilege for me to uh, take part on this conference. Uh, I think really it, uh, the topic is uh, really famous <laughs> and uh, it's, uh, I, I would like to thank all organizers of this nice uh, online conference. Uh, so I will start. Uh, Dear colleagues, in 1860, the Synod of Bishops was held in Gran Estergom. Uh, the Synod was led by Jan Stitovsky, uh, Cardinal Archbishop of Estergom and Primate of Hungary. In Statute 19 from this Synod, uh, it is written, so I will paraphrase, we don't want anything more fervently than for figural singing with music, which often instead of piety, uh, arouses offense and even laughter to give way to the singing of the people in churches. However, as this goal doesn't seem possible due to the cold devotion and winning of singing among the more educated, we warn all those who administer the service that the cancellation of music should be slowly. That is why we strictly instruct pastors to teach and practice school children in the church singing. The deans will try out school children as well from other prescript subjects, as well as from the church singing. It's the end of paraphrase. Uh, the glorification of folk singing at religious services recalls the articles of the Prague Provincial Synod held from eight to uh, 23rd September, 1860. They highlight the 
songs in the mother language and emphasize the singing in the temple. So it was very similar. Now I will, I will start my presentation. The network of church institutions in the Austrian monarchy at that time contributed to the spread of ideas about the importance of the church singing and its beneficial effect on the piety of Catholic believers. Until the 18th century, the state concept of Pietas Austriaca, initiated by the, initiated by the Habsburg court, had an impact on aristocratic and intellectual society. However, in the transforming secularized social structure of the 19th century, the Catholic Church had to confront to decline of piety, especially at more educated people, as we heard. Uh, therefore, they focused on the lower society. Hierarchy identified as one of the causes, causes of this decline performing of the so-called figural music, uh, vocal instrumental church composition during services at the expense of the singing of hymns by believers. The offense or laughter at the performance of composed vocal music with instrumental accompan accompaniment, um, which are mentioned in the statutes of the synod could be related to poor performances of singers or even players on instruments, especially in the churches of smaller towns, maybe. It can also be related to the different music, musical ta uh, tastes of various social classes. On the other on one hand, it was the influence of the ideas of Cecilianism, which preferred older epochs of church singing and were critical to the heritage of vocal instrumental church music of the 18th and first half of 19th century. On the other hand, the emphasis of on church singing in the national language be, began to prevail during Terzian and Joseph's reforms. It had an analogy in the increased interest in folk song, which accompanied national movements in the Austrian monarchy since the end of the 18th century. In Slovak conditions, there were efforts to collect folk songs, but also hymns in the folk language in the 1860s. These activities uh, were related to the founding of the Matica Slovenska in 1863, which was established according to other Slavic institution named after the Serbian word Matica, in translation, the Queen Bee. Most of those uh, were founded in the Habsburg monarchy, monarchy. The oldest of them was Matica Srpska, 1828, for Serbian nation, followed by Matica Česka, Matica Iliska, Hrvatska, uh, Matica Moravska, and so on. The statutes of Matica Slovenska were confirmed and approved by Emperor Franz Josef I in 18. 62. Martin became the seat of this oldest Slovak National Association. Matica Slovenska began its activities in 1863. The association was headed by representatives of two large, largest churches in of Slovak nation, Catholic and Lutheran. The first chairman was the Catholic bishop. Uh, Stefan Moises from Banska Bystrica, and uh, the vice, -chair vice chairman was the Lutheran superintendent, Karol Kuzmani. The activ activities of Matica Slovenska were stopped by its abolition in 1875 by the Hungarian Ministry of the Interior. During uh, the 12 years of its existence, the association was focused on, focused on publishing and collecting activities. Scientific articles uh, were published in the journal 
The Yearbook of Matica Slovenska, letopis Matice Slovenskej. The committee of Matica Slovenska set as one of the goals of this institution the collection of Slovak folk tales, songs, sayings, games, etc. at its first meeting on August the 5th, 1863. A call to all Slovak patriots and writers to collect these so-called simple national prostonarodne treasures uh, was published on December the 11th, 1863 in the newspaper Pest Buda News, Pest Budinske Vedomosti. The author of the article, the Lutheran priest, collector and member of the Matica Slovenska Committee, uh, Pavel Dobšinsky, explains uh, various uh, genres of oral tradition and folk customs, including songs. He perceived folk songs exclusively from a literary point of view. Uh, collectors should concentrate on simple national song or tales also in Slovak prostonarodny. It means a song which is created and performed by uneducated singers from the people. This concept was applied partly in older collections of Slovak folk songs by Paul Josef Šafarik and Jan Kolar. In essence, however, uh, he excluded church hymns due to due to their artificial origin. So this uh, genre uh, appeared in those collections of folk songs only sporadically. Dobšinsky included a selection of secular folk, song sing folk uh, songs in uh, his collection of Slovak national songs, legends, proverbs, sayings, riddles, customs, games, and <laughs> superstitions published by Matica Slovenska in 1870. At the same time, when the mentioned call will, with comment from Paul Dobšinsky was published, a young student of, te a student of theology at a seminary in uh, Estegrom, Andrej Kmeť, had already completed the first stage of collecting Slovak folk Christmas songs. He obtained material for this collection mainly from written, partly also printed hymn books and collections of hymns. Therefore, it is interesting that he used the designation simple national Christmas song in accordance with the article from Dobšinsky. In most cases, there were not recordings of songs interpreted by folk singers, interpreted as Dobšinsky intended, although he probably obtained some songs from oral presentations. Kmeć collected uh, Christmas songs in the period between 1863 and 68 and created two manuscript volumes. So the first volume is text part. So there are the lyrics of the of these songs. And the second volume is a musical part. So there are the tunes of melodies of the of these songs. Um, it was uh, the, the all uh, collection uh, contains uh, 292 lyrics of Christmas songs and 201 tunes to the first part, this lyrics part of, of the collection. Kmeć uh, didn't specify the manuscripts from which he wrote off, but he wrote down the names of the persons who had given them to him. These were often people from uh, he had related personally, friendly or professionally. Andre Kmeć did not distinguish uh, Christmas songs according to their origin, he also included uh, in the collection many church hymns with a Christmas topic known from other printed hymn in books. However, a significant part of the collection consisted of the so-called pastorals as a genre of shepherd songs, which developed in the Slovak oral tradition mainly at the end of the 18th and in the first half of the 19th century. They have been preserved mostly in the manuscripts as the printed church hymnals 
took over only a small part of them. Although the material of uh, Andrei Kmet's collection did not uh, correspond to the mentioned concept of folk song promoted by Dobczynski, it was created in the context of the published call. Kmet prob probably planned to publish his collection through Matica Slovenska. This did not work out, and the collection remained in manuscript. Critical edition was published by Slovak ethnomusicologist Hanna Bansova in uh, 2007. Kmet's collection represented uh, rather an ethnomusicological concept of collecting material in the full range of defi defined genre, certainly according to knowledge of this time, of its time. Yes. Kmet managed to record several lyrics and melodic variants of songs, enabling comparative research. This brought him closer to the ideas of the mentioned challenge from Matica Slovenska. The question of a deeper knowledge of Slovak folk song as a basis for composed music was analyzed by the Slovak composer Jan Levoslav Bella in his paper Thoughts on the Development of National Music and Slovak Singing. Bella published his paper in the second issue of the yearbook of Matica Slovenska from 1873. He basically followed up the idea of simple national song, focused on the character of Slovak folk song in its ideal, uncorrupted form. He correctly pointed out the modal melody of Slovak folk songs in contra contrast to dual major minor tonality of modern European music. He extended his reflections to the folk music of all Slavic nations as an unknown phenomenon and presented an idealistic idea of an all Slavic collection of folk songs. The Czech music published publicist and composer Jan Ludovic Prochaska, he was uh, meant uh, yesterday but in the paper from uh, Jana Lengova, also supported him in this idea. Although, Be although Bela himself was a supporter of Sicilianism and composer of church music, he perceived an in, uh, insurmountable gap between formalized church chant and uh, spontaneous uh, folk song. Hence, uh, had no place in this understanding of Slovak folk singing. We don't know whether Jan Levoslav Bela knew about the collection of, uh, of uh, Christmas songs created by a theology student from the Estergom Seminary. And, and uh, Andrei Kmet himself uh, left his records from his youth in the manuscript and never returned to them. Another project of collecting church hymns arose uh, on the initiative on the St. Adalbert's Association. After several years of efforts, the only church association of Slovak Catholics was uh, approved by Archbishop Jan Šimor at the turn of uh, 1869 and 70. The association set out as one of its tasks, uh, the preparation and publication of a unified hymn book for all Slovak Catholics. For this reason, in 1872, uh, the administration of the association asked all pastors and organizers for sending the older manuscripts and printed uh, hymn books to the association in order to collect material for a new hymn book. Uh, the challenge did not met with an appropriate response. The material from available printed hymn books was finally collected, linguistically edited, and sorted by Andrei Radlinsky. The lyrics of hymns were published under the title Catholic Hymn Book or the Gen General Collection of Church Catholic Slovak Hymns. Here you are. The collection includes uh, 1047 hints, uh, which is a respectable number. In an extensive preface devoted to the character of the church hymn, its textual and melodic structure, Radlinski also mentioned the sources from which he drew. His concept of the hymn book and its structure were inspired by the Czech two-part hymn book edited by uh, Vincent Pradač, known as St. John Hymn Book, Kancional Svatojansky, which was published in Prague 
1863 and 64. Radlinski intended his collection as a preparatory material for a great uni United Slovakian book. Its musical part, musical part should be prepared by the Regenschory of the Art Archbishop Church in Eger, uh, Franciszek Zaszkowski, a prominent person among uh, Slovak church musician, musicians. This intention failed. Finally, only a smaller version of the hymn book, which contained a part of Radlinski's collection, was published in Vienna in 1882 after Radlinski's death. death uh, organ accompaniments of hymns were uh, composed by Franciszek Otto Matzenauer, organist in Trnava and music teacher at local grammar school and teachers institute. This edition was a temporary solution and did not fulfill the idea of great hymn book for all Slovak Catholics. So I now come to conclusion. Both collections of Slovak hymns from the 1860s and 1870s are quasi response of the Estegrom Synod from 1860. They concentrated a rich material for the church singing of believers. They have a different character and purpose. Makes collection used to have a research and collecting focus. Radlinski's collection was utilitarian, arranged for the needs of the liturgy and various devotions. However, these material were difficult to use in the conception of a folk song as an original musical expression with a distinct ethnic characteristic as defined by Jan Levoslav Bella. Both collections were completed thanks to the existence and activity of national institutions supporting the collection and the research of folk singing. Their publication depended on the quality of its institutional background. It was much more stable in the Church Association of St. Adelbert than in Matica Slovenska, which was nevertheless differently focused and had a short duration. From this point of view, Radlinski was in a better position, so he managed to publish at least the lyrics of the songs. Both collections are examples of this type of idealistic projects which in their time faced the limited institutional background of Slovak music, whether in the secular or church sphere. The associations that in initiated the collection of song material for, from Slovak localities didn't have sufficient financial and intellectual potential to complete these projects at that time, even though there was a music department in music, Matita Slovenska in the last seven years of its existence. The edition of Slovak songs prepared by the Commission for the Collection and Publishing of Slovak Songs in Martin, founded in 1879 after the abolition of Matica Slovenska, was finally more successful. However, the project took 30 years to Im implement. Of course, it did not include hints. <laughs> St. Adalbert's association followed up the, the idea of a unified hymn book for Slovak Catholics in 19. 30s, but this is a different story. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rushin, for that fascinating uh, insight into a, a very important episode, I think, in um, Slovak church music history and in the interpenetration of national aspirations and the uh, organization of the church. Again, I'm sorry, we're very pressed for time, so I must move swiftly on to our next speaker, but I don't doubt that uh, there would be questions at the end of the session. So thank you very much indeed again. Uh, so moving, uh, in fact, directly to our next uh, speaker, uh, it's great pleasure to introduce uh, Maria Benic Zovko, who is a uh, uh, professor and head of music theory at the uh, Vatroslav Lisinski Music School in Zagreb. I almost said here in Zagreb, and uh, also a PhD student uh, at the University of Zagreb. And she will be talking to us uh, this morning on annual reports of the Croatian National Institute tracing the music pedagogical practice of the second half of the 19th century. So do let's please welcome Maria Benic uh, Zovko. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, good morning, everyone. 
it is really nice to be a part of this wonderful conference. And uh, first of all, I would like to say that there's a little mistake in the published version of my abstract. It is written Croatian National Institute, but it should be written Croatian Music Institute. So I apologize for that. And thank you for understanding. Um, I will share now my screen. Just a second. Um, I hope it's visible. It's okay? Okay, thank you very much. Um, well, founding of the Music School of the Croatian Music Institute in 1829 marked the beginning of the institutionalization of music education, as well as the process of creating a system of music education in Zagreb. This was the basis for the continuous development of Croatian music education to the present day. Croatian Music Institute and its music school share a common history and thus common historical sources. Annual reports of the Croatian Music Institute are among the most important historical sources of the second half of the 19th century. They were published from 1868 until uh, 1920. Mostly they refer to the activities of, of its music school as one of the most important parts of the Institute, both for education and society in general. The study of the reports provides insight into the development of the music education system issue, still neglected and rarely researched in musicology. Reports studying provides both a determination of periodization as well as analysis of each period of the development of music education, the issues that have never been done before. For this occasion, I focused on the period between 1875 and 1900. In the first seven years, the reports contained great books with pupils' and teachers' names, school subjects, marks and special awards for each student, number of grades and class sizes. The annual report from 1875-76 has been expanded with more precise statistics a number of students both registered and promoted to senior grade, weekly teacher assignments, daily student assignments, number of domestic and foreign students, as well as those along with free education. Annual school work plans are of the great importance. Published for the first time in 1875, they give unique insight into the content and complexity level of teaching, as well as manuals and textbooks used for each school subject. It marked the beginning of a new period of music education development lasting until 1883. A new period began in the 1883-84 school year. It was stamped by more precisely elaborated teaching plan and student assignments for theory of music lessons in school, including for the first time in the history of Zagreb music education, the teaching of harmony, not just as part of theory of music, but as an independent music theoretical discipline. The division of the school year into two semesters ending with examinations is mentioned for the first time. The most significant determinant of the period is the new annual school work plan. It is marked by significant changes in the articulation of teaching topics and units, equalization of the duration of education for all instruments, and the introduction of new theoretical music disciplines. A new, a new statute of the Institute enacted in 1899-1 has provided restructuring of the music school, aiming the professional music education. The new organization of the school implied the first thorough structuring of music education, not just in Zagreb, but also in Croatia. The school was divided into three departments, the first one for instruments, which implied all string instruments, all woodwind instruments, brass instruments like trumpet, horn and trombone, piano and organ. The second one for choir and solo singing, and the third one for music theory disciplines, including harmony, counterpoint, aesthetics and history of music, and two-year composition course. In addition to composing, Participants of two-year composition course attended orchestration, conducting and score reading classes, studied music literature, thus also preparing for the profession of organist and conductor. 
the course could only be attended by those students who had previously graduated at the instrument department. The foundation of the Department for Music Theory marked the beginning of the development of, of music theory disciplines as independent music activities, as well as the professionalization of music theorists, which was improved by the fact that although it was not yet possible to obtain the education of music theorists, theoretical music disciplines were taught by a teacher dedicated exclusively to that field of music. Education for all instruments, as well as for singing, lasted six years. After completing three-year beginning course, students joined three-year advanced one. Having four hours each day, students were required to attend classes in the following subjects. As you can see, from first to third grade in 1891, they attended uh, main instrument, piano, singing, and general music theory. For secondary instrument, piano students had to choose any other string or wind instrument. In fourth grade, main, uh, they attended main instrument, piano, third instrument, and harmony. In fifth grade, they attended main instrument, piano, third instrument, and harmony, but also chamber music, orchestra playing, and transposition exercises. And in last grade, they attended main instrument, piano, third instrument, counterpoint, aesthetics of music, history of music, chamber music, orchestra playing, and trans transposition exercises. And the singers also learned acting skills, creation, and Italian. Compared to 1871, when all the singing, violin, cello, and woodwind instruments were taught, 1891 shows intense progress and proves that these 20 years were marked by the intensive development of a, of a comprehensive and professionally moderate education system. Analyzing the gap from 1975 to 1890, one can notice the increasing number of students, especially those who attended particular instrument lessons. After the regular piano lesson started in 1872, much later than violin, cello, singing, and woodwind instruments, during the next 16 years, piano became the most popular instrument. As shown in the graphs, in 1875, the piano students made up 13% of the total number, and the most popular were violin and singing. In 1883-84, Violin was still the most popular instrument, but the number of piano students exceeded the number of singing students, which was significantly reduced. Um, and in 1889-90, piano students made a half of total numbers of students. You can see it in this yellow part of the cake. According to the school reports from 1875 until 1890, average number of female piano students was uh, 84%. So one can draw the conclusion that piano was mostly a female instrument in the school. The similar situation was with singing and from 1878 to 1890, there were no classes for male singers. On the other side, all other instruments were considered male instruments between 1875 and 1890. While student, students were mostly boys, there were no girls playing cello. And in 1887 88, a girl attended woodwind instrument lessons for the first time in the history of the school. The statistics reveal that there was a constant need for string players who could play in orchestras that were an important part of Zagreb's social life and that professional musicians were mostly men because they learned the instruments needed in orchestra and they chose music as their profession. Playing piano and singing were in accordance with social norms and lifestyle in Zagreb at the end of the 19th century. Playing piano obviously was one of the favorite amusements, especially for women. Interesting music pedagogical practice of the school features texts are of special importance. They were published in annual reports marking the beginnings of new periods in the development of the educational system. They were an expression of new educational goals and tasks, 
but at the same time they outlined social norms and aesthetic principles. They shed light on the networking of education within the social and political context. Can Buchach's Riech on Nashon Zawadu, the word about our institute, is an introductory text of the annual report for 1875-76 school year. The author was a piano teacher from 1872 to 1876 and one of the most prominent figures of the 19th century Croatian music in the area of musicology, music history, ethnomusicology, etc. Educating national ideology, Kuchac did not agree with the cosmopolitan-oriented education advocated by the Institute. His colleagues disagreed with his, with his insistence on creation terminology, as well as his textbook, Kuchac's translation of Lobe's Catechismus der Musik, which they considered too complicated and unappropriated for children. So he resigned the following year. However, the pedagogical and educational attitudes presented here go beyond the national ideology and present pedagogical and educational principles of the time. Initially, Kukac emphasized the importance of the Institute as the only public institution of its kind in those South Slavic lands. He also stressed the main problem teachers were faced to, bad financial situation, heavy work schedule and lack of students' interest for professional musicianship. According to Kuhach, educational goal was to make professional musicians return the solace as well as, as he said, hardworking music proletarian, meaning orchestra player, players and choir singers. The pedagogical goal for Kuhach was to ensure and support cultural development of our nation, as he said, explaining that the lack of artistic institutes results in the lack of ideals, beauty, and sublime life values of the nation, and accordingly, in the lack of successful scientific institutes. Kuhach also appealed to noble families to send their children to music school instead of attending private lessons, which was still a common way of education of the upper class and a kind of statue symbol. The students could attend school for free as regular students who attend to become professional musicians, or they could attend school as part-time students, future music amateurs, and they paid, of course, scholarship. Regular students were mostly from the middle or low class, and thanks to the institute policy, music education was affordable to all classes. Kuchac advocated an objective approach, which means learning in groups, especially in the first few years of education. He asserted that rhythm, meter, intonation, and tempo accuracy could be best achieved by practicing in the group, and that repeating again and again, and teachers' constant but necessary corrections could undermine child's self-confidence if he attends individual lessons one side or that can improve his skills by listening and synchronizing to other people, pupils in the group on the other side. Kuchac obviously based his teaching method on the slogan, learn from the music practice pattern, which means if you play or sing in group, EI orchestra or choir, then learn it in the group. Kuchac took over Jan Amos Komensky's concept what one must do, one learns by doing it. That was widely accepting, accepted among the teachers in Zagreb in the last three decades of the 19th century. I will return uh, to Komensky again a little bit later. The public education based on thoroughly designed and articulated school work plan and program was strongly recommended by Kovac. As opposed to an objective approach that assured fast and guaranteed progress in the beginning of the educational process, the author wrote about subjective approach, recommending it only for upper grades and high level education of scholars. Emphasizing the importance of an objective approach, Kuchac's ideas reflect the networking of education in political and social context. Although the music school was not under the direct administration of the government, 
That was the time when education was affirmed as a political question, so the state was the absolute authority in the, in the control of schooling. Contrary to romantic artistic ideals, doing music as learned in music school expressed much more collective communication and political social affiliation than individuality and personal attitudes that were preserved for rare individual, individuals, great musicians. Kukac was aware of the fact that great music and high-level music education could be possible if the music school could ensure fundamentals for practicing and understanding music and preserve orchestral and chamber musicians to fulfill and enrich private and public social events. Aiming for the conservatoire level of education in the future, he suggested the inauguration of subjects such as music history, aesthetics of music, higher level music theory, etc., thus in anticipating their realization in 1890s. Great importance for music education has Vyatislav Novak's text, Zašto učimo teoriju glasbe, Why do we learn theory of music, published in the Music School Reports for 1890-91 school year. Novak was a prominent novel writer, but also a professionally educated musician. At the Conservatory in Prague, he got degrees in the organ and also in teaching singing and theory of music. From 1887, he taught music at the main school for teachers in Zagreb, and in the period between 1890 and 94, he, he taught theory of music, music aesthetics, and history of music at the School of the Croatian Music Institute. As already stated in the title, Novak answers why it is necessary to learn theory. According to Novak, the purpose of art, including music, is to express beauty, and beauty is born in the soul of an artist inspired by God and becomes an irresistible longing to make it come to life and share it with others. End of quotation. It is knowledge that serves as the mediator between divine inspiration and idea on one side and the final work of art on the other. Aware of irreplaceable significance of natural talent, the author writes, knowledge is the true leader and natural talent is the eye for distinguishing and recognizing the leader's path. After determining the reasons why artists need knowledge, the author analyzes the tactical aspects of acquiring it, stating that the purpose of any training is gaining independence, which can be perceived in the following. A. Students became able to perform musical pieces on their own, meaning that they not only aptly deal with technical difficulties, but also understand the composer's thoughts. Thoughts, end of quotation. And B, the ability to determine what is beautiful and what is not, what is good and what is not. The ability that Novak names musical taste. This knowledge is collected in theory of music and by learning it, one learns the laws of the beautiful in music. Speaking of the beautiful music in his discourse, meaning music itself, Novak permeates pedagogical and didactical principles with aesthetic ones, detecting the basis of teaching theory with music in aesthetics. Theological grounds of learning theory, Novak based on pedagogical and didactical principles of Jan Amos Komensky, a Czech philosopher, pedagogue, and theologian, considered the father of modern education. His Didactica Magna was translated and published in 1871 for the first time in Croatia. It was very popular, greatly esteemed, and frequently quoted. Komensky saw learning as cognition of curricular cosmos, where elements as God's creation are connected in themselves and among them all originated from God and going back to God. This natural order is treated by man as godlikeness and is guarantee and it guarantees an education that pleases God. Novak's view of education in music is similar. The artistic idea comes from God. Knowledge is what realizes it in the beautiful music, and the beautiful music leads again 
to the realization of the human longing to learn. What follows from Novak's view is that he saw the educational process as a path from the practical to the speculative, the same as Komensky's teaching methods. The goals of teaching are achieved when the prescriptiveness turns into a cognition of higher order, beyond mere norms and opening the way to interpretation. The ideals Kohach hoped for and strived for 15 years earlier in 1890s became a real determinant of the system of music education in Zagreb. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, dear colleague, for that wonderful insight into uh, music education in the latter part of the 19th century. I, again, I wish I could respond properly. Uh, we're so short of time, but please allow me just to say one thing, which is that I am always lost in admiration for the development of music education to this very moment in, in Croatia and uh, to see its roots so beautifully exposed and, and uh, interpreted is a great privilege. So thank you so much indeed for that. Um, uh, I, again, I, I'm just in deference to our following speakers, I must move swiftly on, and, uh, but I'm sure there will be a discussion at the end of the session if we have some time. Uh, as I mentioned at the outset, um, unfortunately, Andrea Daru from Budapest has had to withdraw because of illness. Um, we wish her well and a speedy recovery. So in her place, I'm very glad uh, to welcome Sarah Rees, who uh, is uh, a PhD student, uh, indeed working under uh, Professor Katalinic and a research assistant at the um, Department for the History of Croatian Music uh, at the Croatian Academy of Sciences and Arts. And I may add also personally, Sara is a, a good dear friend and a wonderful conference organizer and uh, technical assistant among many other attributes. Uh, Sara is going to speak uh, to us today on uh, Franjo Zavar Kuac in the network of his publishers. So please welcome Sara Ries. Hello everyone. I am logged under the account of the Croatian Institute for History because I'm your host today. Let me share my screen. Just a second. Can everybody see the screen? That's fine, Sarah. Okay. okay. Yep. Okay, so the preserved correspondence of Franjuk Saver Kuhac, Croatia's first musicologist, ethnomusicologist, and music historian, is an abundant and valuable source which gives various evidence on important cultural, political, and musical events and enables the reconstruction of the network of Kuhac's contacts. The letters are preserved in 13 volumes containing around 3,000 3, letters covering the time span from 1860 to 1911. Their representation of an extremely rich network of Croatian and foreign personas consisted of prominent politicians, professors, artists, and pillars of cultural life. Here the special focus will be on the Croatian as well as the foreign publishers and music dealers with whom Kuvac regularly exchanged letters in order for, to publish his compositions, sell his collection South Slavic folk songs, publish his articles, studies and books, as well as to procure the literature needed for his research. Those letters provide insights about the literature he was consulting and the publishing process of his works. Additionally, one can learn about manifold difficulties he encountered along, encountered along the way. The first topic uh, considers publishing Kuhach's compositions. So since more than 100 letters from the first book, book of correspondence have not been preserved, it is not possible to determine exactly when Kuhach came into contact with publishers and musicalian handler, but it can be assumed that this took place in early 1860s. Uh, the letters provide insights in the arrangements he made for publishing his own compositions, through which much can be learned about the publishing process of that time. Kuhach wanted to publish his compositions with foreign publishers, which was a very calculated move. After publishing his first two compositions in his own arrangement, three following compositions, Knospenzeit Padrile, Suzon Polka, and Zenzuk Naterheimat, 
were published in Pest by famous publisher Roja Vergi, which was Hungary's most prestigious music publisher for 100 years. The firm was founded in 1850 in Pest by Jula Roja Vergi, the son of composer Mark Roja Vergi and Norbert Grinsweil. The new firm rapidly established connections and agencies with other music publishers in Austria, Germany, France, and England. The dates of publication of Kuhert's compositions are not indicated, but according to a letter Kuhert sent on February 24th, 1863 to his uncle, Philip Koch, he, I quote, composed several pieces for piano and handed them over to the public in Vienna, Pest, and Osijek, unquote. So it can be concluded that at the beginning of 1863, the compositions were either in the process of being, process of being published or had already been published. For the same reason, Kukoc persistently, persistently tried to publish his compositions with the Viennese publisher Karl Anton Spina, son of, son of Anton Spina, who started to work with the publisher Anton Diabelli in 1824. In 1850, Karl Anton became part of the firm as a third associate and soon led the company on his own after the retirement of his father in Diabelli in 1851. In 1872, Friedrich Schreiber acquired the Spina, Spina Company, then merged with the publisher August Kranz in 1876. Kuchach saw Spina's reputation as a potential for his own promotion and networking with other authors and potential, potential patrons. However, Spina was not very enthusiastic about publishing Kuchert's compositions. From the earliest preserved letter to Spina, written on January 17, 1862, one can see that uh, Kuchert had sent the manuscript of his composition Souvenir d'un bel jour on March 18, 1861, and it had still not been published. From the next letter of March 22, 1862, it can be deducted that the composi composition was being prepared for print since Kuchac was revising the manuscript and correcting the errors which were still present. In the next several years, Kuchac contacted Spina on several occasions. Firstly, in a letter written in June 1865, Kuchac presents himself to Spina once more. This time, as a, I quote, Slavic composer who takes into consideration all of the Slavic peoples, unquote. He proposes the idea of establishing an edition which would uh, publish compositions written by Slavic composers, assuring him that he would have a larger scope of trade and assuring him that he would, I quote, have support, especially from His Excellencies, Bishop Josip Joris Dosmer, the ruling Prince of Serbia, Count Jankovic, nobleman Livadic in Croatia, nobleman, nobleman von Preradovic, who was a Croatian poet and colonel in the Ministry of War in Vienna, Ivan Sundacic in Montenegro, etc. Unquote. However, until the beginning of 1866, uh, Spina did not respond to Kuchach's letters regarding to the publication of the compositions, while he, interestingly, regularly sent him packages with sheet music and books Kuchach had ordered. Kuchach interpreted Spina's silence as a consequence of the tense and unstable political situation in the then Habsburg monarchy, and expressed his thoughts on the matter in a letter from December 31st, 1865 to his friend Milan Kresic in Zagreb. I quote, but now you also know that those things do not have a say in what is valuable and what is not, but a changeable nature of politics. Nowadays, Vienna is only looking towards Hungary and consequently Spina also isn't able to start publishing Slavic compositions, what I have suggested him. When Hungarian madness is over, perhaps Vienna will look again at other nations and Spina or someone else will be willing to establish an edition of Slavic music within their publishing label." Unquote. Although Spina was not a very fair business partner and Kuchac was very bothered with Spina ignoring his requests, Kuchac still recommended him in a letter written to, on March 5, 1867 to Croatian composer Fedbe Livadic believing that is, I quote, still better to do business with Spina than with some other Viennese music publishers because they don't pay attention to the layout and they are just as expensive as him, unquote. Thus recommending Spina over Viennese publishers such as Karl Haslinger, Gustav Albrecht or Franz Xaver Glugel. Spina was not the only publisher who had contacted during the period in order to publish his compositions. He had also written to Zagreb bookseller, printer and publisher Lavoslav Hartmann. In a letter from July 8, 1863, he issued a written confirmation by which only Hartmann had the right to print his pieces for piano, opus 17, 18, 19, and 20. Furthermore, he corresponded with Hartmann about the publication of the compositions on November 15, 1863, dissatisfied with the correction he had received from Albrecht from Vienna. This was probably Gustav Albrecht, a lithographer and music dealer in Vienna, with whom Hartmann collaborated. 
Kukoc was extremely dissatisfied with the way the notes were engraved on the plate, and he explained how the corrections were to be made. From the letters written in the year 1864, it can be seen that the collaboration with Hartmann did not go, go quite smoothly, especially when Kukoc's composition had to be printed, that he could participate in the first Dalmatian Croatian Salonian exhibition in Zagreb, which was held from August till October 1864. In a letter written to Hartmann on July 16, 1864, Kukoc was extremely worried that the compositions will not be delivered on time to the exhibition committee. Apart from Spin and Hartmann, Kukoc also published his compositions in Pest. Three pieces for piano, Opus 21, 22, and 23, were sent to the publisher Adolf Kugler, and Kukoc inquired about their publication in letters to his friend, Hungarian pianist Antal Sipos. Those are letters dated July 20th and December 8th, 1863. However, those pieces were eventually published by Spina in 1866. Kuchach's last attempt to publish his composition, firstly with Spina and then Kugler, was in 1868. As the letters Kuchach received are partially preserved and none of them are Spina's or Kugler's, one can only assume both of them weren't very inter interested in publishing Kuchach's composition. He had to take the matters into his own hands and, can be, and that can be seen from a letter written on December 18th, 1868 to aforementioned Viennese publisher printer, and printer Gustav Albrecht. I quote, hitherto my compositions have mainly been published by Spina, but as the whole thing causes me too much haggling, in the future I will always have my pieces published at my own expense, assuming your service will be quick and decent and you will offer me low prices, unquote. However, it seemed that agreement also fell through since the letter of the same content was sent a month later on January 28, 1869 to Viennese Zinkograph Friedrich Wernick. He collaborated with Wernick, that is Wernick's widow, and the arrangements for the print of the pieces are preserved in several letters. From the last letter of May 17, 1869, it is evident that the business relationship did not end pleasantly. Kuhach was dissatisfied with the careless print, which was not done on time, and as a consequence, Kuhach had to postpone his planned travels for a month. Shortly after this letter, Kuhach devoted himself more and more to work on his collection of folk songs, which will be his main preoccupation for the next decade. Accordingly, the topic of his correspondence with publisher, publishers, bookstores, and music stores is no longer the publication of his own compositions, but arrangements for publishing of the collection and the offers to various foreign bookstores. Here you can see the cover page of a composition in honor of Lisinski, which was published by Spina in 1866. In years 1858 till 1875, Kuhach traveled through Balkans, parts of Austria, Hungary, and Northern Italy, and collected folk songs. In order to make the songs widely accessible, he transcribed them for voice and added piano accompaniment so they could be performed in homes and as well in concert halls. Uh, as a result, between the years 1878 and 1881, he published at his expense four volumes of the aforementioned collection. Consequently, there are many letters to foreign bookstores, musical stores, and antiques dealers offering the collection at an extremely low price due to debts and bad, bad sales. Just to mention, the collection almost bankrupted him. For example, he sent offers to the famous Russian publisher Jurgenson in Moscow, Berman und Altmanns in Vienna, Lazar Friedman and Velimir Balazic in Belgrade, the Popovich brothers in Novi Sad, the antique dealers Halmschirm Karl Helf in Vienna, Karl Franz Köhler in Leipzig, Philip Horowitz and the Revai brothers in Pest. The Moscow publisher Jurgenson seems to have been interested in the offer since Kukoc thanked him on April 10, 1883 for sending him 20 forints and offered him the remaining 600 copies of the Cyrillic edition of the collection. From later letters, it is evident that the deal, it is evident that the deal fell through because Kukoc contacted Franz Julius Vettel, bookstore in Timisoara and the Andrea, and the Andrea Puric in Belgrade, offering 100 pieces of the collection with as much as 80% discount. However, despite generous discounts he was offering, he failed to sell, to sell out the collection and he sold the remaining copies to Kugli and Deutsch, a publishing house and bookstore in Zagreb for a very low price. Here you can see the list of all the publishers and bookstores he contacted regarding the collection of South Slavic folk songs. From the letters Kuhac sent to his students and their parents in the period from 1860 to 1871, when he gave piano lessons in Osik, 
one can see which repertoire Kukoc used to his classes and what repertoire his students performed at local concerts. From the order sent to the Viennese publishers Albrecht and Spina, it can be seen that the repertoire was contemporary salon music, but also works such as Mozart and Beethoven's sonatas. Kukoc did not procure the music sheet only for his classes, but also acted as an intermediary between bookstores and his acquaintances. This is documented in an extensive order from November 6, 1865, sent to Spina, in which he emphasized that his clients want the specific editions he is asking for. This is the letter you can see on the screen. Lastly, Kuhach contacted publishers in order to procure literature, literature which was not so easily accessible. He was mainly in contact with publishers from the Austro-Hungary, especially in Vienna, Prague, Buda and Pest, but also in Moscow and St. Petersburg, to whom he often, often wrote letters inquiring about books and songbooks containing folk songs, which he needed for his comparative research of Slavic folk music. Kuhach often compared, compared songbooks, various theories in, of music and lexicons of other Slavic peoples, such as Russian, Czech and Polish. Among the correspondents are the already mentioned Roja Volgi, Taborski and Parsh and Darul Kugler from Pest, Lavoslav Hartman, Franjo Rupan or Supan and Dragutin Albrecht from Zagreb, Matvey Ivanovic Bernard and uh, Bittner from St. Petersburg, Stari and Kom from Prague, Daniel Edward Friedland from Krakow, Karl Haslinger and Abel Lukšić from Vienna, Josef Meyer from Hilburgshausen, Karl Wild from Lviv, Adolf Searing from the publishing house Searing and Henike from Sombateli, Dragutin Lehmann from Osijek, Theodor Christian Friedrich Enslins and Robert Oppenheim in Berlin, Heinrich Tresnant in Brasov, and Alexis Gabor in Bucharest. We have seen that Kuhach contacted publishers in early 1860s with aim to publish his compositions. In the next decade, the main topic of his correspondence with printers and publishers was regarding his collection of South Slavic folk songs, whether ordering various songbooks or trying to sell the remaining several or uh, whether trying to sell the remaining several hundreds of copies. Furthermore, thanks to the preserved letters, it can be seen which literature he used for his piano lessons and concerts he had with his students, but also what literature he did he consult during his research on South Slavic music and preparing his comparative studies about music historiography. Since the time was limited, I hope I managed to give you a brief overview of Kuhach networks of publishers, topics he contacted them for, and manifold difficulties he encountered along the way. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed, Sara. That was incredibly rich and, and detailed a whirlwind tour through uh, this extremely important area. I, I, again, can't forbear making one comment, although we must move quickly, which is that I often think to myself that if, if you took away uh, Kuach from the history of Croatian music, it would be like playing Shakespeare's Hamlet without the prince. You know, it's a, an extraordinarily important figure. And um, the, the sheer tenacity and indefatigable quality of the man's uh, enterprises are, are deeply interesting and so thank you so much for that for that wonderful thank paper. you yeah, thank and again you. forgive me for rushing away but it's just no 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 i understand pressure of time thank you very much sarah um so we then move to another uh Kuhach paper also given as is, is my very good fortune by a, a very dear friend of mine dr lucia confitz who many of you here today will know uh lucia is um a doctoral graduate of the University of Graz and received her earlier music education in Zagreb and now works as a research associate um, for the Department of the History of Croatian Music uh, in, in the Croatian Academy of Sciences and Arts in Zagreb. And her topic today is entitled Franjo Zagreb Kuhac and Krzyzewci. Krzyzewci, I'm sorry, I'm probably um, mutilating that word. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Lucia. Uh, thank you, Harry, for the introduction. Good morning, everyone. It's a Krizhevci. Uh, so uh, I'll start immediately so that uh, we can be on time. So in uh, these days, uh, Franjo Xaver Kuhac has been, uh, as uh, we, uh, we heard uh, the topic of several presentations, at the national and, and international level, while my topic is focused on a regional level, the town of Križevci and its surrounding area. 
Križaci is a small town uh, northeast of Zagreb. It used to be an important crossroads, which is also reflected in the name of the city, Križ meaning cross. Therefore, studying the cultural or musical past of Križevci means exactly what is encouraged by the conference musical networks, and that is to explore the connections and networks that the city of Križevci and its inhabitants have achieved in planning a, a realization of their cultural activities, whether on private, local, or regional level. Previous research on the cultural life of Križevci in the 19th century shows that the people of Križevci were very active participants in social and cultural events at the time, although uh, there were periods of uh, so-called dormancy. In this paper, based on the correspondence of Franjok Savar Kuhac, an attempt will be made to reassess the role of music in the cultural activities of the time, although only a part of the research will be presented in this presentation. Questions will be asked about the connections that Kuhac has made with the cultural environment of Križevci, which persons in Križevci and the surrounding area he contacted and for what purpose, in order to determine what the possible driving forces of culture, of music culture in the city of Križevci were and how they acted. Franjo Ksaver Kuhac left a rich correspondence with many today better or less known and or even completely unknown persons in Croatia and abroad. His correspondence is an important source for research in Croatian music culture at the turn of the 19th and 20th centuries, which in addition to existing ones like Frankovic, uh, Janacek, Buljan, Šabans, is increasingly proven by recent research by Katalinic, Ries and Tuksar, and the preparation of critical editions of Kuhac's letter allows further studies of this that uh, this material offers. When researching Kuhac's contacts in one smaller area like mine, the scholar would expect to have simpler situation to find correspondence from that area. However, a number of methodological questions arise. First, defining the area in accordance with the network of contacts it has with the surrounding cities. Second, whether those persons who were born in Križevci or work in it but moved due to the, uh, due to the circumstances also qualify for the research. And thirdly, as we will see, we can find information about Križevci's musical life in letters sent to people in other cities, especially in Osijek, Jakovo, Zagreb, and until the study of uh, colleague Reese, uh, is finished, it would take a lot of time to find uh, all the letters that mention Kalijevci and its inhabitants. Regarding the definition of the area, the larger and smaller centers and places with which Kalijevci had developed relations, relations were taken into account, as some of Kuhac's contacts were in them, such as Bielovar, Đurđevac, Gornja Rijeka, Guščerovac, Koprivnica, Novigrad Podravski, Virje, Vrbovec, and Zagreb. One of the reasons to take into account this particular area, which today is in five counties, city of Zagreb, Zagreb, Varaždin, Koprivnica, Križevci, Bjelovar, Bilogora county, is that it was once part of Bjelovar, Križevci county. Numerous cultural and musical endeavors organized in Križevci in cooperation with dignitaries, artists and societies from those cities testify to the connections. Thus, in the jubilee record of the Sing Croatian Singing Society Zvono in Križevac, 1846-1904, compiled by Frank Gundrum Oriovčanin and published in Križevci in 1904, as well as the minutes of the National Reading Room in Križevci, Narodna Čitaona Križevci, we find descriptions of cooperation with the Croatian Singing Society, Kolo from Zagreb, uh, Podravec from Komprivnica, artists from Zagreb, especially from Music Institute, music of the Imperial and Royal 53rd Regiment from Bielovar, and etc. But um, uh, societies also communicated even more widely, uh, like in Krapina, Varaždin, Sušak, Bakar, Virovitica, Osicek, etc. Second, many prominent people from Križevci due to work obligations and other circumstances did not work or even live in their hometown, and many coming from other cities due to education or employment in a certain period left a mark in the culture of the city. 
An example is the composer and conductor Milutin Farkas, born in Križerci 1865 and died in Zagreb in 1923. A member of a prominent Križerci noble family, nephew of the politician and revivalist Ljudovit Farkas Vukotinović. His father, Šišman Farkas, was an amateur musician and a member of the board of the directors of the Croatian Music Institute. And his mother was Maria Farkas born Pascucci. Milutin's sister Tekla was the wife of Nikola Faller and according to Goya, an excellent violinist. Milutin studied violin at the School of the Music Institute in Zagreb, 1874 to 1881 with Anton Schwartz. And he was secretary of the music school and archive archivist uh, in the Music Institute from uh, 1891 until his death in 1923. Kuhar's contact with Farkas, according to correspondence, is related to his work in the archives of the Music Institute, and he asks him in uh, 1892 to lend him compositions by Ferdo Livadić, Fortunat Pintaric and Ivan Padovic for the purpose of writing their bi biographies with the list of works. Likewise, Contacts with members of the Striga family, Zorka, Dragica, Miladin, in Zagreb have nothing to do with the Križerci area, but are dealing with the preparation of Lisinski's score of Porin by Srećko Albini in letters dated August 1st, 1899 and March 9, 1901. Another example is the writer and philosopher Franjo Markovic, born also in Križevci 1845 and died in Zagreb 1914. Perhaps the most famous Križevci dignitary of the 19th century and the author of the text of Zeit's famous choir, a boy, Opus 182, and the libretto of the opera Mislav. Kuhač met Markovic already during his service as a young high school teacher in Osijek. After finishing school in Vienna from 1866, according to the order of the Royal Government Council in Vienna, he worked at the gymnasium in Osijek, and in 1868, he was transferred to Zagreb at his own request. Kuhac wrote to him just before his transfer on October 30, 1868. Yes, I admit that without your friendly help and intercession, I could not so easily begin with what uh, has been filling my whole soul for a long time. He is uh, referring to his uh, South Slavic uh, folk songs um, research. According to the letters, it could be uh, inferred that it was Markovic who helped Kuhac learn the Croatian language. For example, in a letter to Franjo Rachki, then president of South Slavic Academy, on July 1st, 1868, he wrote from Osijek. So that I can give an account of the successes of my collection and my science to the high academy in so way, I finally make a the theoretical start with our music. I wrote the um, accompanying discussion, which I recommend to your benevolent respect. This brochure was originally written in German, and it may have been printed in that language in Vienna, but local director Zhivko Vukasovic was of opinion that it would be better if the brochure was published first in Croatian and then as a translation in French or German. I listened to the patriotic advice of the director and translate with the help of local gymnasium teacher, Mr. Franjo Markovic, the German manuscript. We also find in the letter to Franjo Markovic in Križevci on October 30, 1868. If you would agree to the proposal of correspondence with me, I would write to you in creation in future. Face with you, I already believe in this because I am convinced that you will not laugh at future linguistic mistakes or consider them negligence. You know my patriotism and you know my opportunities so we do not, do not leave me much time to arrange serious language learning. In 1869 and 1870, Markovic mediated Kuhac's effort to get a job in Zagreb and later in 1882, as a political worker, he advocated in the Croatian parliament for the allocation of funds for the publication of Kuhac's collection of South Slavic folk song fifth volume. As Pekric states, quote, the argument for supporting Kuhac was a positive critique by the then most famous music aesthetician, Eduard Hanslik. He also cited positive reviews from the foreign ma magazines. 
he explained that Kuhach had large expenses during the 20 year collection of material and stated that the state owed another 3000 torrents for the previous four books. In addition, it was Markovic who was hired by South Slavic Academy, Academy to write a review for Kuhach's Catechism of Music, translation of Catechism by Johann Christian Lobe, published in Zagreb 1875, which was very favorable and in which he proposed certain changes in translation. For Vienna in 1878, Markovic wrote a review of the first book of Kuhach South Slavic folk song and Sanya Mayer Bobetko also informs of their in, uh, different approaches in the periodization of the history of music. Perhaps this disagreement also led Kuhach to name Markovic as one of his worst opponents in a letter to teacher Jelislava Horvat in Novigrad near Komprimnica on May 28, 1885. Quote, my worst opponents, Dr. Markovic, Badalic and Zahar, they lay down their weapons and now they are shouting far and wide that the Zeitz was deliberately misleading them." End quote. Another example is the composer Anton Vansash, born in Zagreb 1867 and died in Zagreb 1898. Kuhach student at first who then studied composition in Vienna and with Gilles Massenet in Paris, and who apparently does not have much to do with the musical life of Krizic despite the fact that he finished agricultural high school Gospodar School in Križevci in 1883. However, Vantash Ops 1, created under Kuhar's mentorship and influence, is called the Križevačka Četvorka, Križevci Quadrilla. However, Kuhar's correspondence during his schooling in Vienna and Paris has, can only to some extent have anything to do with Križevci, so it will uh, no longer be taken into account in this presentation. Given the limited time, these aspects will be described in more detail in the written article. For this occasion, um, slightly less than 150 letters were singled out in the period from 1868 to 1907, sent to the following locations. Bielovar, Jakovo, Djurjevac, Gornja Rijeka, Kuščerovac, Koprivnica, Križevci, Novigrad, Podravski, Osijek, Požega, Pregrada, Pišetce in Slovenia, Varaždin, Virje, Vrbovec and Zagreb. Uh, so I uh, divided them here and uh, on the left you can see uh, towns which are in the Križevci area, below Križevci area, and uh, the ones that are not. For Zagreb. <laughs> Um, when in a letter to the super superintendent and postman Franjo Lugaric in Virje, on this December 10, 1869, Kuhac listed, quote, uh, the main places where I stayed and where I undertook my musical experiments, end quote, only Virje and Koprivnica were mentioned from this area. While in the letter to the composer Aloisa Atanasievich in Osijek on September 24, 1879, he also mentions a visit to Križevci. Quote, staying in Križevac, I learned of a very good singer from Križevci, end quote, while he was hosted by the Matačić family. More precisely, at the same time, Kuhač was preparing a biography of two Croatian artists for the Vienna Journal, the singer Maca Matačić from Križevci and composer Aloisa Slava Tanasijević from Osijek. All the mentioned letters were sent to the following persons, a total of 35 and also to three institutions. Uh, maybe to spare some time, I won't uh, read them aloud. Uh, you can uh, uh, see them all uh, here. And the institutions are uh, City of Križevci, uh, Croatian Singing Society Podravac in Koprivnica, and Croatian Singing Society Zvono in uh, Križevci. Among these letters, the town of Koprivnica with 44 letters stands out since 33 letters were sent to the composer, Kapellmeister, music pedagogue, and Kuhač's dear friend, Tomo Šestak, born in Prague uh, in 1852 and died in Koprivnica in 1921. Their relationship in itself could be the subject of a separate study. These letters are dated between 1892 and 1907. 
they reveal an extremely close relationship between the two, two musicians and friends, as we can see in this with the letter. Kuhac commissioned compo uh, compositions from Shestak, which were then published in the collections he edited, such as Zagreb Dance album, Zagrebački album Plesova in 1893, Dance Book of Plesanka number one, and his instructions for playing the piano Uputa u Glasoviranje. He comments on his composing style, gives him advice and instructions for composing, encourages wider music promotion and music education, through Shestak's engagement, he procures compositions from the Koprivnica parish church, such as Pinters, organizes concerts in Koprivnica, comments on musical happenings, mediates in the repair of the organ of the Koprivnica parish church, etc. Immediately after that, 18 letters were sent to Križevci, to Dr. Josip Derenčin, born 1847, died 1904, to Bishop Julia Drohobetsky, uh, 1853 and died 1934, health advisor and city physician Fran Gundrum Oryovchanin, born 1856 and died 1919, Franjo Markovic, who was already mentioned, and the director of the LAN registry, Stepan Matacic. Let us mention that Kuhac was also connected to this area by family ties. Uh, which is one of the reasons why he found time in his often busy schedule for writings to certain people. Lawyer Franjo Shrabets, his brother-in-law, brother of Kuhac's wife, uh, first wife, Maria Josipa Shrabets, uh, he was a royal auditor and later court clerk who had appointments in Bielovar, Đurđevac, Novigrad and Ludbreg. In letters to him, 15, who, in addition to personal matters related to Kuhac's family and health condition, we find that Kuhac used his acquaintances in Zagreb to provide him with financial support, ask him to mediate in selling the collection uh, of South Slavic folk songs, commented on his own articles on various topics in Vienna, describes his research uh, trips and plans, obtains scores for his archives. Thus, he writes in a letter dated April 29, 1895. Thank you very much for your good intentions to enrich my archive, but these things are worth nothing from a musical point of view. I had the same play of sonatas and manuets in published form, but I got rid of them recently because the old Swabian rattle is useless. The only value of the notebook sent to me could be that we have evidence of how the nobles of supposedly savage crowds once nurtured music. For this purpose, I will include that book in my, my archive. If you could find a similar book from Zinsky Frankopan or even older Croatian aristocrats, even from the plebeians of the time, then its historical value would be even greater. Go, search a little. Maybe you find something in Podravina. In addition, Kuhac's daughter Mira, born in Zagreb 1877 and died in Zagreb 1965, married Dusan Kabalini from Križevci who was the manager of the archbishop's estate in Prechets. In all, Kuhac's relationship with the aforementioned correspondence uh, could be defined through several categories. Number one, research, collecting material for the collection of, all, uh, of songs, of South Slavic folk songs, collecting material for other works and articles, biographies of musicians, as well as scores by Croatian composers, Second, promotion and distribution of the collection, in fin like financing and sale intermediates. Three, presence in the musical life, like performances of his work by uh, singing societies or music teaching even. Four, in encouraging and shaping musical life, like composing uh, commissions, compositional advices, procurement of lit literature, concert organization, procurement of in instruments, and fifth, uh, family matters and private letters. Uh, I think I'm uh, going, uh, uh, running out of my time, so I will only show you uh, number uh, some um, uh, folk songs that he collected in the Križevci area from uh, volume two to volume five, uh, like Dojdi Dusha or uh, Napitnica, uh, because Križevci is very famous for uh, wine culture. So, and he also um, 
uh, both uh, Dude or bagpipes from Tomo Rejek uh, in uh, Velike Raven near Križevci, and uh, it is uh, today in Ethnographic Museum in Zagreb in his collection of musical instruments. And the last example is uh, uh, the correspondence between Kuhac and physician from Gundur Moriovchanin, although only uh, I have found two letters, shows a relationship of two researchers whose interest partially overlapped. Gundrum, as Husinets uh, point out, uh, affirms himself not only as a physician, but also as a social, cultural, and sports worker, a distinctive personality of ex exceptional work energy whose activity included collecting folk songs and stories from the Križevci area. He has also published several works on music. From the jubilee record of Zvono, it can be seen that Gundru knew Kuhar's works very well. However, his and Kuhar's interests were of a different di direction, as, as Kuhar writes in a letter dated December 1907. I have received your questionnaires, but I cannot serve you with the, uh, the anthropological data you need. In my book, there are biographies of, your, of our composers, and some of them have a picture, but in those biographies, I paid attention only to their musical work and not the color of their eyes, mustaches, and etc. All the Kruhar's correspondence does not reveal the musical network of the Križevci area to the extent I expected, at the beginning of the research, his connections to the Križevci area are valuable testimonies to the culture of the time and the hidden guidelines that shape that culture. Thank you very much. Thank you so much indeed, Lucia, for a wonderful paper and an absorbing one. Uh, I, I think I have a better idea of how to pronounce Križevci uh, as a result of that. And But, but uh, again, I'm terribly sorry uh, that it's not possible to respond properly to this. And uh, I would just say that uh, I look forward very much to the published version. I'm sorry that you had to leap over some of your material there, but it's uh, truly absorbing and also to me very revealing about how, uh, how deeply um, Kuach interpenetrated with local music traditions and, and, and how reciprocal those uh, relationships were. I, I think that's uh, truly fascinating. Uh, so thank you very much indeed. We're, we're a little bit behind time, but we're not in serious trouble uh, here. So um, uh, we can proceed uh, to the next paper if, 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 if that's okay. Um, our, our second last paper, in fact, is given by Domagoy uh, Maric, uh, who is uh, working in the Ministry of Foreign and European Affairs of the Republic of Croatia. Indeed, he is a, a diplomat uh, of some standing and experience, and also, if I'm not mistaken, uh, undertaking uh, not only one but two PhDs, one in linguistics and one in, in historical musicology. Um, he is speaking to us today on Zagreb historic concerts from 1916 through the prism of the networking of young musicians. So let us welcome, please, Domagoj Maric. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. White. Thanks a lot. Good. Good morning, dear colleagues. So in my presentation, I will tell you more about three important concepts that entered the creation history of music and were held in Zagreb in 1916. That means 105 years ago. They are known by the name Zagreb's historic concerts from 1916. And as I said, there were three of them. So the first one was the symphonic concert of young Croatian composers on the 5th of February, which was repeated twice due to the great interest of the audience on the 7th and on the 11th of February, according to musicologist Shirola. This concert was held in the Zagreb National Theater and it was already mentioned during the conference by my colleague Tatiana Chunko. The second one took place in the Croatian Music Institute <clears throat> about two months later. It was the concert of the choir Lisinski Music Club on the 1st of April, 1916. This concert was repeated as well, but only once and on the 10th of April. It is interesting to underline that this concert was repeated not because of the interest of the audience, but because it was of a charitable nature. The goal of the second concert was to raise, to raise as much money as possible for the victims of the First World War. This, the third concert was the chamber concert of the exhibition Croatian Spring Salon, which was announced on the 15th of April, but was held on the 2nd of May. 
This concert was held in the Croatian Music Institute and it was not repeated at all. Although these concerts have already been the subject of several musicological researchers, uh, I was interested in some other aspect, namely the aspect of networking, which is extremely interesting in this case. These three concerts can be seen as great examples of networking among musicians, as well as among musicians and other artists. In preparation for today's presentation, I asked myself two questions. The first one is who and how organized these concerts? And the second is, what do we know about the relations between the composers who perform at these concerts? Before addressing these issues, I will say something about the concert themselves for those who are not familiar with them. I will also say something about the sources I used. In short, the histories of Croatian music were of little use to me in preparing today's presentation. Histories of Croatian music mention only the first and the most important concert and do not give information about the second and third concert. My main sources were newspaper articles, mostly from 1916, but not just from that year. It is interesting that the composers who then appeared referred to the events from 1916 in many texts written in the 20s, in the 30s, and even in the 1940s. So they kept on re referring to, the, to this event. On the other hand, very useful sources are letters, of course. Based on the letters, we can learn a lot about the relations between composers. To prepare the presentation, I used letters that are found in four legacies, four composers, Cirola, Dobronic, Svetislav Stancic, and Dora Pejacic. Those legacies are kept in here in Zagreb. The third and very important source for my research is the recording from Round Table held in 1966 in Zagreb on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of the concert. Svetislav Stancic was a guest at the round table and gave a lot of interesting first-hand information about this concert. Unfortunately, at this time, most of the other composers were dead already. Apart from Stancic, the only one alive who participated as, at the symphonic concert in 1916 were Kresimir Baranovic, who lived at that time in Belgrade. And probably because of that, he was not a guest at the round table. This recording of this round table that I used for my research is kept in the archives of the Croatian Radio Television. <clears throat> now, I will say something about the context in which these concerts took place. So this is the first, this is the third year of the First World War, 1916, in which the consequences of one of the largest conflicts in the world history began to be felt in everyday life in Zagreb. The First World War changed completely the image of Zagreb and Croatia. Until the beginning of the war in 1914, Zagreb was still a peaceful provincial city of the Austro-Hungarian monarchy with about 100,000 100, inhabitants. Since the battlefield on the river Drina was formed in the summer of 1914, Zagreb became a gathering place for the wounded from the very beginning of the First World War. So it is assumed that in Zagreb alone, about 3,700 soldiers of various nationalities died during the First World War as a result of the wounds most of whom rest in the common grave of the victims of the First World War on Zagreb's graveyard near Oboi. The cultural life was, however, not dead at all. The three concerts have been assessed by contemporaries as a turning point in the history of Croatian music. On the other hand, contemporary music critics have viewed them, three of them, as a whole. That's why we still do it today. The greatest interest of the audience was recorded during the first of three of them. So this is the, the, the symphonic concert, which was held at the Croatian National Theater, which is much larger space than the Great Hall of the Croatian Music Institute, where the two of them, two, second and the third, were held. We come to the media. Nothing happens without media, also in 1916. The interest of the media was incomparably greater on, during the first concert than at the second and the third concert. In brief, it took much more effort to make the first concert happen. So the aspect of networking and the symphonic concert is especially interesting. Critic Milutin Tsiklar Nechayev reveals that the orchestra was composed of 80 musicians and at that very evening performed eight double basses. So for Zagreb, it was really a big event. Critic Ernest Schultz, who wrote three articles about the symphonic concerts in Utah, the list, states that this concert was the birthday of new era in the cultural life of our Croatian homeland. One other critic, Kazimir Krenedic, says that the concert is the beginning of a new age, and that is why it should be written, quotation, 
in golden letters in the history of our cultural development. There is an interesting, a very convincing, convincing description of the atmosphere that was in the theater that evening. Tsikhar Nekhayev, that I mentioned before, compared the enthusiasm he experienced at the concert with the occasion of the premiere of the Croatian opera Porin in 1897. This was a very important event in the Croatian history of music. The opera Porin was composed by Lesinski between 1848 and 1851, but the first performance was many decades later, in 1897. Tsikhar Nekhayev participated in both events and could compare the atmosphere in the theater in 1897 and 1916. However, there is something very important that he reveals, and that is that the six composers who presented themselves to the Zagreb audience were quite unknown at that time. So the symphonic concert brought together six composers of different ages, different classes, and different stylistic affinities. They were Kreshmir Baranovic, Božidar Shirola, Franjo Dugan, Svetislav Stančić, Dora Pejačević, and Anton Dobronić. The age difference was 20 years. The oldest one was Dugan, who turned 42 in 1916, and, what, and he was exactly twice as old as the youngest composer, Stancic, who was barely 20. We will find four of these names at all three concerts, which means that they were very, very well networked. They were Baranovic, Shirola, Dugan, and Dobranić. At the second concert, we will also meet Fran Lotka and Dragan Plamenac, and at the third concert, cellist and composer Jurot Kalčić. Zagreb critics recognize the symphonic concert not only as a starting point of recent creation music, but also the beginning of the action to finally establish a Philharmonic Orchestra, which followed four years later with the founding of Zagreb Philharmonic in 1920. Namely, most critics connect the importance of the symphonic concert with the need to finally establish a Philharmonic Orchestra, linking the lack of creation symphonic music until then with the fact that Zagreb does not yet have the symphonic the Philharmonic Orchestra. Now we come something very important that is, in, in my opinion, not very well known in the history of Croatian music. In 1918, so two years after the concert, it was founded a society which was called Croatian Philharmonic Society or Hrvatska Philharmonia. It consisted of, quotation, Yugoslav music, musicians and music writers. The Croatian Philharmonic Society or Hrvatska Philharmonia, quotation, took on a special task and a sacred duty to set our musical culture to the level at which it will stand with dignity alongside the world musical art through the tireless work of the fresh forces of our musicians. Which was the purpose of this society? It was the, to cultivate Croatian art, quotation. It was to protect local musician and only as a third goal that's mentioned the formation of the Philharmonic Orchestra. What happened to this society? Why is it not known today? Because it failed very, very soon. Very soon it ceased to, to exist, opening door to the Zagreb Philharmonic, which was founded two years later, so in 1920, by completely different persons, namely Arani, Fabri, and so on. Why did this society cease to exist? Shirola writes about it in the first history of Croatian music from 1922. Shirola says, maybe the society was given an appropriate name. So it was Croatian Philharmonic in 1918. Maybe there was too much affection and excitement in the first inspiration because the problem of founding the Philharmonic Orchestra was extremely complicated. Now, why did I mention this at all? Because it is significant that the same names from the historic concerts from 1916 participated in the formation of Croatian Philharmonic Society two years later. Which names do we meet? We meet composers Franjo Dugan, Božita Shirola, Dora Pejačević, Anton Dobranić, Dragan Plamenac, and music writers Ernest Schultz, Milutin Cichlar Nechayev, Artur Schneider. So it is a networking in the true sense of the word. So much about the Croatian Philharmonic Society. Now I will return to the two other aspects of the historic concerts, namely organizers of the first concert and relation among musicians, which I find very interesting. Although it is regularly pointed out that the initiator of the first concert was conductor Friedrich Kukavina, it is interesting to analyze what other names are encountered in the critics in highlighting the most deserving people in the concert. To be, to be short, along with Kukavina, we will most often meet the head of Croatian National Theater, Vladimir Treschets-Brainsky, 
my colleague Tatiana Chunko mentioned him already. He was a writer who became the intendant of the theater in 1909 when he established the permanent Zagreb Opera for the third time. Although he made several great feats and hired a number of important names like Milan Sachs, Ivo Rajic, Maja Strozzi, and Braco Gavella, Treszczyk Branski is remembered as a bureaucrat and autocrat, rigid in implementing his decisions and measures. Perhaps this is why, why the critics of 1916, while Treszczyk was still in power, praised him and Rukavina equally, while all sources after 1917, when Treszczyk left office, point out only Rukavina. So Treszczyk was very, very soon forgotten. What do we know about relations among musicians? When Rukavina died in 1940, Shirola wrote an obituary, in Croatian we say necrologue. From that text, we learn how did they met. Shirola says that they, they met one beautiful, bright autumn evening in 1914. Shirola describes this with the following words. I was at home, so through the open window, I suddenly heard from the street the call of my dear friend A. He, that was Arthur Schneider that I mentioned already. Looking out of the window, I saw on the street next to my friend, another gentleman, a tall, dry appearance of a face unknown to me. I went out to them and without any hesitation, Rukavina began to act suggestively, assuring me that although only beginning, beginning in the composition, I'm certainly capable of writing a good dramatic music, valuable Croatian opera. Rukavina persuaded Shirola to choose a story from Zagreb's history or the template of his opera, Quotation, constantly referring, referring to Shenra's novel Zlataro Zlato. But as Shirola points out, there was no libretto for Zlataro Zlato, so I started writing, instead of that, an opera from the life of old Dubrovnik. And that is how Shirola's first opera, Stanac, was created, whose premiere was conducted again by Rukavina just one year before the symphonic concert in 1915. Regarding the relations between other composers, the relation between Dora Pejacevic and Svetislav Stancic is extremely interesting. At the concert of the 5th of February, 1916, Stancic played the solo piano part in the Concerto for Piano and Orchestra in G minor by Dora Pejacevic, which is the first piano concerto in the history of Croatian music. We know that Dora Pejacevic financially helped Stancic during his studies in Berlin between 1918 in 1922. I looked at the legacy of Dora Pejacevic, and I looked also at the legacy of Svetislav Stancic, and I was hoping to find a letter that changed, but I didn't find it. However, I found something else, and that is the portrait of Dora Pejacevic, who framed photography that Dora Pejacevic gave as a gift to Stancic in 1916. So, however, there are some traces about their relation. Stancic often came to Zagreb during his studies in Berlin, at that time, Dora Pejacevic was already living in Munich, so where she died in 1923. So we have proof that Stancic is traveling from Berlin to Zagreb and back from Zagreb to Berlin between 1918 and 1922. And at the same time, Dora Pejacevic lives in Munich. We can assume that they met in Munich, but there is no evidence for that. But something more important, talking to many musicians and musicologists, about why no one in Croatia had composed a piano concerto before Dora Piace. So we had composers, but no one composed a piano concerto. The most common answer I got was, there was no piano player who could perform it. At that time, when Dora Piace was composing a piano concerto, Stancic already distinguished himself as a gifted young piano player. My question is, did Dora Piace compose a concerto for Stancic? We do not know this. I mentioned earlier a round table held in 1966. There is a recording of that round table where Stancic talked about his participation in the symphonic concert 50 years earlier. At one point, the moderator, Nenad Turkan, who is a famous musicologist, well, asked Stancic, what can you tell us about Dora Pejacevic? Stancic said, she was extremely talented composer, completely devoted to music, but, According to Svetislav Stancic, Dora Pejacevic could have done much more for the Zagreb music scene because she was a daughter and granddaughter of Croatian viceroys Vladislav and Theodor Pejacevic. So Stancic said she had a great social influence. She could have done much more for us. Now we will come to a not so harmonious relation between two other composers. In 1916, 
Dugan and Dobronić, Franjo Dugan and Anton Dobronić, were perceived not only as different, but also stylistically completely opposed authors. Cichla Nehaje compared the works of Franjo Dugan and Anton Dobronić and said, the compositions, their compositions were so different that one could imagine that two composers could fight. And the conflict did occur indeed, but six years later in 1922, when a lively public debate broke out between the two composers. So what happened? Dobronić wrote a negative review on Bozhidar Shirola's recently published History of Croatian Music. We are talking about 1922. Dobronić said that the book was, quotation, poorly collected and tendentiously presented material for the history of music. In his review, he also touched many participants in Zagreb musical life, naming especially Dugan as, quotation, the most conservative musician of the entire 20th century. This was in 1922, and he already says for the entire century. Dugan reacted to Dobranich's text, describing himself as a person who lives peacefully and secluded, away from unnecessary conflicts. However, Dugan wanted to portray Dobronich not only as a bad composer, but also as a bad professor. So he published in the newspaper Slobodna Tribuna several exam papers of the harmony and counterpoint of two anonymous students that Dobronich reviewed and evaluated. So it was very, very unprofessional from, Dubr uh, from uh, Dugan. Dobronich and Dugan were members of the examination commission at the Zagreb Music Academy back in summer of 1922. So Dugan had an insight into the examination papers that Dobronich corrected. Dugan also analyzed in detail all the mixed mistakes made by two anonymous students, which Dobronich as a poor professor did not recognize and did not correct. Uh, so I will conclude my presentation in much nicer and more emotional tone, I would say. <laughs> in the legacy of Stanjic, I discover a wonderful letter that reveals, reveals to us some details of the relation between Stanjic and the, comp and the composer and musicologist Dragan Plamenac. Dragan Plamenac was a Jude, and he left Jew, and he left Zagreb in 1939 for a symposium held in New York. This symposium was held at the end of the August 1939, just a few days before the outbreak of World War II. Pramenat stayed in New York for some years, and actually he never returned to live back to Croatia. But as we find out, he was certainly very interested in what happened to his old friends during the war. And in 1947, so after the Second World War, he writes to Stanjic. This is probably the first contact with someone from Croatia, because we learn from the letter that Plamenac doesn't know anything about the circumstances in Zagreb. Plamenac wanted to find out what happened to his personal belongings, especially to the books and grand piano Bechstein that his family owned in the palace in the center of Zagreb. Plamenac write to Stanjic, you will recognize this piano if you see it somewhere, because you know this piano from, from before the war. That, that, that means that, they, 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 that Stanjic visited Plamenac frequently. Plamenac tells to Stanjic something else, that he has heard that part of his personal music sheets ended up in the butcher's shop in Zagreb, and that the butchers, butchers rub, wrap the meat in sheets of Monteverdi and Schutz. Very interesting. But however, the end of this letter is the most touchy part. Plamenac wants to find out everything what happens in Zagreb, and he concludes his letter with the words. Therefore, Sveto, Sveto, please answer me. Write to me extensively about everything. Let me know about old mutual acquaintances in the company of whom we have lived the years of our youth, the years that will never return, just as the world behind us will never return again. Goodbye, Sveto. I greet you warmly and squeeze your right hand, Dragon. That was everything from my side. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. March. I suspect there will be many questions about that uh, fascinating, not to say explosive, uh, uh, a contribution. Uh, I have to, as an Irishman, the, the year 1916 tends to mean only one thing to me, but I, I am aware of the uh, enormous significance of those uh, concerts in, in Zagreb. And uh, it's fascinating to look behind the scenes as it were. Um, but as I said, I, my, my guess is that uh, some of my musicological colleagues will, will, will have questions for you. Uh, Thank you. So as, a, as always, I think we're very, very caught for time. 
Um, we must move uh, without delay to our last uh, speaker in this session, which is, um, who is Dr. Inya Stanovic. And uh, Dr. Stanovic is a, a concert pianist as well as a, a scholar and uh, has a particular interest in the whole subject of uh, historical performance and performances research, um, on which topic uh, in relation to Chopin, I believe she did her uh, PhD studies um, in Sheffield and uh, is now the recipient of a prestigious uh, Leverhulme uh, Fellowship, uh, which she holds at the University of Huddersfield. Um, and her topic uh, today is Julius Block's Cylinder Collection, Masterpieces of Music Networking. So warmly welcome, Inia, and uh, looking forward very much to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. So nice to see you again. Likewise. And hello, everybody. And thank you for attending this talk. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here. However, I do hope that the next time we will uh, meet in person in our wonderful Zagreb. Um, I will start my uh, sharing my screen. Just give me a moment. Uh, I will go like this. Yes, okay. Is this fine? Uh, great. So my paper today presents my research. Uh, I conducted on Julius Bloch uh, and his wax cylinder collection a topic that has fascinated me for years now. The research presented today would not be possible without generous help of the City of London Phonograph and Gramophone Society uh, and their Richard Ta Taylor Bursary, a Leverhulme Research Fund, and of course, Pushkinsky Dome in St. Petersburg. Um, Julius Bloch was born in uh, Peter Maritzburg Natal, uh, KwaZulu Natal, which was a British colony in South Africa. He was born in 1858 into a family of a wealthy Russian entrepreneur that represented American trading companies in Russia. From the young age, he was interested in music and he had hopes for becoming a musician. In his words, quote, I hope to enter the Leipzig Conservatoire when my schooling was done. This ambition, however, remained a dream. For when I was 15 years old, I was suddenly sent by my father to London. From London, he was sent to New York for further business training where he stayed until 1876. Only a year later, when he was still underage, he started to run a branch of his father's business in St. Petersburg. He was especially interested in modern labor-saving inventions. Uh, Bloch took over the family business in 1888 and gained notoriety for bringing the first bicycles, typewriter, phonograph, cotton gin, lifts, and sewing machines to Russia. Here we can see one of uh, uh, the company's uh, rooms and sewing machines uh, on the left. Uh, but privately, he was always interested in music and had a wide circle of uh, musician friends, many of whom were the most famous musicians of the 19th century Russia. The majority of his wax cylinders were recorded at Julius Bloch's residences between 1889 and 1927. Based on Bloch's memoirs, which I accessed in Leeds University Library, alongside the announcements heard on the cylinders, the locations include Russia, Moscow and St. Petersburg, Germany, Berlin and Grunewald, and Switzerland, VV. Because of Bloch, we can hear Josef Hoffmann playing a year after Anton Rubinstein's death, Paul Pabst, a Liszt pupil who died in 1897, performing his own solo transcriptions as well as piano forehand with Leo Konus and Sergei Taneyev. Anton Narensky performing his own compositions, including excerpts from his famous D minor piano trio in the year of its composition with violinist Jan Hrimali and cellist Antoli Brandukov. Maria Klimentova Murmotseva, who created the roles of Tatiana and Oksana in Tchaikovsky's Eugene Onegin, Onegin uh, accompanied at the piano by Tchaikovsky's pupil Tanye. The great Russian mezzo-soprano Elizaveta Lavrovskaya, who recommend, uh, recommended to Tchaikovsky that he compose an opera based on the story of Eugene Onegin, as well as Anna Yosipova, Nikolai Figner, Paul Pabst, and as you can see, many others. You will see it in a second. <laughs> Here, some of the recording, uh, recording artists. 
Uh, not just this, Bloch's recordings include the earliest recording performances of Bach, Chopin, Mendelssohn, Schumann, Tchaikovsky, Wagner, Donizetti, Verdi, Bizet, and Arensky. He had visionary views on the phonograph and thought it could be used to aid practice, composition, and even scientific research. Talking about music networking, Bloch's surroundings were close to unbelievable. Reading his memoirs sometimes reminds one of a fairy tale where the whole music creme de la creme of 19th century Russia meets at these luxurious dinner parties where they dine, drink, and play music. Bloch's life and work are spellbinding, as well as his passion for music, which inspired this extraordinary man to create one of the world's most important surviving musical legacies. So how did this happen? In 1889, uh, Bloch was on a business trip in New York. During his trip, he sent an introductory letter to Thomas Edison and his laboratory in or Orange, New Jersey. The letter was da dated 15th July. We can see here that Bloch had an introduction from a man called Chiva. A visit was arranged soon after, probably on the July 23rd, as noted in a letter that followed. During the meeting, it is not clear if he was giving, uh, given or purchased a phonograph. This was a, a class M machine. I have a picture here. Uh, this is electric phonograph. This was manufactured for general public, public only from 1890. That's why I'm not sure if Edison would sell it. Uh, so it's a matter of debate. Um, and originally it was sold as machine, a machine for dictation. This changed after it became very clear that phonograph was a source of entertainment for general public. The machine was really expensive, costing around $225 at a time when the average salary in the new, in United States was around $40 a month. Relatively few of these phonographs were sold. It is very heavy, heavy, weighing 65 pounds, and it was usually sold with a single hearing cube, speaking cube, oil can, camel's hair chip brush, for cleaning the cylinders. Nowadays, the Class M is one of the rarest and most desirable machines, in part because of their build quality. This was certainly not lost on Bloch, who in his memoirs states that he has used it and experimented with it constantly during 40 years, and still it gives not the smallest sign of wear and tear. Although he uh, took this new machine with him back to Russia, some parts were subsequently delivered by May. And it is notable that he did not purchase a listening tube or any funnels, uh, as we can see here from this letter. Um, he arranged for this to be made once back when he was back in Russia. This is just a wonderful example how experimental first home recording sessions actually were. Um, so uh, I examined all the letters between Bloch and Edison or his assistant Charles Batchelor, which give us clear indication of the various pieces of equipment he used and the way how he recorded. Um, also, these letters are valuable source of information uh, about troubles uh, anybody who tried to record with phonograph went through. I personally learned a lot, of, uh, a lot from these letters, which helped me to use the phonographs in recording sessions of my own. For example, the motor of Bloch's phonograph required a steady current of two and a half volts and two amps, and which was delivered by granite cell battery. I believe if I go back, the battery is on the, on the right, as you can see. So you, you, you would have to mix the battery yourself. Uh, uh, Bachelor sent him close instructions how to do it. Bloch's social status was clearly really high since he was able to purchase the phonograph to Tsar Alexander III. The Tsar subsequent, uh, so uh, he, uh, he managed to have an audition in front of Tsar and show him his phonograph and then Tsar ordered another one. Uh, around the same time, Bloch organized public exhibitions of his phonograph in the St. Petersburg Conservatory, the Moscow Conservatory, the Imperial Academy of Sciences, Sciences and other universities and scientific societies. As early as October, remember he went to see, him, to see Edison in July, but as early as October in 1889, Bloch started to organize phonographic evenings and writes to Bachelor about Tchaikovsky. 
and his friends from the conservatory are being amazed with the phonograph. In the same letter, we learned that Bloch used the listening tube that uh, his factory constructed and that his granite cell battery could work for over two hours. But the initial attempts at recording were not successful. The glass of the diamond cram would shatter, the stylus snap breaking uh, would snap and the cylinders would get broken. At the outset, Bloch only managed to record the spoken voice with any degree of clarity. Over the time, as the letters testify, Bloch became more adept and, uh, at recording, and he ultimately managed to record a series of different musicians with success, including some of the most important musicians and artists of his time on Cylinder. So therefore we have in his collection, Pyotr Ilyich Tchaikovsky, unfortunately not playing, but he's talking and whistling, we have Leo Tolstoy, Nikola Rimsky-Korsakov, um, and uh, each of these people described their reaction to the phonograph in the appendix to block memoirs called Edison Album, who sh he shared with Edison um, uh, office in 1922. Block moved to Germany in 1899. There is no evidence that he recorded between 1901 and 1910, but significant recordings uh, survive uh, from the years 1911 to 1915. Uh, just to name a few, 11-year-old Yasha Haifetz, one week after his sensational debut with Arthur Nikisch and the Berlin Philharmonic, Nikisch accompanying Elera Gerhardt, Paul Yuan, a stu student of Arensky and Taniev playing his own composition, Leonid Kreutzer, the pianist and teacher at the Berlin Academy of Music, playing forehand piano with Yuan as well as solos by Chopin, Yadov, and Yuan. And finally, the 19-year-old 19, 19 violinist, Eddie Brown, who is accompanied by Bloch. Bloch spent his final years in VV, Switzerland, with his second wife. While living in Switzerland, Bloch recorded the voices of Leo Toisto's daughter and granddaughter. But he used, it, it was really wonderful but because he recorded Leo Toilstoy himself, uh, and uh, he used the same cylinder to record his daughter and granddaughter. So we have the whole family history on this really small snippet of, uh, of spoken word. During his lifetime, Bloch was aware of the importance of his collection. He sent several of his cylinders to Edison with hope that the inventor could preserve them by baking molds of the recordings, and such attempts failed. Edison was not interested. Um, and the cylinders uh, uh, Bloch sent to Edison were evidently later destroyed in a fire. In 1930, Bloch began negotiations with the phonogram archive at the um, phonograph archive uh, in Berlin, hoping that they would preserve his cylinders for future generations. He planned the cylinders to be galvanized in order to preserve them, but died before the idea could be, uh, could be realized. Bloch's daughter, Nancy, donated 359 original wax cylinders to the phonograph archive in Berlin, while his musical scores and manuscripts were donated to Bern, with some, also with some cylinders as well, and some cylinders were uh, apparently sent to Warsaw, according to Bloch, uh, Bloch's son, Walter. It was believed that all of the cylinders were destroyed during the Second World War. Amazingly, many of the Berlin cylinders survived. They have been evacuated to Slesia in 1944 to prevent their destructions. They were confiscated by the Russians after the war. The Berlin archive that originally housed the cylinders was located in what soon became Soviet-controlled East Berlin, and it disappeared behind the Iron Curtain. The cylinders themselves were eventually taking, uh, taken to Leningrad, where they came to be housed at the Institute of Russian Literature, now commonly uh, known as Pushkin's House or Pushkinsky Dome. Outside the Soviet Union, everyone assumed that the cylinders were forever lost. Within Russia, musicologists were aware that the block cylinders existed, but this information was not, not available to musicologists from the rest of the world until two violinists, John Maltese and John Anthony Maltese, who were trying to find the Asha Haifa cylinder, tracked them down. What happened is that according to Ward Marston, Bloch's son, Walter gave a copy of his father's memoir to Yale University in 1965. The book contained detailed information about the cylinders. And in the early 90s, a small collection of 24 cylinders, uh, together with uh, photos and papers relating to them, uh, appeared and was auctioned in London. 
the noted New York collector Alan Königsberg bought them and wrote an article about the block cylinders in Antique Phonograph Monthly in 1992. In 2005, John Maltese, Ward Marston and Scott Kessler gained access to block cylinders in Pushkinsky Dome after years of trying and went there and Marston's record company produced a series of digital trust transfers that were subsequently published on the CD, The Dawn of the Recording, Julius Block Cylinders. So before the pandemic started, after significant efforts, I gained also the access to the cylinders and examined them all in Pushkinsky Dome. I am now in process of assembling the complete catalog of surviving block cylinders. The existing lists are confusing as they are occasionally contrasting and show a number of missing cylinders, including the one which apparently holds recording of Tchaikovsky playing piano, accompanying Elizaveta Lavrovskaya. Unfortunately, I was not able to find this cylinder and transfer was never made. I have to understand this place is humongous. Everywhere where you look, there are cylinders and they have cylinders uh, stored uh, everywhere uh, in all the rooms and the attic <laughs> and, and everywhere they could put a cylinder, they put a cylinder. And so uh, I like to think that this cylinder with Tchaikovsky playing piano is somewhere in Pushkinsky Dome waiting to be discovered. But what I wanted to show you something, because talking about the cylinders and actually not playing how they sound would be a sacrilege. Um, I wanted to show you a cylinder which caught my attention, made by Paul Pops, who died in 1897 in the age of 43. His 1895 cylinder of Schumann Chopin from his carnival is a touching ly lyrical recording revealing virtuosity of Pops' pianism. Uh, the cylinders he made with Bloch are the only recordings of this unfairly neglected Liszt pupil, and these are also first known recordings of Chopin and Schumann ever made. Okay, so. Sorry, I, I, I'm, I'm aware of the time, so I'm, I'm going to cut the recordings a little bit. Another, uh, the, another example of Bloch's work is Anton Arensky's performance of his own Nocturne. It is important to stress that Bloch cylinders are the first systematic effort in history of recording to preserve composers' interpretations of his own works. He began this in 1892, and as such, it was way ahead gramophone companies projects with Sansons and Greek. I wanted to show you this piece because it's interesting to explore all the textual changes Sarensky made. And, uh, and here is a snippet of how he played. So, ah, sorry. Okay, <laughs> I didn't want to go to this slide already, but yes, this paper showcases the vast distances of Bloch's musical networking, but they don't end in the 20th century. I used his cylinders alongside the written evidence in my practice-led research project in which I aim to understand the practicalities of cylinder recording sessions, how much musicians actually needed to change their playing to record on wax, and what is phonograph capable of registering as a recording machine. So to end here, uh, I'm going to play a short excerpt of a cylinder recording made in block style using almost the same technologies I'm using all the 19th century, uh, uh, 19th century playing techniques and expressional techniques. So, um, so yes, here is the mazurka, a snippet. Oh, 
very sorry. It touched my computer. <laughs> Right. So, this research is, dis uh, is discussed uh, in a recently published article in Swedish Seismograph, and the findings include original measurements of phonograph sound capturing capabilities and suggest a new method in early recording uh, research. Here are some more photos of the project which focus on early recording technologies and performance. None of this would happen without block cylinders. Uh, there are wonderful sonic evidence of social networking at its best. Through his remarkable social circles, Bloch was able to leave us one of the most important early recording collections, which paint a colorful picture of these past times and forgotten playing techniques. I hope you agree with me that this wonderful collection is a true masterpiece of music networking in the late 19th century Russia, which now reaches the 21st century. And I really hope it will not stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Inya, for an absolutely fascinating paper and uh, really cutting edge research uh, on top of everything else in terms of historically performed recording or informed recording, which is a, uh, an absolutely new thing to me and I, I dare say to most people, uh, but also for having um, surveyed so compendiously uh, this amazing collection and the extraordinary man who's responsible for it. And, and also the rather sad story of its dissemination. I, I hope you get back to St. Petersburg uh, when this plague is over and it looks as if it nearly is uh, to continue your research. Um, I'm very conscious, again, I, I feel it's incumbent on me to apologize to everybody this morning. Uh, it's a kind of Felix culpa that we've had these marvelous papers, but inevitably we are very caught for time. It's now just past, it's 10.34 by my uh, laptop here. Well, 11.34 in fact in Zagreb. And uh, we were supposed to reconvene at 12 o'clock uh, and, and then we we're pushing on right through to uh, rather later, until I, I, what time is it? I suppose about half past two. So I'm, uh, we, could we take perhaps a couple of questions now arising from this session? Yes, of course, uh, 10, 15 minutes is okay. Okay, that's fine. It's just, I'm, it is okay, Viera, but people are coming in a, again at midday and uh, I know we have- oh, a... we can push that at 10 after, after okay. noon. So. All right, well, that's, that's a relief. Yes. Yeah. It's a, it would be a pity not to oh, have the pity. discussion because it was so challenging, everything. So. Absolutely. So um, the floor is open if anybody would like to, to begin with uh, questions or comments. Again, nobody. Uh, 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 somebody should break the ice. <laughs> So well, I, I, I have too many questions, so I won't. Yes, me too. Okay. <laughs> there, there, mu there must be questions on, uh, on everything. I mean, but I, just to, to dive right in. Just um, start, yes. Yeah, well, I, I, I mean, I'm sure that anybody concerned with uh, Croatian music would have been fascinated uh, with uh, Mr. Maric's paper on, on those 1916 concerts. And uh, even as a, an outsider, but an interested one, um, one comment I wanted to make with regard to Piacevic is that uh, that criticism that she could have done more because of her connections, um, I think might be modified by the fact that she herself was alienated from her family and uh, that, uh, that her, despite her aristocratic lineage, um, she endured a considerable um, crisis in, in pursuing her musical career. So that might possibly go some way to explaining why it was that uh, if, if it is indeed the case that she didn't, as it were, do more to help her fellow uh, musicians and composers, it may simply be because she herself was in a kind of, as I understand it, a kind of exile from her, from her, from her family. Um, so that was just one point I wanted to make. And the other was, uh, in regard to those 1916 concerts, I, I just wondered whether anybody who has researched this uh, topic um, had anything further to add to the um, 
to the significance of those concerts, uh, particularly as I think I'm right in saying uh, that you you um, so there's a great deal of attention given to the first concert to the to the 19, first concert in the Croatian National Theatre, but less so to the ones given in the um, in the music for I'm. So I, I presumed that that would elicit comment. Perhaps, perhaps not. Well, if I may add, <clears throat> concerning Dora Pejačević, <clears throat> I would say that she was an outsider all the time. So she she was indeed an outsider. And uh, first, the I was interested. How did you manage at all uh, to to get to this society? I think, in my opinion, it is through her cousin, uh, through her cousin uh, uh, Hugo Mihalovic, who was a famous pianist, let's say, at this time. Because actually, um, uh, uh, she didn't spend too much time in Zagreb. We don't know. We do not know how much time did she spend in Zagreb. In her legacy, I have found the address where she lived. It was in Boskovićeva Street 20. And uh, uh, in, some, in some, uh, some sources, I have discovered that her hometown, her place in Zagreb was a gathering place for Croatian musicians. But something is very interesting, that she was the only one composer, only one of six composers who presented herself during the first concert that we, could, that we didn't find during the second, on the second and on the third concert, historic concert. So, she, so this shows that she was an outsider in a way. Wow. The second concert was concert of vocal, vocal works. And she didn't, she didn't fit here. She didn't fit there. This is for sure, because it was, it was the beginning of a new, uh, new style in Croatian music of the, of the, of the, of the interwar period. But she had a great chamber works. And it's sure that she would, she would be extremely suitable on the program of the third concert. But she, 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 we can't find her work on the program of the third concert. Right. And uh, something also is very interesting. Uh, I, I have found a proof that she did attend this concert because in one critic, uh, crit, uh, crit, it's, it said that she, she is extremely modest. So after her piano concerto, she came to the stage, she came to the stage and everybody who, who saw her saw that she was extremely modest while standing on the stage. So being that modest, we cannot, we, uh, I, 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 I mean, um, I can understand that people did, did uh, wait from her a lot, did, did expect from her a lot, but I, I, and she, she probably couldn't give it, especially after, after the fall of the monarchy, because she was no name after the fall of the monarchy. She, she, she moved, she, she, she lived, she died very soon and she lived in Munich. Yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely, and and that that does explain it. There were two other uh, things very quickly, since nobody seems to be. I'm astonished, frankly, that that, that my uh, Zagreb colleagues are not coming in on this. It's a matter of complete mystery to me. But uh, two very quick things. One is that there's this very strong uh, parallel in the uh, situation you described with regard to the significance of her piano concerto, uh, and and your explanation that you know there, there simply wasn't anybody. Uh, you know that unless there were, and and also with regard to the Zagreb Philharmonic, you know that that without an impetus, without musicians to perform, there was no incentive on the part of composers to compose. But I I just wanted to ask one further small question, which is to do with this Croatian um, Philharmonic Society, which I again, if I was paying attention properly, I think you said it was established a couple of years after the concert and then died away very quickly. And I just wondered, was that anything to do with the fact that? By then, the Croatian Musical Institute was 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 very active, and and perhaps people, I don't know, people per, uh, perceived that the institute was already to some extent doing the work of the society. But I'm, I'm just curious to know exactly. That's what I that's what I think as well, because this Croatian Philharmonic Society was actually a copy of the Croatian uh, Institute, Croatian uh, Music Institute, yeah, yeah. and. They didn't have a hall. They, 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 they didn't have a space. So, so it was simply an enthusiastic society. And there is only, I have found some traces on this. And there is only one part in Shirola's history of music that I quoted. And here Shirola becomes extremely emotional while writing this. Because he said, we wanted to do a lot, but we didn't manage to do anything. And then two years after, as of, in the next year, uh, was founded the, 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 uh, the uh, Philharmonia Kazalishnog Orchestra, so the Philharmonic of the Theater Orchestra, which changed the name to Zagreb Philharmonic in the next year. So, in, 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 in the, so, so it's a it's, it's very, very short period. It's an extremely short period, full of events. 
And some of those, some of those trials uh, failed very, very soon. And one of them is this creation of the harmonic society that I find very interesting and actually a direct link, direct link, direct consequence of the symphonic concept of 1916. That's absolutely fascinating. And it, it, it seems that the whole period, despite the war and everything else that was going on, uh, just changed the, the complexion of music in, in Zagreb, uh, certainly professional orchestral music. It's, it's just remarkable. Would anybody else like to? to... Uh, I would just like to add something to it. Uh, the the Musikverein was actually a meeting point of, of musicians of, uh, with various attitudes. And uh, some of them were really active and uh, could compare the musical life in Zagreb with the music life in Vienna or Munich. Mostly these two cities were always a model. And uh, so they also wanted to improve, for example, chamber music. And that was the uh, idea that the Society for the Advancement of Chamber Music, which was founded, I think, in the late 80s, uh, early 90s, also started. And it, it really, they presented, they're organized within Musikverein, they organized some 120 concerts with invited guests from the best known quartets of the time, trios and uh, soloists with uh, mostly with piano accompaniment. So uh, they had their task. Uh, the Philharmonic Society had their task to, to uh, organize the Philharmonic concerts. And uh, well, maybe the, they were somehow in a way, uh, they stood in a way of, of uh, as a, uh, what what the theater orchestra wanted to do. So they were not necessary anymore because the, the, the transformation was already active in, 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 the, in the move. And uh, well, the uh, Musikverein had several such uh, impulses, gave uh, uh, their members gave various impulses and they were very important and they really had results above all in uh, gaining the quality of Zagreb concert life and uh, uh, giving, giving a model for a real European way of life. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vera. Uh, would anybody else like to come in on any of the other papers? Uh, Lucia has also a comment and Lily. Uh, oh, I'm not seeing that. Lily, Lily was first, go Lily. So thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you all of you for your uh, wonderful papers and for uh, the organization of the conference. And I just wanted to add uh, um, a small remark that I observed that the, the more papers I hear about uh, Kuhach, the more parallels I see between Kuhach and, and uh, Cornelia Brani, who was, who was uh, one of the leading figures of uh, the Hungarian musical life. And, and also for, he was a composer to uh, a music writer, music critic. So, so uh, I just wanted to thank you for, for all of this information. So it was very useful. Very good. Thank you so much indeed, Lily. Um, did Lucia want to say something? Yes. Yes, I wanted to ask uh, colleague Maric uh, uh, how much uh, newspaper reflected the public, uh, um, public activities of uh, Croatian uh, Philharmonic Society. I have discovered like five articles uh, and it was mainly in Arne Novine. And uh, unfortunately there is no legacy of it, but in the, in the legacy of uh, uh, um, Bojdar Shirola, I have discovered, uh, so uh, Shirola used, so, so the legacy of Shirola is huge. It, it, it is very, very big. And uh, they printed on one, one paper, they printed rules of the creation of the harmonic society. And uh, so the, in the legacy of Shirola, you can find many, many, many papers his other papers, historiographical papers, where on one side is written, are written those rules of the Croatian Philharmonic Society, and on the other side, uh, the, his, his, his works, which means that they prepared a lot of papers with the rules of Croatian Philharmonic Society that they didn't use because the, because the, uh, the society stopped to exist. Yeah? So um, uh, there are some traces, there are some traces about this society, but not enough. And <laughs> it's difficult to find some, something, something interesting about it. I have discovered also some concerts that they organized. So as, as Professor Katalinic said, 
in a way, they were not musicians like Arani, Fabri, and, and, and Graf, and everybody who, who organized the Zagreb Philharmonic Society. They were composers and music, music writers. And that's why they, they couldn't, and, and, and as I said, their third goal was to, was to form an orchestra. So, the, so it was in a way initiative, very, very enthusiastic initiative. And uh, Shirola says that um, it might be that they have chosen the wrong name in the wrong time. Croatian Philharmonics Society in 1918, while uniting with the other uh, South Slavs. Th thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just, uh, Clemens Kreuzfeld has a question for Inya. Yeah. Um, I just read it. What was the advantage of operating a phonograph with battery? I knew until now only those versions with a clockwork. Since the recording time of the cylinders was limited anyway, I wonder about any advantages of battery operation. Thank you for your question. There are no advantages. They just, uh, the first couple of uh, phonographs he, he made, uh, were operated by the battery because he couldn't figure out how to make the system roll in the, the uh, in the, in the, uh, like it has to, phonograph has to spin in the continuous way uh, with the same speed. So the first phonographs had this battery operated thing and very soon, few years after they came out, he figured out how to do the winding mechanism, which is actually you wind like this, so they can run like that. And um, uh, and a lot of people then change their mechanism. It, there is so uh, that's un, that's that type that mechanism is under the machine. You can see, and it basically looks like a clock. Uh, and uh, so it, it that clock was gen like powered through the battery just because he couldn't find a way how the clock mechanism could work continuously. That makes sense because it needs to go in the same speed. And here is, uh, so I I think it's my some kind of, uh, I, I don't know. I think that block did uh, use then later on that he changed that mechanism to winding one. But I did talk about that with Ward Marston, who did the CD, and he he said, no, no, I don't agree. I think that he changed that he didn't change, and he stayed with the battery one. So there are just you know differences in opinions. We could both be right. We could both be wrong. <laughs> or somebody can be right. Somebody can be wrong. It doesn't. So there is nothing nothing to it but how to make the machine work. <laughs> so that's that. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Inya. Um, perhaps we have time for one more question. Uh, if I, I think at this point we're definitely going to have to start at ten past uh, twelve. Uh, well, I would like just to comment. Uh, I'm grateful to my colleagues who uh, mentioned Kuhach, both Maria and uh, Sara and Lucia, because they showed how Kuhach was important at his time, and he let's just say he got mixed up in, in various types of, of uh, musical life. So uh, I think it, this personality really deserves to, to be analyzed and to, to, to be researched. And the second comment is uh, to Domagoj, uh, do you know the uh, research of Vilena Verbanić of the uh, musical instruments in Zagreb museums? I don't know if uh, this is of course, of course, yeah. yeah. We contacted a lot, yeah. <laughs> yes, because she found the piano by by Plamenat's mother in the uh, uh, in Museum for uh, Arts and Crafts in Zagreb. Yeah, yeah. We, we but actually, this is the not the same. This is yeah. not the same. Yeah, I think this is not the same. I think this is I not think... the same. Uh huh. Yeah, uh -huh. because the legacy of Stanchich is uh, since recently in the Music Academy. Yes. It is not in the Croatian Music Institute anymore. And uh, while I was researching in the legacy of Sanchez, uh, Vilena was sitting close to me, so we co co we commented everything together. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Just well, uh, uh, do you have a comment, Harry? Yeah, just a very quick one. Um, uh, just to add to that, I mean, Kuac is 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 just to my mind is incredibly important. I mean, as he he he's prominent in three of the papers we had today. And uh, his name is sounding throughout. But as Lily, I think, said, uh, you know, there's very, there's, there are also very strong parallels between his activities. I, I could identify 
uh, people involved in Irish music, uh, in very similarly, uh, not perhaps the same formidable appetite for correspondence that Kuwait had, but nevertheless, um, I just wanted to make two other points, uh, which was that uh, I'm terribly sorry there isn't more time to talk to Mr. Uh, Rusheen about his um, Slovakian uh, church music research, because again, it, it brings up many fascinating problems that, that one wonders about, and particularly the textual bias of those collections and the comparative impoverishment of the music collection. And also, um, if I may just very briefly uh, thank Peter's, uh, Peter for his uh, fascinating paper on Rakoji. I'm, I'm beginning to finally get to hang up, get, how to pronounce some of these words. But the, the thing that struck me, Peter, is that uh, I'm sorry Bill isn't here because there's such a strong parallel uh, with, with his uh, uh, research yesterday. And particularly, obviously, from my point of view, the Savoy operas and the pirated editions of, um, of the Matilda. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it's, it's, I just wanted to acknowledge that. So I think, I, if I may, I think we should probably um, give some of us a chance to have a cup of coffee because I've been sitting here for the last almost three hours. Yeah. And I just need a small break, if I may. Uh, but could I could I uh, close by uh, asking us all to thank again our seven speakers today and Sarah for stepping in so gallantly for Andrea. And um, we'll see you at 10 past the hour uh, for our final session. Thank you all very much indeed. Yes, thank you too. Uh, I will jump in for, Phil, uh, for Philip Ter because he's out of Vienna and his network connection is, is very bad. So he, we cannot re rely on that. And we will have uh, one, two, three, four, five uh, papers in the second round, uh, which I'm looking forward very much. Thanks. Just take a, take a break, take a cup of coffee and think about the discussion in the, our final uh, meeting, final discussion after the session. Bravo, Vera. Thank you very See much. You. See you soon. Yes. Bye -bye. See you. Ciao. Uh,
Akos, we will start in 10 minutes. Yeah. So we yeah. have moved a bit so that you know. Okay, see you. <laughs> yeah.
ready for starting the last <laughs> yes. session of the conference. That's right. Yeah. Perfect. We're saving the best for last, Nikolai. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> These are the tricks of the organizers to save the best for the end. <laughs> You're so kind, yeah. <laughs> exactly, you know that. <laughs> the worst thing is to be the last. So uh, you have to find something attractive for the last round. I'll try to do my best. <laughs> well, <laughs> the topic is quite exotic, so I, yeah, everything will be just fine. It will, it will, it will. <laughs> well, I hope the majority of our participants whose screens I see are already here, and uh, I'm greeting them for our last today's session. Uh, Philip Ter is excusing himself. Uh, his uh, internet connection was too weak to to uh, take to participate in the in chairing this session so uh, as uh, normal I, I will take it over and uh, I, uh, this is also a meeting uh, with the, the last part uh, dedicated to publishers institutions and cities and uh, our first speaker is Nikolai Georgica a uh, big boss of the musicology <laughs> at the National University of Music in Bucharest. Big boss. Speak about Byzantine chant printings and their musical networks in the Roman principalities, the Balkans, and Constantinople during the first half of the 19th century. Nikolai, <laughs> your turn. Oh. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, dear friends. So first of all, I'd like to thank to the organizers, especially to Viera and to Stanislav for inviting me to attend this wonderful conference. So I, I will move a little bit of discussion to the Balkans and Eastern Europe. Romanian Principality in Constantinople, of course, a little bit exotic topic and place, but also in relation to Central and uh, Western mm. Europe. So I'm, uh, I'm trying uh, right now to share my, uh, my screen here. Yeah, everything is okay. Yeah, I already enlarge the, the screen. Everything is okay? Good, thank you. So, at the beginning of the 19th century, the two Romanian principalities, Valachia, also known as Ungrovlachia and Moldavia, stood between two worlds, between two cultural and civilization paradigms. First of all, they were canonically linked to the Patriarchate of Constantinople and implicitly to the Eastern Orthodox tradition through their religious belongings to the Byzantine church. Politically, however, the two principalities had been under the administration of the Ottoman Empire since the mid 15th century and from the 18th century onwards were ruled by fanatic princes of the Orthodox confession appointed by Sultan himself and the Supreme Court. Secondly, during this period, there was a desire on the part of local elites to abandon oriental practices and customs, a phenomenon that was to occur gradually, irrevocably, and at all levels, cultural, social, artistic, starting with the arrival of the Austrian army in the Romanian principalities in 1787-89, and which was intensified after the Russian occupation in 1806-1812. At the same time, the establishment of Western embassies in Bucharest and Yash meant that along with Greek and Turkish, French became the language of the elites and the music and forms of European civilization spread and rapidly penetrated the upper strata of local society. This rapprochement with the values of Western Europe would intensify particularly after the Balkan Revolution in 1821, leading among other things to the end of the Fanariot reigns and a few years later in 1821 to the principalities independence from the Ottoman administration. After this moment, yeah, 
the children of the local elite called boyars, boyar in Romanian, will have the opportunity to study in Western universities, which was not possible before. Young people from Moldavia and Valachia could study either at the Royal Academies in the principalities, or in the best case in Constantinople, to the case of Prince and, uh, of prince and scholar Dimitri Kantemir is well known. As a result, the young people who had returned from their studies in Western Europe, obviously influenced by the Enlightenment moment and the ideas and ideals of the French Revolution, developed plans and agendas for national um, progress with objectives that included education and publications in Romanian, translations and printing of all kinds everything would be Romanian and national according to the well-known uh, ideology of the time. It goes without saying that music, whether religious or Western influenced, will, be, will also be the identity divider between the various communities of these principalities, especially uh, in Transylvania, and at the same time, an essential component of a possible strategy of national affirmation. Part of, part of this music is also religious music. In what follows, I will examine the mechanism by which Byzantine monodic chant collections I financed, printed and distributed, intensifying, identifying sorry, individuals, group of people or institutions that govern and manage these musical productions, as well as the target groups to which they are addressed. The case study focuses in particular on the Romanian principalities, Valachia and Moldavia, in relation to Constantinople in the first half of the 19th century. In 1814, the Patriarchate of Constantinople accredited a reform in musical semiography, a reform known among other things as the new notation or Chrysantine notation after the name of its theorist metropolitan Chrysantos of Maditos. The new system of musical notation will be taught initially in the patriarchal school and later in some orthodox centers on the outskirts of Constantinople, in particular in Bucharest and Yash, the capitals of the two Romanian principalities. For this purpose, the Ecumenical Patriarchate sent Petros Manuel the Ephesian or Ephesios, one of the graduates of this school to Bucharest in 1816 to teach those those interested in the new method of writing Byzantine music. Ephesios promising that the musical system could be learned in just six months. The success of Byzantine musical notation, both in Constantinople and in the Romanian principalities, led the ecumenical patriarch Gregory, Gregory V to request in July 1819 financial support from Dionysia Lupu, Metropolitan of Ungrovlachia, for the printing of the transcriptions made by the so-called three teachers of Constantinople, the aforementioned Metropolitan Chrysantos of Maditos, Gregorios Protopsaltis, and Hormuzios Hartophilakos, or the Archivist. Consequently, within a year of the Patriarch's letter, the first two collections of Byzantine music in the world Neon Anastasimatarion, the new Anastasimatarion, and Sindomon Dorsastarion were printed in 1820 under the editorship of the same Petros Ephesios and with financial support of the metropolis of Valachia and the local aristocracy. Both anthologies were composed by the central figure of the 18th century Constantinople, Petros Peloponnesios. The moment has a double significance. On the one hand, it concludes the long period of copying Byzantine musical manuscripts that began at the turn of the first to Christian millennia. On the other hand, the action constitutes the decisive step in the construction and development of a network for the widespread distribution and promotion of the monodic repertoire of the Orthodox Church of Byzantine Rite throughout the, the, the Orthodox world. Published in Greek, the two ecclesiastical anthologies were quickly followed by the printing of a wide range of sonorous literature that was new Byzantine notation, that the, sorry, that, that the new Byzantine notation could record. Grammars and musical treatises of the new notation, 
collection of monody religious chants in Greek, Romania, and Slavonic, but also non-ecclesiastical Fanariot, Ottoman, and urban Romanian, sometimes even in Italian and French. The printing network will extend from Bucharest to Paris, Vienna, and Constantinople, but also to other Italian Greek speaking centers, especially Venice and Trieste. As mentioned uh, above, only two years after the so-called new notation became official, in 1816, Petros Ephesios was sent by the Ecumenical Patriarchate to Bucharest to teach Byzantine musical semiography according to the new rules accredited by the Third Patriarchal School, an educational institution that functioned between 1815 and 1821 in the former capital of the Byzantine Empire. According to the documents of the time, the clerical and lay elites in Bucharest encouraged Petrus Ephesius and provided him with full financial support for the establishment of the school for teaching the new notation in the capital of Valachia, a school which many Romanians and Greek Saltes and probably many other Balkan church singers would graduate from. The entrepreneurial spirit is not lacking in the Constantinopolitan musician, so Ephesius intuits the market for the distribution of this type of ecclesiastical musical literature and the potential buyers that could originate not from not only from the Romanian territories and Constantinople, but also from the Balkans, from the monasteries of Mount Athos, the Oriental Orthodox centers such as Sinai, Damascus, Jerusalem, Antioch, and even Greek communities in the cities of Central and Western Europe, Venice, Vienna, Paris, Padua. Together with three other fellow compatriots of Greek origins, Ephesius creates Byzantine letters and neums for church music printing, and publishes the first two volumes of Byzantine music in Greek, of course, in 1820. <clears throat> the project itself was a complex one and um, undertaking for the first time and requires substantial financial funds and political and ecclesiastical support at the highest level, which can be clearly observed from the very beginning of the two anthologies. In accordance to the customs of the time and ancient Byzantine practice, patrons, benefactors, and sponsors are given high honors on the first pages of the volumes, and the works are dedicated to them in long prefaces and engomia written in Greek. For example, in the first volume, this new Anastasimatarion, the evlogies are addressed first, to the Prince of Valachia, Alexandru Nicolae Sutsu Voevol, the last Fanariot ruler of the Romanian principalities, and of course, to the Metropolitan of, of Ungrovlachia Dionysia, who supported and approved the establishment of the School of Psaltic Music, and probably also the printing press. The Anastasimatarion also recalls the donor and financial supporter with a dedication with the dedication forward. It is, I quote, most noble and most loving of muses, the Boyar or the Nobel Ban and Vorni Grigori Valan. It seems that the second volume, Syndomon Loxastarion, although published in the same year, 1820 no longer benefits from the financial support of Vornik Balano, nor from his patronage and that of the Metropolitan Church of Valachia, since the boy are no longer features in the anthology, nor does Metropolitan Dionysia. The dedication to the Fanariot Prince remains. And at the end of the anthology, for the first time in this category of sacred musical literature, the names of 96 people who bought 116 bodies of books are recorded. The term is, uh, is somata, and one body must probably representing the collection of the two volumes published in 1820, Neon Anastasimatarion and Doxastarion. The 96 persons who paid for the purchases of the bodies were either members of Byzantine and Fanariot aristocratic families established in the Romanian principalities at different historical moments, or local noblemen, or clergymen, especially of high and middle rank, 
from different parts of Oriental Orthodox centers and beyond. As for the distribution network of the ontologies, at first glance, it seems to include exclusively people from the cities of Bucharest, Thessaloniki, and Melenikos. Uh, um, uh, this is the city of Meleniki in present-day Bulgaria. But their names and origins make it clear that the network is much more extensive linking the Romanian principalities with the Mediterranean archipelagos, the islands of Andros, Lesbos, Hios, Eos, but also the continental area, the monastery of Iviron on Mount Athos and the Peloponnese Peninsula, the towns of Zagori, Varna, Konica, Ohrida, Ohrid, Artam. In fact, the direct beneficiaries will be not only those who will sell and distribute these volumes, Petros and his team, but also the chanters, the psalters of the important churches in all the Greek speaking territories, including the monastic centers of Sinai and Holy Mount Athos, each Orthodox church and chanter wishing to have at their disposal the entire repertoire required for the daily services of the Orthodox church, repertoire accredited by the ecumenical patriarchates. Among the disciples of uh, Petros Ephesios at the school of the metropolis of Bucharest were Makari, the Hieromant, and Anton Pan, the founding musicians of the psalting music in Romania, one a monk and the other a layman. The former Makari was a great expert in Byzantine musical notation systems and Greek language, a translator, music teacher, book printing expert, skilled orator, and the uh, and the one who delivered Dionysia's inaugural speech when he was elected Metropolitan of Valachia. As everywhere else in the Balkans and Eastern Europe, the national spirit was extremely present in the religious area during this period. Despite the fact that Metropolitan Dionysia, as we have seen, responds positively to the request of the Ecumenical Patriarchate to approve and support musical publications in the Greek language, the native Orthodox Church wants sacred chants in Romanian. In the language of the motherland, I quote, according to the documents of the time, this process of translating and adapting uh, the Constantinopolitan repertoires into Romanian is technically called Romanire, Romanianization, a term proposed by Anton Pan. Stimulated probably by Ephesios musical printings in Greek and their success throughout the Greek speaking world, Makari the Hero Monk started a similar process for the printing of the Romanian language repertoire, obviously with the involvement and support of Metropolitan Dionysia and under the patronage of the new Prince of Valachia, Grigoria Dimitri Gica. Thus, in 1820, together with two Greek collaborators, Makari signed a contract with terms drawn up in Greek and supervised by the Metropolitan himself. For unknown reasons, Makari cannot print the books in Bucharest and has to go to Buda to find a printing house that can produce Byzantine news and Romanian letters. He is accompanied by Stan Popovich, the representative of the Haji Pop House of Train from Sibiu in Transylvania, which will financially support the printing of the first three volumes of Byzantine music in Romanian. A musical treatise, of course, and two collections of monodic chant, the Anastasimatar in Romanian and Irmologion Katavasier. The revolution of 1821 finds Monk Makari in the city of Buda. The metropolitan Dionysia flees from Bucharest to Sibiu to escape the Ottoman troops. The same metropolitan orders Makari to suspend printing until the end of the revolution. With time at his disposal, Makari offered his services and printing expertise to other religious communities attempting to print monodic literature in Slavonic, naturally using Southern neumes. Um, yeah, to this end, he asked for the blessing and support of the Metropolitan of Karlovitz, Stefan Stratimirovich of Kulpin. Moreover, Makari offers to teach 
the clergyman and chanters of Carlo with the notation and church songs I code completely within four months. Unable to produce the Byzantine news in Buddha, Makarie went to Vienna, where with the help of Armenian Mekitaris Monastery of Vienna and their printers, he succeeded in publishing the three volumes in 1823, each title appearing in 3,000 copies, a very large number for those times. times. The three titles forming a body, Somata in Greek and Trupur in Romanian, as in the Greek language publications of Ephesius. The volume also have high aesthetic qualities as well as available content, knowing that this will facilitate their commercialization. Thus, Makari and the Haji Pop House in Sibiu invested substantially in financial terms, the words being printed in color, in color black and red, I, as you can see, and dedicated to the metropolitans of Wallachia and Moldavia, and it seems also to the metropolitan of Bassarabia. During his lifetime, Makari printed two more volumes in 1827 and 1836, in the very year of his death, both in towns of uh, Wallachia. And um, now some conclusions, this is Anton Pan. Petros Ephesios, Makaria the hero monk, and Anton Pan were contemporaries, learn from each other and remain in the history of um, Romanian music of the first half of the 19th century as personalities of great prestige, founders of school teachers, chanters, and publishers specializing in the publication of books of Byzantine music in Greek, Romanian, and Slavonic. In this context, the appearance of the Byzantine music press in Bucharest in 1820 was a turning point in the promotion and uniform compact and widespread dissemination throughout the Orthodox world of the monodic musical repertoire of the Byzantine church. In the years and decades that followed, new printing houses with Byzantine neums would appear in Paris, Vienna, Constantinople, Trieste, Smyrna, Thessaloniki, Venice. Their musical production, including um, a very significant corpus of non-religious albums, amounting in the period 1820-1899 to uh, 319 different titles printed with Byzantine semiography, an important segment of these religious wars also becoming didactic instruments. It should not be forgotten that there were initiatives to print Orthodox monodic religious music also with other musical semiographies, actions which, however, would not undermine the authority and the efficiency of the system of notation assumed and promoted by the ecumenical patriarchate. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Nikolai, for this hi highly interesting paper because it's really a rare paper, paper uh, consecrated to uh, sacral music and for religious fear, and which is of course, due to the 19th century issues, of course, not in the first row, but uh, for us, belonging mostly to the Western church, uh, is uh, this sphere very, very unknown and exotic. And, but sure. Uh, I'm sure that will be a part of our discussion at the end, because I would like first to have some discussion on this, uh, uh, this session and then uh, the general one. Thank you so much again. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, now I'm inviting our uh, next speaker. This is Haiganush Preda Shimek. Haiganush, are you here? Mm. Yes. Uh, hello. Good morning. Hello. <laughs> hello. <laughs> Just a moment. I have to arrange my. Um... Yes, my technical devices. Yes, just, just do it. Just do it quietly, calmly, and uh, divide your screen. Uh, Haiganus Preda Shimek originates from Romania, but she lives in Vienna, and she's an independent musicological researcher. And she will uh, speak about uh, a topic uh, connected with her recent project, isn't it, uh, Haiganus? You have a new yes, project. With, uh... 
my yes. recent project. First of yes. all, uh, thank you for accepting my paper yes, at this conference. Yes, yes. regional related music in the Müller's publishing house. Uh, HF, I, I don't know what it stands for. I should read it. <laughs> yeah, well, you will tell us. Okay. okay, so we will elucidate this. <laughs> Perfect. Um, I just wanted to, to thank you for, for organizing this wonderful meeting, bringing us together. And uh, I will uh, start with my presentation. Uh, just give me one moment to share the screen with uh, you. Wonderful. I hope you can hear me. So uh, my paper considers region-related music in the inventory of Heinrich Friedrich Müller's publishing house. Um, Müller edited the first comprehensive collection of folk music in Western notation from Romania's southern region, Valachia. The collection consists of four notebooks issued between 1846 and around 1858. Excuse me, uh, Haganus, but we don't see your presentation. Oh, I see. Okay, so then I will uh, restart. You have to, to share screen. Okay. And then open it. Uh huh. Okay. Uh, can you can you see it no. now? No. No. Uh huh. Okay. Then I will try again. Yes, please. Sorry for okay. this. Um, hmm. You have to, to uh, close uh, and stop sharing first. And then uh, you have to have your open presentation and then share screen. And then I see. click to it. OK, so um, hmm. let me try again. What was the share? Well, would you mind if I restart reading my paper? Um, a no, it's okay. But if you have okay. problems, you can send it to me and I, I can uh, oh, uh, upload it. Oh, I think it. it's manageable. I only have to find it again in my, okay. in my yes. laptop. It's okay. Just take your time. Okay. Okay, so now um, I am actually uh, I'm seeing my screen and I'm trying to no, share. No, but it. you yes, you have to, uh, down to 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 uh, click on share screen. Yes, I have and done this. So actually, aha, uh -huh. okay. And then but, yes, this is yes, whoa. exactly. <laughs> That's it. Just That's it. <laughs> make just make the full screen now. Uh, yeah, yeah. Give me one second. Of course. Okay. Good. Yes, that's perfect. <laughs> now start again. <laughs> well, um, let's try again. So um, skipping uh, the introduction, I think it's clear now. It's about uh, the inventory of Heinrich Friedrich Müller, um, a publisher established in Vienna and the first editor of uh, the first comprehensive collection of folk music in Western notation from Wallachia. So, um, this uh, collection was issued between 1846 and around 1858 in four notebooks. The first one, uh, Romania, the second, Bouquet de Melodie Valac Original, Le Co de la Valachie, uh, and Le Bord du Danube. Its author was Johann Andreas Bachmann, a musician who settled in Bucharest in early 1830s as conductor of an itinerant theater company from Vienna's theater in the Josefstadt. Uh, 
He worked as a theater kapellmeister and piano teacher in the Lakian Boyer houses, where he listened to vernacular songs, mostly performed by uh, local fiddlers. Soon upon his arrival to Bucharest, he probably started to transcribe melodies and to arrange them for piano. <laughs> what uh, sort of uh, music did Wachmann collect? As mentioned in the preface of his third notebook from 1849, Wachmann claimed to have had chosen authentic Wallachian tunes for his publication. However, the collected melodies were in accordance with the vague folk song concept of his time, very different in style, age, and function. Musicologist Gheorghe Ciobanu differentiated in them melodies from traditional peasant folk music, the urban folklore, romances, patriotic and other songs or dances by known or unknown authors. All this was obviously included in the repertoire of Lothar of Bucharest and its surroundings around 1850. <laughs> Whilst working on a project involving Romanian folklore edited in Vienna around 1850, my aim was to examine Bachmann's collection in the context of Viennese salon music at the time. Müller's musical assortment presented itself as an appropriate field for my research. Thus, I decided to examine it in greater depth. The following questions were considered with regard to Müller's range. First, what was Müller's publishing program? Second, what was the share of region-related music in his assortment? And third, which sort of music bore region-related titles. This paper presents the current results of my investigation on Müller's prints, which still is a work in progress. Some words about uh, Müller's book and music store. Müller moved from Hanover to Vienna in 1805 where he took over two existing art bookstores and editing houses, previously run by Hieronymus Löschenkohl and Lukas Hohenleiter. Until his death in 1848, he ran his own art and bookstore on Kohlmarkt, the elegant street leading to the gate of the Hofburg. According to Biographical Lexicon of Austria's Empire by Konstantin Wurzbach, Müller, the editor, was highly respected around, among Vienna's art merchants. He became co-founder and president of the Vienna Art Association and established his reputation by producing and selling novel articles of printed paper, such as greeting cards, attractively designed dice and board games, and pop-up books. Moreover, he was among the Vienna's first publishers who adopted the technique of chromolithography and successfully used it in printing juvenile books. As reported by his aforementioned biographer, Müller's articles sold well, even at the royal courts in Europe. <laughs> Müller's connection to music. Indications regarding Müller's connection to music date back to his early years in Vienna. Two issues of the Wiener Zeitung from December 1805 and November 1807 advertised variations, waltzes, echoes, and other pieces as his own compositions. Later, Müller became the Viennese commissioner of Ignaz Sauer and Schott's Sons in around 1814 and the 1820s respectively. He started his own music editing line only late in life, some years before he died. <laughs> How data on Müller's assortment have been gathered? The database Hofmeister 19 was used to compile information on Müller's assortment. This resource comprises advertisements of music prints, mostly from the German speaking area, uh, compiled by the Leipzig editor Hofmeister in his monthly reports. 
The database search yielded 429 music titles edited by Müller and successors from September 1843 to September October 1858. I used the titles as the main basis of research, adding four titles and 46 subheads of Müller's prints found in the Austrian National Library music collection. Following questions were asked with regard to the publisher's assortment. <laughs> what sort of music did Müller edit? Among his sales, notes for solo instruments and small vocal or instrumental ensembles prevail. Light and small genres are well represented. Songs, songs without words, character pieces, dances, impromptus, and free forms, such as variations, reminiscences, and so on. Almost all pieces have programmatic titles. Pure instrumental forms like sonatas and trios are rare. <laughs> what composer's name occur in Müller's range? No single work by Haydn, Mozart, or Beethoven was included in Müller's range, but works by Czerny, Berlioz, Johann Strauss the Younger, Franz von Suppe were. Apart from these, Müller mostly edited locally significant composers, so-called minor masters, who during their lifetime made a contribution to, work, to local music life in Vienna and in other towns inside and outside the Habsburg Empire. Choir conductors, music teachers, theater kapellmeister, or performers. <laughs> Which freedom related titles did he issued? I could find 57 different ethnic, regional, and topographic terms in Müller's titles and subtitles between September 1843 and September October 1858. The word titles are ordered alphabetically in their original language and spelling on this slide. In addition to ethnic, regional, and topographic terms, I also considered region-connoted society dances. The dances found are displayed on this slide. To conclude, the search yielded more than um, 190 entries, which is approximately 40% of Miller's music production. Although this percentage can only have a relative value, as not all folklore related or folk inspired pieces reflect their content in their titles, it shows that region connoted music constituted a significant and various segment of Muller's product line. <laughs> what sort of music bore region related titles? A part of this repertoire could be assigned to the early salon music genre that mirrored the contemporaneous interests of the middle class, such as waltzes by Strauss the Younger and the works of semi-classical music. However, a typical, as typical for salon music, regional allocations seem rather ambiguous. In fact, a lax approach towards regional signifiers can be noticed. What sort of music bore reading related titles? Number two, revolutionary songs and marches. Another part of Müller's region related assortment consisted of songs and revolutionary marches that circulated in the political context of the 1848 revolution. Ideological intentions are obvious here. Similarly, Many religion, uh, many regional connoted pieces in Müller's inventory may reflect the struggles of various nationalities inside and outside the Habsburg monarchy at time. <laughs> what do regional titles refer to? First, regional topographic or ethnic titles mainly refer to melodies. I exemplify some of those having become popular through remarkable stage shows. 
No one received as much attention in Muller, Muller's editing line as Friedrich Flotow's area, The Last Rose of Summer, from his romantic comedy, Martha, or the other than Mart to Richmond. Flotow adapted an Irish melody first published by Thomas Moore and John and Andrew Stevenson in 1813. Soon after Friedrich Flotow's work was premiered in Vienna's Kernantor Theater in November 1847, Müller issued its first edition in early 1848. In the 1850s, the castanet dancer Pepita de Oliva successfully performed the Andalusian dan dance El Olé in Vienna's Theater in the Josefstadt. Johann Strauss the Younger honored the dancer with a Pepita Polka, first performed in Café Chappelle in August 1853, whereas Müller published the dance melody as a Ceylon piece with a fitting title vignette. Finally, plantation melodies entered into Müller's inventory in early 1850s. Minstrel shows started to become popular in New York in the 1840s, first performed by blackface minstrels. Here I show a piece composed on a banjo song by a Viennese piano teacher, Die Plantage. As musicologist Derek Biscott wrote, plantation melodies were songs like Oh Susanna or Oh My Old Kentucky Home Goodnight that Stephen Foster published under his own name in 1848 and later. Some of them were of Afro-American provenance. Some uh, written related titles refer to literary sources, for instance, Joseph de Sauer's Songs on Copper Slavic Poems. The title relates to the lyrics by Siegfried Kappa. Kappa was a Jewish doctor who lived in Croatia and collected South Slavic folk poetry. The ethnic source of his lyrics is indicated at the onset of each song, Slovakian, from Bohemia or from Moravia. Other titles of the Sour songs refer to imagined spaces, to poetical, metaphorical, or symbolical interpretations of places. For instance, the Spanish song based on a poem by Clemens Brentano. <laughs> Title pages. In Vienna's competitive editorial industry at time, Müller evidently enlarged his range by selecting for publication region-related music of finest graphic quality. Here I display some title pages. Two represent colored lithographs to illustrate a Basque dance and a Redova. In the middle is the title page of Polka von Wieden, at that time, Wieden was one of Vienna's suburban settlements bordered by the Wien River. It has long since been incorporated into the city. The title vignette shows the river, the bridge above it, and the magnificent Baroque cupola of St. Charles Church at the back. Graphic designs. Miller's publishing company distinguished itself through qualitative graphic designs. This could be attributed to the already mentioned proximity to the art trade, especially to engravers and graphic artists, such as Jakob Alt and August Prinzhofer. Many of Miller's notes were printed by August Grube, who settled in Vienna in 1835. Grube belonged to Müller's professional network and was responsible for the material quality of the printed products. He worked as an apprentice in the company of brothers Tranchensky, who made a name for themselves with creative, sought-after products of polychrome printed paper. After having founded his own press in 1844, this printer specialized in music notes. He executed music prints for Pietro Macchetti or Tobias and Karl Haslinger. Songbooks. 
I shall return now to Wachmann's collection of Wallachian tunes, which was the starting point of my investigation. To provide insight into the cultural context which gave rise to the collection, I searched for similar works in Müller's product line. Here I show a notebook by Johann Schnitzer. The page in the middle advertises Schnitzer's compositions for Zeter, printed by Müller in three distinct collections. Alpine songs, Landler, and travel memories, national melodies in four books. In the last one, the author linked 19 different folk tunes, an Austrian, a German, a Dutch, an Irish, then a polka, a mazurka, and so on. My attention focused on different modalities of treating melodies. In Schnitzer's above mentioned collections, all melodies are arranged in the same manner. They are built symmetrically and accompanied by conventional progressions of chords without any ornamental figurations or virtuoso paraphrases. Strikingly, the same style was used by Bachmann in treating Balakian melodies. Also, the melodic line often maintains the modal chromatic. He used three quarter measure, symmetric phrases, and regular rhythm, as uh, illustrated in example number two on this slide. A song from the Lakia's western region, Oltenia, turned into a dancing, waltz like melody. The third music example displays a Serbian song arranged by Alois Kalaus. As Mariana Kokanovic Markovic wrote in a study on Serbian salon music, the Czech pianist Alois Kalaus settled in Belgrade in 1843, where he systematically collected Serbian folk and urban songs. Müller published 43 of them in two notebooks in 1850 and 1852. Unlike Schnitzer and Wachmann, Kalaus described the melodies with lyrics and had them printed in both Serbian and German. The choral like accompaniment suggests that the songs could be vocally performed. Thus, it can be assumed that Wachmann oriented more towards instrumental arrangements of Central European folk music. By contrast, Kalaus took inspiration from harmonized folk songs for vocal ensembles. Why did Bachmann choose an instrumental setting for his miniature compositions on the Wallachian melodies? Probably due to the musical habits of the Wallachian nobility in the Biedermeier period, where harmonic singing in small groups, for instance, male quartets, was not customary. Back then, Romanian literature, vocal and instrumental music, especially operatic performances were promoted by a part of Wallachia's upper class. In 1833, an association was formed, the Philharmonic Society. Its members were mainly boyers. Some were middle-class activists who were later involved in the 1848 revolution. In March, 1835, the society placed a free public school of singing and instrumental music under Wachmann's care. Wachmann also taught music to families who were members of the Philharmonic Society. He dedicated each notebook of his collection to a female aristocrat. Seen from this perspective, his collection was intended to integrate folk music into the representative image of the Romanian nobility. The first one, Romania, 1846, was dedicated to Maria Bibescu, Princess Consort of Wallachia, between 1845 and 1848. To end with some conclusions, Müller's inventory started to absorb new regional inputs as soon as the market for um, cultural goods opened towards Southeast and the Balkan. Distributed, um, 
distributed in Vienna and other towns by an extensive network of partners, his music assortment responded to the demands of various local audiences. Therefore, its investigation might be of interest, especially for regional music histories. With regard to Romanian music, one can notice the emergence of a new medium, that of salon music with folk themes, by which a broad public became acquainted with a stylized image of uh, Valachia's folkloristic heritage. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Haiganush. Uh, it was a very interesting uh, paper on the importance of, of uh, printing material in general for distributing uh, the, the musical output. And uh, there will be, of course, a lot of questions, but now we will continue and then uh, we will turn to that at the end. Wonderful. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much again. Uh, now I leave. Uh, I, I will leave. Um, not the meeting, but just uh, I will turn off. Uh, yes, you my... just have to to close. I your... will be with you anyway. Thank you. You just close See you later. Your, you right. just close your uh, presentation and stop right. sharing. Okay. Wonderful. Stop sharing. Yes. Thank you. Bye. Bye. See you. So I'm now uh, announcing uh, our next uh, presenter. This is Stephanie Liang, from a student from the University of uh, Graz, uh, University of Music and Perform Performing Arts in Graz. Uh, and she will report about a case study, Leon Cavallo's opera Pagliacci, I Pagliacci, the correspondence between the composer Ruggiero Leon Cavallo and the music publisher Edoardo Sonzogno. Stephanie. Here is your turn. Thank you. Okay, I will just share my screen. I hope you can see it. Yes, yes, okay. perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, then greetings from Graz to all of you. I'm really grateful for being part of the conference. And in the next 20 minutes, I would like to talk about the correspondence between the composer Ruggiero Cavallo and the music publisher Eduardo Sonsonio during the time when I Pagliacci was created. So the opera I Pagliacci, which contains veristic elements, is now firmly established in the opera repertoire and is often performed in combination with the opera Cavalleria Rusticana. The composer, Ruggiero Leon Cavallo, had difficulties in achieving a breakthrough with his early compositions. It may come as a surprise that, that his other works, which he composed after his successful opera, were not given as much attention as we might assume. According to Conrad Dryden, also the scientific community did not pay so much attention to the composer and librettist as a person for a long time after his death. Ruggiero Leon Cavallo makes a difficult case for any biographer. Although Pagliacci ranks as one of the world's most frequently performed works, relatively little is known about its creator. So since then, it was 2007, a lot has changed. For example, through the Fondo Ruggiero Leon Cavallo. Ruggiero Leon Cavallo was born on the 23rd of April in 1857 in Naples. He began composing during his studies in Bologna while attending literary lectures. The work Chatterton, his first opera, was composed during this period. Leon Cavallo had to endure numerous failed efforts to obtain financial pledges and performances. The fame and glory which he had hoped for didn't seem to be reach able, so he traveled to Cairo and stayed there. But after some time, he had to fled from Egypt to Paris because of revolts and with hardly any money in his pocket. So at that time, he only owned about um, a few hundred francs. In France, Leon Cavallo got a job from an agent as a piano accompanist for singers in coffee houses. 
Even if this did not satisfy his artistic standards, he realized that this protects him from starvation. So when his financial situation got stable again, he wanted to accompany opera singers on the piano and his reputation as an excellent accompanist soon spread among the Parisian music society. During this time, he also met the baritone Victor Morel. The Triple Alliance, an agreement between Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Italy, was formed on the 20th of May in 1882. Just a short historical background, Italy was looking for support against France, and the agreement provided that Germany and Austria, Hungary would help Italy if it was attacked by France. So we can imagine that tensions occurred between France and Italy. For this reason, Leon Cavallo was then informed that it would not be possible to present a work by an Italian in the public in France in the next season. Without having achieved the desired international success, Leon Cavallo returned to Italy in order to get the chance to become a successful composer in his home country. So how did it happen that the opera I Pagliacci had such a successful performance history and still has it today? And why especially this opera helped him to get his long-awaited breakthrough? In my opinion, there are two reasons. So on the one hand, Leon Cavallo did not ignore the musical trends of, this, of his time that were successful and incorporated them in his opera. And on the other hand, he simply met the right person at the right time, namely Eduardo Sonsonio. Sabine Brettenthaler said that some elements which somebody would immediately associate with a realistic opera are a current setting, a place that actually existed, so not a fairy tale set in the Middle Ages, protagonists from lower social classes, a repeatedly presented content, which means it's not full of long areas, an adultery that is not only indicated but actually carried out, and violence. So all these aspects lead to a radical turning point in the opera tradition and the opera realism started. At this point, I would like to refer to another opera, which not only achieved great success, and contained the mentioned veristic elements, but also served as a source for inspiration for the composer Leon Cavallo and his opera, the opera Cavalleria Rusticana by Pietro Mascagni. This was the work which helped the verism to mark its, to make its breakthrough, not only as a literature trend, but also as a musical trend. How did Ruggiero Leon Cavallo know came in contact with this opera Cavalleria Rusticana? So for a long time, it was assumed that in 1890, although some sources show different dates, an opera competition took place in which Leon Cavallo apparently took part and through which he should have finally gained his fame. However, scientific research showed that the composer could not have seen the announcement for the competition and that it was only for one act operas. And I Pagliacci is an opera in two acts. Nevertheless, indirectly, this competition was important for the composer of I Pagliacci. The jury of the Sonsonia competition a competition organized by the music publisher Eduardo Sonsonio chose the opera Cavalleria Rusticana as the winning opera. And shortly afterwards, the premiere took place, which was crowned with success. Leon Cavallo, who attended one of the following performances of the opera, was inspired. And because of that, he also wanted to create something similar. The prehistory of his opera I Pagliacci take place in the small town of Montalto in Calabria, the same place where the composer himself grew up. In 1865, when Ruggiero Leon Cavallo was only eight years old, a tragic murder occurred. 
a man was murdered by two brothers. It was interesting that the night before the murder, it was the 5th of March uh, in 1865, a guest performance of a traveling comedian group took place in his town. The composer integrated some of these details in his opera and libretto. In only three weeks, he completed the libretto. The title was at first Il Pagliaccio and later then um, changed to I Pagliacci. He was, as I just uh, mentioned before, inspired by his childhood experience, the murder and the play by Catul Mondes and Paul Ferrier, La Femme de Tabarin. Because he was not only a composer, but also a librettist, he was able to mix his own perfect veristic opera. It also contains uh, a real existing scene, people from a low milieu, the comedian group Forbidden Love and a tragic ending. After finishing the libretto, Leon Cavallo wanted to attract someone's attention and presented his libretto to Giulio Ricordi, a famous publisher and impresario. When Leon Cavallo returned to Italy, he had been warmly welcomed by Ricordi and for this reason he hoped again for support. The mediator between the two of them was Victor Morel. The publisher had already, had already seen other works by Leon Cavallo, had shown interest, but had not yet proposed and promised to bring his work on stage. There was a similar reaction when Leon Cavallo went to the publisher to present his libretto I Pagliacci. The play is nice, but there is too much mixing of tragedy and comedy. So the publisher did not undertake any obligation to bring the work on stage. And Leon Cavallo's reaction was then as follows. I originally came here when I was unknown to you and did neither more nor less than what I did now. Read a libretto on the basis of which you secured the future in Medici. Now, you suggest that I compose music without even receiving a stipend. If I am forced to look elsewhere for an income on which to exist that takes away from time devoted to composition, it is necessary that I reclaim my freedom. So Leon Cavallo cut all his connections with Ricordi and decided to follow in the footsteps of Pietro Mascagni. He hurried to Ricordi's biggest competitor, Eduardo Sonsonio, who had already brought Cavalleria Rusticana on stage. When Eduardo Sonsonio received the libretto from Leon Cavallo, he was enthusiastic and offered the composer a contract. At that time, Leon Cavallo had not yet composed the music for the opera. We have to keep that in mind. The contract from Sonsonio included 2,400 Italian lira spread over one year and 30% of the income of his opera for the next 20 years. At that time, Sonsonio already had the idea that Pagliacci and Cavalleria Rusticana would fit together, and Sonsonio had the goal to bring Leon Cavallo's opera on the stage. We don't know a lot about the development and composing progress of the music for the opera, only that the music was composed within two months, but the orchestration was not finished at that time. The Teatro del Verme in Milano was chosen as the location for the world premiere. Leon Cavallo was involved in the process of selecting the singers. Now I will show you some letters of the correspondence between Leon Cavallo and Eduardo Sonsonio, so that you can see the network and the relationship between them. So in a letter from the publisher to the composer and librettist, it was April 1892, Sonsonio did, think, did not think that it would be possible to bring Pagliacci on the stage before autumn. In order to be able to print the score very quickly, the impresario asked Leon Cavallo to correct his musical score. On the 12th of May in 1892, so nine days before the premiere, Leon Cavallo wrote to Sonsonio that the first piano rehearsal of I Pagliacci with the singers 
had taken place the day before. The artists had prepared the part well and the choir singers worked hard. The other preparations were also going well and the premiere of the opera could take place between the 20th and the 22nd of May. Sonsonio, who was in Paris, informed Leon Cavallo that he could not attend the premiere for health reasons and also hoped that he could organize another performance of I Pagliacci in Vienna. The premiere took place on the 21st of May in 1892. Some sources also mentioned the 22nd of May. The conductor was the 25-year-old Arturo Toscanini. There were some troubles at the premiere, namely the donkey, uh, which pulled the car of the comedian group into the marketplace, slipped and slid up to the ramp so that it almost fell into the orchestra pit. But the success of the opera did not fail because of this, luckily. There would have also been repetitions of certain vocal parts, such as the prologue of Ornetta's bird song. And according to reports, there were also 15 curtains at the end, so the applause was quite long. Sonsonio also heard about the success, so he sent a telegram from Paris to the composer in which he congratulated him on his great success with I Pagliacci. On the 26th of May, Sonsonio wrote to Ruggiero Leon Cavallo that Pagliacci should be performed in Vienna, but on the condition that the work should not last longer than Cavalleria Rusticana and that cuts were necessary. All in all, it was still 25 minutes too long. A few days later, in another letter, Sansonio informed the composer that the opera will be performed in the context of the Italian theater season and at the Ausstellungstheater in Vienna. In further correspondences, Sansonio presented Leon Cavallo a selection of the singing ensemble and the choirs. So choirs from a tour company would be part of the performance. At this point, it becomes clear how many organizational tasks have to be carried out by the sponsor and impresario so that the opera production system network, which took place in the background, could guarantee a functioning opera performance. A letter from the 19th of June in 1892 provided insights into emerging opinion differences between the impresario and the composer. Leon Cavallo had proposed the baritone Fumagalli, but Sansonio had already written to Beltrami, so a different singer. However, luckily the performance in Vienna, which took place in the same year, was also crowned with success. You can see on this poster that both German and oh, Italian... I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> Okay, um, you can see on this poster that both German and Italian language were represented. The actors were described in Italian. In the Vienna newspaper called Wiener Abendpost, following sentence was written. Nur ein wirkliches Talent wie Leon Cavallo konnte dieses realistisch wirksame Textbuch schreiben, which means only a real talent like Leon Cavallo could write this effective libretto, so the reviews were quite positive. There were then further problems between the impresario and the composer, about which you can read in a letter from the 10th of October in 1892. The composer disturbed Sansonio's plans and choices of singers. In another letter, at the end of October, Sansonio struggled to find good female choir singers while Leon Cavallo was in Turin to follow the rehearsals for the performance of I Pagliacci. In November 1892, Leon Cavallo was in Berlin where Pagliacci should take place on the 6th of December. And in my opinion, this makes it clear that the international breakthrough and the long-awaited success finally came for Leon Cavallo. 
Milan, the 1st of January, 1893. A letter from Sansonio to Leon Cavallo gives us information that a, th that a true catastrophe uh, occurred in Vercelli. Um, one has to be very careful in the selection of artists to av avoid further failures, Sansonio wrote to Leon Cavallo. In June, Sansonio claimed that he became the owner of the copyright of Pagliacci. From some other letters, Sansonio got the information that Leon Cavallo had said that the publisher had neglected him to take care of Mascagni. So inconsistencies are expressed here once again. Milan, Julie, 16, 1894. A letter from Eduardo Sansonio to Leon Cavallo. Catul Mondes tried to disturb the performances of Pagliacci in Paris because he thought Leon Cavallo had copied his idea, but Sansonio said he will still manage to perform the opera in Paris. So in summary, Ruggiero Leon Cavallo was very lucky to meet Eduardo Sansonio. Of course, there could be some differences or problems, but the constant efforts to bring the opera to the international stage to find good singers, all these tasks which the impresario Eduardo Sonsonio did, who also ran a music publishing company at the same time, helped Leon Cavallo immensely. So without the support and network of the band director Eduardo Sonsonio, it would not have been able or possible that Leon Cavallo finally succeeded in gaining the recognition he had hoped for and to gain a financial security with his veristic opera I Pagliacci. And thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Stephanie, uh, for reminding us on this information on Leon Cavallo and Pagliacci and uh, how important mm. the personal notes as letters, diaries and uh, memoirs are in revealing the context of a, a presentation of a musical piece. We will now proceed to our next uh, report. It's uh, Lili Bekeshi who will uh, say uh, something about the Erzsébet Elmeni piano album and the network behind. Uh, Lily is a, a PhD student at the Research Center for the Humanities Institute of Musicology of the Budapest. Uh, is it attached to the Budapest Academy of Sciences still, or is, is it an independent institute, Lily? Hmm. We don't hear. Uh, we don't hear you, Lily. You must unmute. Sorry, it is a dependent <laughs> institution still, but uh, not uh, not exactly to the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, but uh, it has connection with it. So yes, I know there were some transformations and uh, reorganizations a, a yes. year or two ago. Okay, thank you. Uh, do you see my presentation? Yes, yes, everything. And hear fine. me. Yes, we hear you perfect. <laughs> Okay, thank you. So uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for organizing this uh, wonderful conference again. And thank you for your amazing papers. And I'm very excited to be here. So my project is entitled Erzsébet Emlény, Piano Album and the Network Behind. So I start with a quote. Um, I start with a quote. Uh, Hungarian music of the 19th century has a precious relic, which is only 43 years old, but even if innumerable centuries pass over it, it remains an exhaustible treasure because it is related to Hungary's much-loved queen, Elizabeth. It is entitled Erzsébet Emlény, or Elizabeth's album, and was released in 18. 57 on the occasion when Franz Joseph I, then only the Emperor of Austria, embarked on a nationwide tour with his heartfelt wife of conquering beauty to prepare a more blessed future. At that time, the difference between all social strata disappeared so that the nation would receive and celebrate the rulers with anonymous sincere enthusiasm. Unexpected family mourning interrupted the triumphant journey in Debrecen, but after that, the day of the resurrection rose higher and higher because from then on, Elizabeth's heart did not stop beating more and more warmly for the Hungarian nation. 
The former longer and somewhat sentimental and nation oriented quote from Cornel Abrani's monograph, The Hungarian Music in the 19th Century, was published in 1900. Abrani devotes a separate subchapter to Erzsébet Emlin piano album in his voluminous recollection on the basis of which the publication seems to have played an important role. He, as a composer, music writer, music critic, and teacher, actually had a great influence in musical life regarding his personal network. However, his recollection highlights several phenomena. After the revolutions, there was still a tense atmosphere in Hungary. Franz Joseph's previous imperial journey to Hungary in 1852 did not resolve the tension. Abrani, who has a nation oriented view, remarked that all strata of Hungarian society welcomed and celebrated the rulers with anonymous, sincere enthusiasm. And Elizabeth visited Hungary for the first time. So this year can be considered as the beginning of the cult of Elizabeth in Hungary. The recent years' researches has gained new impetus in both Habsburg studies and the mapping of 19th century musical life. Several volumes deal with the national and imperial perspectives too. For example, historian Daniel L. Yunovsky has important publications on this topic. Yunovsky highlighted the ongoing tension between national and supranational identities in his book entitled The Pomp and Politics of Patriotism. Already in the preface to his volume, he covers the official celebrations in honor of the ruler throughout the empire, of which musical representation was also an important part in connection with which he made a number of fundamental observations, as Franz Joseph was presented on these occasions as a father figure for all nations. For the Hungarian reception of the ceremonies in honor of the ruler, Yunovsky added the following idea. Imperial celebrations in Cisleitania presented Franz Joseph as father of all his peoples, including those of Hungary, and as the supranational symbol binding together the monarchy as a whole. However, the Hungarian noble elites viewed celebrations of Franz Joseph as emperor as holidays in a neighboring country. Hungary officially recognized only anniversaries of Franz Joseph's crowning as Hungarian king, end of quote. It is worth highlighting Yunovsky's comment in parentheses, including those of Hungary, since this detail illustrates well the negative assessment of the conditions in, uh, of the 1850s. Until the recent two decades, this former narrative characterized the Hungarian language historiography too. The evaluation of the 1850s paints a dark picture of that period. Historian Gabor Gianni, who has publications regarding the theory of historiography and also the life of everydays in the turn of the 19th and the 20th centuries, observed two different narratives, an imperial and a national reading, and he suggested the usage of both perspectives. All this is necessary to be emphasized because neither narrative can be ignored when evaluating 1857 imperial visit in Hungary. To get a clearer picture, I analyzed the trip from the perspective of a microhistorical uh, micro approach. The musical representation of the imperial couple's visit to Hungary was greatly facilitated by the basic research of two historians, Petra Prominter and Orsoya Mahertz. Based on their work, I reconstructed the actors and musical manifestations of the representative events on the basis of archive sources and the Hungarian and German language press published in Pesbuda. The archive material kept in the Hungarian National Archives does not abound in references to music history, but it does show that the official reports on the visit published in the press correlate with the data in the archive material. They are correlated as the reports were personally checked by Archduke Albrecht, the main organizer of the trip, so the accounts can also be interpreted as an official announcement. 
The visit to Hungary was divided into three stages and was began on May the 4th, 1857. The imperial couple arrived by ship from Vienna to Pesbuda in a solemn setting, and then, due to the illness of their children, they continued the tour only on May the 23rd via Yasberin. With the deteriorating condition of Archduchess Sophia and the sudden and, sudden and tragic death of the princess, the visit was interrupted for almost two months. Later, the morning Elizabeth no longer accompanied her husband. So in August 1857, Franz Joseph continued the other two stages of the tour without Elizabeth, during which he visited the settlements of Fabidik, today Slovakia, and a part of Western Hungary. The program proposals and drafts of the visit could be submitted by various uh, institutions and the committees of the settlements and the country committees of the, uh, to the Lieutenancy and to Archduke Albrecht, who wanted to organize the tour with the help of the Hungarian nobles. In the organization, Baron Antal August, a close friend of Franz Liszt and Count Moritz Almasi, took an important part. The first week of the visit, Pest Buddha was extremely. Uh, uh, the first week of the visit in Pest Buddha was extremely intense. The imperial couple spent two weeks in Pest Buddha, attracting extraordinary crowds from all over the country. The newspapers advertised rooms for the visit and sold tickets to the grandstands set up on the occasion of the ceremonial arrival. Like in rural towns, visits and feasts per, uh, accompanied by military events took place frequently in the capital. In honor of the imperial couple, the local Dolarda leader Tafel uh, and the capital's bourgeoisie organized a torchlight parade together with several military bands. And on the evening of May the 8th, the city's grandiose decorative lightning was accompanied by fireworks from renowned Austrian pyrotechnician Stuwe. The role of the capital clearly reflects the central importance of Pest Buddha. In the case of the visit, the activity of the music associations, the National Theatre of Pest, the German Theatre of Pest, the National Conservatory or Nemzeti Zenede, the Rouge Stasha Music Publishing House, and Pest Buddha Idolada or uh, Leader Tafel should be emphasized. These institutions were significant also on a national level, and they presented and published the compositions for the visit. Regarding the musical works, the development of the cult of Empress Elizabeth in Hungary is striking. In addition to Erzsébet Emlén piano album, choral works and an opera were also made for the Empress. The creators of the album intended to present that to Empress Elizabeth during the tour. Due to the lack of reliable sources, the exact time and date of delivery is still unclear, though. An obvious possibility is that the piano album was handed over to the imperial couple by an art delegation with two nominated members, Count Manu Andrashi and Baron Gabor Prunai, together with an art album also being made in Pest. Uh, in addition to the piano album, uh, another album of fine arts and literature and a volume of poems was made too. All of them recommended to Empress Elizabeth. The Erzsébet Emlé may have been created on the basis of a joint idea by the music publisher Cornel Abrányi and Gyula Rúzsavölgyi. Its predecessor was certainly the Elizabeth Fest album created in 1854, by the music publisher Haslinger on the occasion of the wedding of Franz Joseph I and Elisabeth Wittesbach. The representative album was composed by eight pianists from the Central European region. We know little about its history of origin, therefore the certain pieces composition history should be asked. From the list of the art authors uh, mentioned here, this time I will highlight Wilhelm Kuhl, a Prague-born pianist composer whose relics uh, were published under the title My Musical Recollections. His memoirs show that Kuhl was in contact with Prince Clemens von Metternich 
in the 1840s who held a basic managerial position in the empire and who emigrated to England after the revolutions. Kue played in his salon several times. In Kue's memories, however, we find no reference to his contribution to the Elizabeth Fest album, nor to his collaboration with Haslinger. An explanation for this can be found perhaps in his sympathy for Prince Metternich and in his latter commentary uh, on Franz Joseph, which was added to the memory of coronation of Ferdinand I or Ferdinand V. I quote, not many months later, the Emperor Francis died and was succeeded by his son Ferdinand, crowned, as I well remember, King of Bohemia in our city. Great was the excitement in Prague during that eventful fortnight of festivity. People flocked into the town from every part of Bohemia and were glad to secure lodgings at any price. Altogether, it was a time full of memories yet undimmed. I may add that it was the last occasion on which a coronation took place in Prague, for the present emperor, Francis Joseph of Austria, was never crowned king of Bohemia." End of quote. Making a parallel between Kues and Abrani's recollections, highlighting the gesture of coronation, a quite negative picture can be observed regarding the figure of the emperor. However, the wording of this has never been clearly articulated, rather suggestive. However, to some extent, these artistic movements can be interpretive in a narrative of dual loyalty. On the one hand, respect for the institution of the ruler, and on the other, a national loyalty, emphasizing the info importance of national culture and some independence. This was also the case with the Erzsébet Emlyn piano album. The proceeds of the publication were donated to charity, which can also be interpreted as an act of patriotic custom. The supported organization was the Women's Association, patronized by the Hungarian governor of the empire, Arjuk Albrecht's wife, Princess Hildegard of Bavaria, and through it, the nursery of Perzbuda. The Women's Association of Perzbuda uh, were at the forefront of tackling issue of poverty and the two associations of Pest and Buddha separately were patronized by the member of uh, the Habsburg family from the very beginning. The association was promoted by the second wife of Paletin Joseph, the 20 year old Archduchess Hermina. The members of the association were mainly the more affluent and influential ladies of the local society who took part in the operation of the association either as working or as supportive members. The members of the Habsburg family made thousands of foreigns per year for the organization and the local nobility and wealthy citizens followed their, uh, their example as much as possible. Countess Julia Forai Brunswick headed the Women's Association of Buddha. The list of honorary members included the names of several Hungarian aristocratic families, Andrási, Batyányi, Brunswick, Esterházy, Festeti, Csnáko, Orci, Pálfi, Zicsi, etc., and as well as uh, the wife of Count István Széchenyi, Kressons, and also the princess of Saxon Coburgotta was on the list. The fact that the proceeds of the album were offered to the Women's Association sponsored by Hildegard and through them to the kindergarten also points to the fact that in the 1850s we can observe a kind of female patron cult. The figure of Archduchess Hildegard, like Elizabeth, was positively described by Abrani. I quote, uh, it can be said that she was a forerunner and preparer of the later guardian angel and good spirit of the Hungarian nation, Empress Elizabeth, the Queen of Hungary. It is striking that these words of praise were frequently used against the emperor, the figure of the emperor, and the figure of Archduke Albrecht. In this connection, we can add an idea of historian Andrzej Geru that uh, 19th century Hungary needed a character or a figure from the ruling uh, Habsburg family to whom they could turn with acceptance. This was the case, for example, with the former Palatine Joseph. Therefore, this political psychological role was taken over by the female members of the monarchy.
This approach features the texts of Cornel Abrani. Abrani had a significant influence on the musical public opinion of this time. If we approach Abrani's history of impact with the help of the network theory, we must emphasize the importance of informal networks. Research in recent years has shown how unavoidable his over is. In addition to a significant amount of his published volumes, he was the editor of the first Hungarian language newspaper, Zenészeti Lapok. The assessment of the history of musical life in Hungary in the, eight, uh, in the 19th century was thus fundamentally influenced by his culture, uh, his intellectual heritage. I made an attempt to explore the network of contacts uh, in Hungarian musical life based on a source group called Musical Letters, Font 12, uh, and other letters held in National Széchenyi Library. In the figure, notes represent each person, while links represent a letter. Based on the nearly thousand, le thousand letters, it can be seen that Cornel Abrányi had an extensive network of contacts. Uh, he had correspondence with at least 200 individuals. With the help of the visualization, we can easily point out his significance. To sum up, uh, the assessment of the visit in Hungary in 1857 uh, um, promised relief and was controversial from the beginning. From a, narr uh, from a national narrative, the political affiliation and active participation of musicians is ambivalent. However, it seems to be a typical feature that the composers uh, turn to em the empress uh, instead of the emperor. The piano album Erzsébet Emily therefore can be seen as a foundation of Empress Elizabeth's musical cult in Hungary. We must also point out that the various forms uh, of resistance were not radical, however, the recall of the era was. At the same time, we have to ask how and to what extent Cornel Abrani's writing and personal network uh, has an effect and uh, how, it uh, how it influenced uh, the thinking about the 19th century Hungarian musical life. Thus, it will be necessary to reevaluate his work in the following years. Based on recent research, it seems that the admiration for Elizabeth was much more about her position uh, and psychological role, as Geru said, than about the real deeds of the Empress. The piano album, Erzsébet Emily, contrary to Abrani's words quoted in the introduction, does not seem to have played an important role uh, later in the Hungarian musical life. Its effect was limited to the national and imperial representation of the 1857 visit. The significance of the album was presumably greater for Abrani than for his contemporaries. In summary, the Erzsébet Emily played an occasional role as a representative publication of a group of composers working in Hungary, and it was a national contribution to an imperial event. In doing so, it represents a dual loyalty, a loyalty to the nation and a loyalty to the empire, and also to Franz Joseph, who was only an Austrian emperor in 1857, as, Ab as Abrani reflected to him. So thank you so much for your... Thank you very much, Lily. It was a very interesting paper about this uh, networking. Uh, it could fit actually in gender studies as well, in many yes. layers, especially this uh, female of, of uh, societies that started, I think, at, at the mid 19th century. It was uh, similar in Zagreb also, and uh, all the nobility, the noble women who took part in founding it and so on. But the, the, it didn't start it like that, but actually, yes. Yes. No, but it is a, a special a connection between the empress and the Hungarian nation, I think, which is felt also in, in uh, this whole situation. Thank you very much. Thank you and so much. Uh, we will proceed to our last but not least paper by Clemens Kreuzfeld, who is a PhD student at the Viennese University of Music and Performing Arts, and who will uh, 
re, uh, uh, say something about a very interesting topic, music stores in antebellum Boston, a space of transatlantic networking. And with this transatlantic networking, we will uh, finish our work part and then we'll discuss in detail everything we heard here. Clemens. Thank you very much. Yes. Can you see the screen? Yes. Perfect. Yeah, my research originates from a research project which is currently running at the University of Music and Performing Arts Vienna and titled Musical Crossroads, Transatlantic Cultural Exchange 1800 till 1950, which analyzes music related processes of cultural transfer in a transatlantic space. The project is met, led by Professor Melanie Unzelt. The title of my lecture today is, as you just said, Music Stores in Antebellum Boston as Spaces of Transatlantic Networking. With the term antebellum, I am referring in my research to the time frame around 1800 until the beginning of the American Civil War, 1861. So what makes place and time frame so interesting from a transatlantic network perspective? What characterizes them? Boston experienced a rapid population growth during this period from around 18,000 inhabitants at the end of the 18th century to a six-fold increase by the middle of the 19th century. With its Atlantic Harbor, Boston functioned in a sense as a transatlantic link. On the one hand, it was an important hub for the transfer of goods, but on the other hand, it was just as important for passenger traffic. Here, the city experienced also an enormous increase in arriving passengers between the 1820s and 1850s. At the beginning of the 1850s, the number of arriving passengers per year was even higher than the population of the city. Main triggers were the crisis-related waves of migration from Europe, in which also numerous musicians happened to found themselves. Furthermore, this period is also marked by technical progress. The development of the steamboat increased the frequency of transatlantic crossing enormously, while at the end of the 18th century, the time frame for a transatlantic crossing was estimated to take about two months. This time had been reduced to two weeks by the middle of the 19th century. Major changes can also be observed in the city's musical life. The Federal Street Theater and the Boston Music Hall, for example, stand to a certain extent as symbols for this. Whereas the theater had to prevail against the resistance of the city's primarily Puritan population when it was founded around 1800, there was already something like a bourgeois sponsorship for the establishment of the Boston Music Hall towards the middle of the century. The period, period also witnessed a change in the narratives concerning the city's music culture. In 1820, a correspondent of the German language music magazine Allgemeine Musikalische Zeitung was still critical of the possibilities for European musicians to earn an economic living in the US. He wrote, quote, as it is already known, artists, except mechanical, among, are among the people in the US who are least in demand and in recent times have been even cautioned against immigration. By the middle of the 19th century, this narrative had already changed. Boston became repeatedly the scene of intellectual discourses on the value of music. In particular, the relationship with Europe played a prominent role in these debates and negotiation processes. This was also the time when the label Athens of America was established for Boston. In contrast to the narrative of the Allgemeine Musikalische Zeitung from the 1820s, by the mid 19th century, numerous European musicians undertook mostly economically successful concert tours with stops in Boston and other American metropolises. To name just a few here, Henri Vuitton, Ole Bull, Henri Hertz, or Jenny Lind. In a sense, the music trade acts as a mirror reflecting many of these developments. My research question asks 
to what extent did the music trade function as a space of transatlantic networking? I will focus on four aspects to address this question with a special emphasis on the last one. First, the transatlantic biographies of the music dealers. Second, their transatlantic trade networks. Third, transatlantic networks in their Boston-based publishing activities. And fourth, we will take a look at their business premises as a space of social transatlantic Atlantic networks. Most of the founders and owners of Boston music stores had come to their profession via detours. They had made their living as instrumentalists, composers, music teachers, or instrument makers. And even after they had gained a foothold in the music trade profession, they were often involved in the cultural and musical life of their time. Others had their roots in the book trade as well as in printing and logistics. It was often these preceding detours that led to the acquisition of the competencies necessary to successfully run a music store. There seemed to be three main areas of competence in which the protagonists of Boston music stores had experience when they entered the profession. First, they had musical training and thus practical musical knowledge, which they had acquired in the United States and often in Europe as well. Second, they were already networked with the international music cultural actors of their time and possessed knowledge of international music culture from the public sphere to the private sphere. And third, they had economic knowledge and the corresponding resources. The often encountered explicitly transatlantic character of these competencies stemmed from two sides. On the one hand, a considerable number of the music dealers active in the Northwestern metropolises of the US in the early 19th century had a migration background. At the same time, however, more and more native born Americans were drawn to the profession of music dealers, especially in the advanced antebellum period. The general increase in transatlantic mobility meant that these people often also had the corresponding skills that had been acquired on both sides of the Atlantic. One example I would like to briefly outline is the Boston music dealer Nathan Richardson, who had initially aspired to become a pianist before setting up a music store in Boston in 1853. He had attended a boarding school with musical training in Warren, Massachusetts, had spent a year for his musical training in Boston, and he continued his musical education as a pianist for several years in Europe. On the one hand, with teachers around the Leipzig Conservatory, and finally with Alexander Dreyschock in Prague. The musical competition he experienced in Europe led him though to decide to put his career as a professional musician aside and to open a music store in Boston. Their transatlantic biographical experiences also helped many music dealers to establish transatlantic trade networks. The import of sheet music and instruments from Europe was an essential part of their business. Nathan Richardson made his way back to Europe shortly after the plan to open a music store had matured. He dedicated a three month trip solely to build trade networks and purchase goods for his Boston music store. His stops during this journey included the publishing houses of Breitkopf and Hertel in Leipzig, Karl August André in Frankfurt, and I just checked he also stopped at Müller in Vienna. But transatlantic networks played a role not only in the import of music, but also in the music dealer's own publishing activities. Here only one small example shall be mentioned. Music dealers played an essential networking role, especially with regard to the publication of sheet music in the context of the concert activities of traveling European ensembles in the US. They were familiar with the ensembles and at the same time knew the tastes of their American clientele. This explains, for example, the origin of the piano song arrangements from the program of the so-called Rainer family which was published by the Boston music dealer, Oliver Ditson. The Reiner family was a Tyrolean ensemble that toured the US in the 1840s 
and achieved fame with its popular vocal pieces with an alpine cultural connection. The title page lithograph shows the five members ensemble in traditional costume, thus emphasizing their exotic effect. At the same time, among these pieces published with this title page are titles such as The Tyrolese in America or The Free Country with an explicitly American patriotic reference, a very hybrid marketing strategy. It is also interesting to note the reference in the, in the autobiography by the American musician John Hutchinson, which suggests the role of the music store owner as a translator for the ensemble. He wrote, quote, I could not understand their words. Ditson soon published their songs with English words, unquote. Besides the music dealers' transatlantic biographies, their transatlantic trade networks, and the transatlantic networks inscribed into their published music, one thing that has most often been neglected in research is the social dimensions of music stores. The business premises often played an important role for musical networking. The social quality of American music stores of the antebellum period was an important part of the owner's self-image. This is reflected in numerous lithographs depicting music stores. Images of music stores found their way onto the title pages of sheet music editions or into merchandise catalogs for advertising purposes. As seen here, the interior of the 1853 Boston Music Store founded by Nathan Richardson found its way into a catalog. The image alludes to the social actions in the business premises. Here, professional musicians and amateurs met and conversed. Information about forthcoming concerts was distributed. Concert tickets were sold and subscription lists or recommendations for suitable instrumental or singing teachers could be obtained. Many sources particularly emphasize the quality of stay in music stores for women. The role of musical education as a social status symbol increased rapidly among young American women during this period. Collecting and binding sheet music was a widespread practice in this context. A New York music store even hired a pianist that would play the sheet music for the customers before purchasing them. These multifaceted fields of activity were a prerequisite for a thriving company and they met the musical demands of the population. As traveling and migrating musicians arrived in the US, especially in the mid 19th century, some music dealers also began to cater to their needs. They offered themselves as concert agents. They functioned as employment agencies for musicians. They had the necessary contacts, contacts to the music press. And due to their international trade networks, as well as biographies, they possessed information about the international musical life. They also provided musicians in their store a postal station for receiving letters. An example of the letter aspect is, for instance, a surviving letter to the Boston music critic John Sullivan Dwight from the German-born New York music publisher and pianist William Schaffenberg. The letter is, in a sense, a letter of recommendation for Otto Goldschmidt, a German musician who had just arrived in the US. It reads, quote, my dear sir, in the bearer of these lines, I take the great pleasure of introducing to your acquaintance, Mr. Goldschmidt from Hamburg, a young artist of the timestamp, and therefore to me, and I'm sure also to you, very dear. But it is not only the fact that a New York music dealer stood up for his countryman that should be emphasized about this document. It is also noteworthy that Scharfenberg did not send the letter to Dwight's personal home address, but to the Boston music store of George P. Reed, as can be seen on the envelope. Apparently, the music critic Dwight went in and out of the store so regularly that it was suitable, a suitable postal address for him. Nathan Richardson had also explicitly taken into account the function of the music store as a place for musical networking when designing his store. 
the local music press called his business premises a space, quote, where artists congregate to hold exchange and try new music and read the latest musical journals of this country and of Europe, unquote. With an international clientele in mind, he had also hired multilingual staff. Quote, foreigners will find themselves quite at home in this store as French and German as well as English will be spoken. Nathan Richardson was not alone in this transatlantic network focus of his business. Also Boston piano maker Jonas Chickering had noticed the demand. His company was by the middle of the century the leading American piano manufacturer, employing several hundred people. In addition to the manufacturing facilities, the company's headquarters had practicing rooms for musicians and a showroom that could be converted into a concert hall. The author of a biography of the owner Jonas Chickering, published in 1855, writes, quote, for many years, these rooms were a sort of musical change and scarcely an event occurred in our little musical world which did not originate or was not matured there. Here, too, many artists have made the debuts and many foreign artists their first exhibition in the Western world, unquote. He thus attributed to the premises the function of a breeding ground for Boston's musical life, which was especially suitable as a laboratory for foreign musicians. Several musical associations formed concert series here. For example, the Harvard Musical Association, as well as the Mendelssohn Quintet Club, largely staffed with European born musicians. While with sheet music and instruments, two essential components of the material equipment of Boston music stores have been partially preserved today, especially in archives, the material space in which the trade with these goods took place no longer exists. Not only the short-lived nature of many businesses, but more importantly, Boston's population growth and associated urban development changes have caused the buildings in which sheet music and instruments were traded during the antebellum period to disappear from the city map. The absence or limited survival of, these, of this material space has also contributed to the fact that it and the social actions and practices carried out within it have gone largely unnoticed by music historical research to date. But as historian, historian Karl Schlegel states, quote, history plays not only in time, but also in space. Events have a place where they take place. History has its places. Thank you for the opportunity to present my research here. And I'm very much looking forward to our discussion and your questions. Thank you very much, Clemens. It was so interesting and the, the whole project must be uh, very nice. Uh, how long does it last already for? It's in its third, week, third year. Uh -huh. uh, it's a four year project or uh, shorter? It is a, it is a, it's currently a three year project, but we're running out of time. We probably need a few a few months more. <laughs> yes, it, it, it's, a, it's a research that never ends, actually. Yes, of course. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Uh, the session was really marvelous. And uh, I would like to ask you if you have any questions dealing with this last session now. And then we will switch to the general discussion. Uh, I have a question, Vera, if I may. Yes, go on. Uh, I, I could, uh, congratulations to everybody. I just, I just wanted to say how much I enjoyed uh, Clemens's fantastic paper. And I just had one question about those wonderful lithographs, and particularly the, uh, the one that featured in the Richardson's Musical Exchange catalogue because I've never seen a, a music store so grand in my whole life. And I mean, I, I, I find it hard. Is that an idealized image, do you think? Or, or, or is there any evidence to show that they really, that the music stores are really as um, magnificently and spaciously laid out as that, as that seems to suggest? 
Yeah, it's, it's, it's a tricky thing to like really like get close into the music story. As I said, like since it's a, it's a source problem. Yeah. First of all, it's quite fascinating that we have in the US, I found probably more than for that time period, I found more than 30 lithographs of music stores, of different music stores. And they all seem to have the same recurring theme, like crowded people, little glamorous with chandeliers and so on. Yeah. So there is like, there is a, a certain way how music dealers thought to represent themselves. That is like showing over and over again in different lithographs. And on the other hand, what is like probably the most valuable sources for me is, is uh, ego documents letters or newspaper articles as well, writing about the interior of, of music stores. The richest music store, for example, has even been referred to in, in German music periodicals that described in very detail how the interior looked like. So we can kind of like cross-read the lithograph as well as the written text mm -hmm. of actual people that went to that music store. That's but yeah, it's a tricky thing to get into the interior of these stores yeah. to find out about the social practices. Yeah, that's really interesting. I, I, but it sounds as if it, they may well have looked something like that from what you're saying, rather than just a kind of idealized emporium, which you, you sometimes get, you know, in other aspects of uh, trade history. You know, you see a, a, few, a, a palace really, but it may not have been the same. But to judge from what you're saying about those detailed descriptions, and also the what you should, the, the um, illustration of the Chickering piano uh, factory. These were obviously really were very large um, physical spaces. So that yeah. Well, what's quite interesting is that travelers, American travelers, are in the, in the middle of the 19th century traveling to Europe and visiting music stores in Europe, are actually often surprised how small the business premises are in Europe in comparison to the U.S. Well, that's. So that Obviously, actually, a size difference. Yeah, for sure. Always bigger in America, but 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 that that's really yeah. something. <laughs> Very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. The more questions, uh, Lucia, you have a question. Uh, thank you. Uh, I would also like to congratulate all uh, presenters because uh, it was uh, very rich and interesting. Uh, and uh, especially to see uh, how important letters are as a uh, source for research. And I would like to ask uh, Lily uh, about uh, musical letters. Uh, did I understand well that it is a database? I is it uh, open access? Uh, no, unfortunately. So uh, the case is that uh, several archives and several libraries had has uh, their have their their uh, own uh, database based on paper and it's it's mainly not uh, online mm -hmm. so uh, the database i made or the list i made in excel and then i transported to Gephi uh, or Jeffy. i don't really <laughs> i'm not sure about the pronunciation but um, but uh, so so you should make your own database now, which is a bit uh, a lot of time. Yeah. But uh, but it it should be done. It should have been done, and it it doesn't mean that uh, catalogs uh, doesn't exist or or don't exist. But uh, but it is it is a, a matter of time and uh, and um, places you have to go there and ex and you have to make your researches there. So it's not digitalized yet, but we hope that it's. Hopefully, yes. Thank you. And which uh, archives did you uh, take into consideration? I uh, went to uh, National Széchenyi uh, Library. Uh, they also have a, the the Hungarian Academy of Sciences also uh, has a, a manuscript collection, and uh, they they have um, musical letters too, and uh, and I think the the already published uh, letter material I I should use too, but in the case of Abrani, uh, for example, I don't really think or I haven't met any any like editions or, or publications based on uh, Abrani's letters, or correct me, please, if I'm wrong. But, uh, but 
yes, so so we 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 really have to deal with that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ivan, Ivan you have a question. Uh, yes, um, I, I, I missed the beginning of this discussion because I had a problem with my computer. Um, so this may have already been raised, but um, I would like to, well, uh, again, I would like to thank all the contributors. This is a really fascinating session. Um, and I, I have a, not so much a question, but an observation for Nikolai. As Nikolai knows, um, I have written about uh, uh, the meeting between modernism and, and orthodoxy uh, in, in, in the Balkan countries and not only. Um, and it, it strikes me, um, so there's this massive network that stretches between, well, as far away as Sinai, as you, as you mentioned, um, and, and Mount Athos and Thessaloniki and Bulgaria and Serbia and going into uh, France, Italy and, and Vienna. And, you know, this is an amazing thing. And I, I think that most people who have not worked on these topics um, don't really realize that. It's not news to us, of course, but um, <laughs> I think it's not much known about. Um, but what I was actually going to say was uh, this intertwines what you were saying about the printing processes and the network of these processes is intertwined with the idea of modernism. Uh, uh, most of the things I've written about this topic have to do with uh, stylistic modernism. But in fact, um, if you expand that narrative and think about um, uh, the invention of the printing press able to print Byzantine neumes, that is an a technological innovation, which is part of, of modernism. And of course, the access that they had uh, uh, to Vienna or, or Trieste or, or wherever it might have been uh, to, in order to get the books done. And of course, um, the, the fascinating thing that the, the first Greek books are actually printed in Romania in, in 1820. So um, uh, it, it, I hadn't really thought about it in those terms before, but, but it's an intertwined narrative. When, when we talk about modernism, of course, this coincides with the rise of the Balkan nation states, uh, Romania, um, uh, Serbia, Bulgaria, uh, they, all, they all become actual nations, as happens again in the uh, Mediterranean zone as well, during the course of the 19th century. And so they become exposed to uh, Western ideas, Western technology. Um, and I think this is a, a fascinating narrative to, to explore. And of course, in the case of Romania, it's particularly fascinating because you're um, in an Orthodox country that speaks a Latin language and has all these connections with France and with Greece and with, with the Slavs as well. It is, it's just extraordinary. So this is not really a question, it's just a, an observation. But so, thank you very much for your, for your paper. Well, thank you very much, dear Father, for, well, it's a very rich topic and, uh, you know, uh, there are a lot of links and, you know, connections to everything there in the Balkans not uh, only with Greece and Mount Athos. Uh, well, for, for sure, there are a lot of narratives there. We have to take into account that, okay, I, I, I just um, uh, I just tried to, 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 yeah, to, to picture this, uh, this, this topic, but in, in, in the fact there were a, lo a lot of links with Western Europe. We have to take into account that in the, in the mainstream of the uh, orthodox music in those times in about 1818 1820s uh, we have to take into account that part sometimes even music from the western world were uh, uh, were used in the daily life of the church mozart it, it's very fascinating i mean the center of the south is using this type of music and uh, sometimes the, the metropolis of Bucharest was okay, this is good, this is part of our, you know, contact with the Western world. So uh, we have on the one, one, one hand this very strong connection with the Constantinople and very strong, you know, tradition with the patriarchate of Constantinople, but as part of the, of the larger development and the you know, open gates to the Western world is this type of Western music coming into the principalities in Yash and Moldavia. And the, you, you know, one of these important musicians, Anton Pan, for instance, we have to, to, to take into account that uh, he actually firstly um, educating in Western music, not the Bucharest, but in Moldesta. And after that, he came back to Bucharest 
and starting this printing house in the uh, 30s, 1830s. So the, the topic is indeed very large and uh, I, I'm very happy that somehow I, I tried to connect this uh, Balk Balkan and uh, you know, Constantinopolitan environment with the Western musical practices. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Inya has a question. Yeah, hi, I'm, uh, so I have a question which is the same as Clemens put in the chat. Yes. <laughs> I really wanted to know, so I didn't want to. Uh, could you tell us about uh, which publications sold well uh, uh, from Miller? That's really interesting. The range is really amazing. So I'm just interested in which, which things sold well, which were used for teaching, or in which kind of audiences or uh, general public, uh, which types would buy these things? Yes, thank you so much for your question. Actually, I didn't get any clue about uh, how many scores have been sold by Müller. No information available about this in what I could find. Um, I only investigated the range, the thematic range and of region related music. <laughs> Other sort of scores I've mentioned that already, they were um, mostly for homemade music. Uh, and um, well, uh, it uh, seems to be a sort of small editing house um, which specialized in qualitative uh, prints for a certain audience. And what I could figure out is that for Müller, um, acquiring also music from um, little known regions was a sort of enlarging his assortment. But how much he sold, I don't know. I know that in Bucharest there were three music stores opened in that period and um, he was in connection with those stores. Uh, also Waffman was in connection with those librarians which belonged also to the circle of the Philharmonic Society. So this was also a sort of network. <laughs> yes, thank you. Yeah, that's very interesting. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh -huh. And Clemens had also a question here in chat. Uh, are there any surviving account books of Müller that would allow us to find out which publications sold how well? Which is the same. Yeah, yeah, that, 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 is, <laughs> that is it. I really wanted uh, to know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, I wanted to ask you something else. Uh, there was uh, an increase of uh, publications dealing with folk music and Slavic countries. And uh, do you know uh, when did Müller uh, did, the, did the revolution 1848 increase this or uh, give an impulse for uh, increase of this national issue uh, with music? Uh, well, but... definitely, yes. So mm -hmm. the share of uh, music related to, to political topics, uh, revolutionary songs, um, patriotic uh, pieces and so on. Um, it's quite well represented uh, within this part of the repertory. Mm -hmm. Thank um, you. So yes, it's, yeah. it's a consistent part of-, of uh, And just a specific question, uh, this uh, person, uh, Klapper, uh, for whom you Kappa. said- it, uh, yes. Kappa. Oh yes, sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. Kapper, yes, Siegfried Kapper. Uh, you said he lived in Croatia. Do you have any more precise information on him? Actually, um, I, I just uh, searched on internet about um, all these minor uh -huh. masters and yes. little known uh, authors. And there is a biography of him available. Okay, thank on you. Internet. Yeah, you're welcome. Any questions dealing with this paper, uh, this uh, session? Nikolai, you had a question. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, well, I'd like to ask, uh, hi Ganush, congratulations for everybody and their purpose. But uh, I'd like to ask now, uh, hi Ganush, um, how to say, how could you, what's about the promotion and marketing or commercialization of this type of anthologies, which include the popular music from Romanian principalities? in Central and Western Europe. 
I mean, were these anthologies intended for consumers in the Romanian principalities area exclusively or also in other areas of Europe or even, I don't know, Constantinople? Do you have any clues? Yes, so uh, if you look at the covers of uh, the notes, there are uh, different stores mentioned on them where these mm -hmm. notes were available. And one was in Leipzig, another one in Hamburg, and the third one in Bucharest. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, for other prints, there were other stores mentioned on the covers. But we cannot, I, I couldn't, I have no, um, no um, sources to rely um, and to, to be able to, to reconstruct uh, the distribution network mm -hmm. of a certain print so so far yeah thank you so much You're okay welcome. thank you very much i would just like to make a, a summary and uh aha uh -huh. emesha made a, a comment here that uh, you have a contrary in uh, transylvania okay thank you uh, uh i would like to make a, a short uh, let's say not, not summary but just a remark that uh, I want to thank all of you for your really excellent and most interesting papers. Uh, that was, a, well, uh, networking is a, a very broad topic, of course, but uh, the, your case studies showed us uh, uh, examples of the personal networks of nationally influenced networks and of intercontinental networks and uh, uh, when the proceedings will be published, there will be a very nice scale of changes of these paradigms throughout the uh, very long 19th century, because we have started in 1780s and we ended at, uh, in 1920s or even later, well, with some remarks, of course. And uh, uh, I'm very glad that uh, we covered this era of institutionalization of specialization and professionalization. These visions uh, which were very important for the 19th century and uh, through these case studies, it can be followed uh, the, the traces and the, the changes that were experienced throughout the 19th century. I would like uh, that uh, we publish uh, proceedings and uh, it would be either com complete or a selection that depends who will send and we will have it uh, reviewed, of course, as for all our uh, proceedings. And you will get uh, a note about that, uh, the uh, author's uh, guidelines. And uh, you have to count on that, that uh, you should send me the papers up to the mid-September. It is quite... Uh, it's not such a long time, but uh, I have my project till the end of the uh, till the end of October, and I want to spend money I have for that. So <laughs> please, uh, uh, you'll get you'll get the notes uh, immediately after the conference. And uh, I'm also grateful uh, to uh, graduate students and to postgraduate students, uh, to our PhD students who are quite a number of participants. And I think they showed us a really interesting uh, scope of their presentations. And now I invite you to give some comments on the entire conference and your uh, ideas about that. Nikolai, your hand is here. Uh, do you want to, to add something? <laughs> no, actually, it remains. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. I'm trying to. Yeah. I'm trying to. I'm trying to. Okay. Well, uh, listening to and reflecting, on what I've heard for the last four days here, well, some ideas just came across my mind, more general, maybe in character. So if you allow me, I would like to share them with you. And I've put them on, on paper 
early this morning, 5.45, was it? <laughs> <laughs> I woke up having this, this turmoil <clears throat> in my head. And I've put it on paper, not to, to take too much time of you by improvising. But firstly, research in networking, for me, makes necessarily part of social history of music and sociology of music. It is a phenomenon of eminently sociological order with a strong history-oriented approach. And secondly, networking is subdued to a kind of a psychophysical laws of action and reaction. The fisherman and the fish networking usually establish a two-way or even multiple relationship. Therefore, researchers have to take into account a polysidedness of the phenomenon as such per definizione. Thirdly, further research, including projects and manifestations like this conference, should include further interdisciplinary experts, along with cultural historians, we had some of, the, of them among us, not only sociologists of culture and psychologists of artistic creation, but also experts in management, business, marketing, transport, technique, internet programming, etc., should participate. Fourthly, a typology of networking should be worked out, taking into account various aspects of time and space determinants, as well as of both spiritual and physical reality. In this, the deconstruction of some idealistic myths might be replenished by a more objectively oriented new construction, and we heard some of, the, of them during this conference. And finally, networking is an ideal area in which freedom of human activities permanently confirms the possibilities of transcending existing social, psychological, political, and cultural limitation, limitations. It points at some new dimensions in our understanding of the sense and final goals of art production and dissemination of its products as eminently human individual and social behavior. So far for me, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, I think that uh, one of our keynote lectures and lecturers uh, definitely has a comment on, on the conference. Um, I think you must, must be referring to Philip, but he, he can't get through. <laughs> he can't get through, unfortunately, yes. Yeah. I'm only making you joke. So, um, well, I, I must say, um, I share those uh, ambitions that uh, Stanislav has uh, identified in that very thoughtful praise. Um, uh, the one thing that strikes me as somebody who lives on the edge of Europe and uh, who lives within a sort of geographical and even cultural sphere where the term periphery uh, is even more acute than perhaps it is in other parts of Europe, uh, is that, um, and I don't mean this unkindly, I mean it very seriously, that there is a kind of uh, cultural, um, like almost like cultural concentric circles of, of musical activity happening within Central Europe and, and Western Europe generally, which are nevertheless still dominated by uh, Western European models. Now, not, not exclusively and certainly not in the case of uh, uh, church music, but even actually in terms of the organization of almost all kinds of music, um, there, is a, there is a sense in which uh, patterns are, are repeated from one place to the next. And that, the, the only reason I draw attention to that is because it probably promotes the usefulness of the kind of topology that Stanislav just mentioned um, with regard to how music travels and how music is cultivated. And even though, you know, as I said, I think, couple of days ago or maybe even yesterday um, again as a as a peripheral person you know it's extraordinary to, to me how Liszt and Brahms uh, and the, the musicians around Liszt and Brahms I mean Joachim and, and so on are, are constantly being invoked and the models that they propose are constantly being invoked that 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 would strike me as something that perhaps bears more uh, examination. I, I was at a conference last weekend, for instance, in which Liszt and Brahms featured, and you would not be able to relate the Liszt and Brahms who showed up, as it were, in Dublin 
with the list of brahms we we're hearing about today now there's no harm in that uh, that just shows you something about the ex the extent of their of their um uh influence but nevertheless um I do think that we should uh, probably be a little more reflective perhaps of this tendency to repeat patterns so that even though you, you can bring forward new information about what's happening in Bratislava or what's happening in Budapest or what's happening in Zagreb, you know, some degree of self-reflection on why this is happening and why, what, it, what it reflects, almost a kind of a Central European consensus as to how music behaves, I think would be worthwhile. I mean, that was one reason, if I may dare just for a second, uh, to draw attention to, to my own work for this conference, uh, that, that, that the kind of quote-unquote universality of generic uh, behavior in music is unbelievably under-researched. It hardly even uh, registers with people who practice generic theory. And... Um, when uh, when Domagoy spoke this afternoon or this morning about the the um, the 1916 concert in in, uh, in Zagreb concerts I should say in Zagreb and told us that you know Dora Piacevic was the first person to uh, Croatian person to compose a piano concerto I just said to myself well doesn't that tell you something I mean you you know you have an enormous national theatre. Uh, going strong in the 1890s and a strong operatic tradition going much further back in Zagreb. And yet, you know, you, you only happen upon the piano concerto as early as, or as late as, as, uh, as the 1920s. And I think that, that, you know, when one thing happens and another thing doesn't happen, uh, and I mean this particularly with regard to uh, musical networking, that it is important to ask questions about the kinds of music that are being networked not only how the music is being networked, not only the political or cultural motivations that animate the networking of music, but why that kind of music is being networked and why it often seems to go in one direction only. Uh, so we've heard an awful lot about music in Croatia in this conference, magnificent uh, research and many other places. But again and again, you will find that a lot of the Croatian music tends to halt at the borders of Croatia and correspondingly, a lot of the music that's being cultivated is being taken directly in from the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So I just think that those, those issues of the, not just the generic behavior, which is my own particular interest, but just the, shall we say, the repertorial behavior of the music that is being networked uh, is something that should, I think, be more vigorously researched than, than, than even this excellent conference would suggest. It's just a thought that I'm putting out there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Harry. Uh, yes, you are right. Uh, being uh, a periphery, I think everybody uh, experiences the position of the periphery or semi-periphery, because within your own country, you have a center and a periphery, and you have a central figure or central institution and the peripheral one. So, so this, uh, let's say, like a pyramid, uh, is a manifold, uh, which has to be researched and explained. Yes. Uh, uh, and I think the, the networking is a term which can be applied to all aspects of human life, but uh, dealing with arts now in a broader sense also, uh, it can be experienced also in very detailed points. So you, you, can, you can elaborate it from many, in many layers and in many uh, particular details. Well, abs absolutely. And, and my last thought on that is that you also have to take account of the, the politics of culture in this regard, yes. the cultural imperialism of German music in particular. I mean, since I mentioned uh, Brahms, uh, Brahms' uh, hostility towards Vorjak's uh, uh, nationalism. We had a very interesting paper yesterday mm -hmm. uh, on this issue uh, with regard to Vorjak and, and his, ambig his political ambiguities. But I'll tell you, Brahms wasn't uh, ambiguous about Vorjak's uh, Czech nationalism. He was very hostile towards it, even when it mas manifest manifested itself in the most mild manner. And again, I think that that probably has some bearing, at least, on the reception of uh, Czech music in in Austria, as distinct from the reception of Austrian music 
in Bohemia, which is a completely different matter. So again, something I think that perhaps needs to be borne in mind, particularly when this whole domain of research about how did the music travel and, and, and who was doing the circulating and the networking. I think those kind of issues could maybe come to the surface a little bit more. Yes, thank you very much. Anybody else having a comment? Huh. We now miss a glass of wine to say cheers to all of you and to, ah, Ivan has already won. <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> yes, well. It's lunchtime uh, here. <laughs> it's lunch. It's lunchtime, you are right. And uh, in usual, uh, in the normal times, we would now go together to have a lunch and continue with uh, a real networking. So uh, I hope these times will come soon and uh, that we will meet very, very soon in similar or same uh, constellations in, uh, in the real life. Um, I for, forgive me for interrupting again, but it's for fear that nobody else would say it. I'm sure we're all thinking the same thing, which is that we owe the greatest thanks and gratitude to dear Viera for her enormous work. And also to all of those uh, students who helped in the background hosting and-, and Sarah, and, Sarah above all, Sarah, Sarah was our host today. Sarah did a magnificent job. And so I would just say, let's give a big round of applause to our <laughs> wonderful hosts and organizers. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I should actually thank to the Croatian Science Foundation, although it gave me some sleepless nights, but uh, enabled me to, to uh, carry out this uh, nice project on musical networking. And uh, the result, I think the best result was this meeting here. Excellent. And don't forget about proceedings. Okay. okay. See you, see you in Zagreb. Okay. Bye-bye. See you in Zagreb. Thank you. Thank you very Bye. much. Bye. 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 Thank you, Bill. Bye. Greetings. Greetings to Linda. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Sara, hvala na svemu. Nema problema, evo, glavno da je sve prošlo. Super je prošlo sve. Da, da, nije osta, da nisam ostala bez interneta ili nešto već. Ne, dobro je funkcioniralo zbilja, bez problema. Da, da, nije, pa kažemo, to nikad ne znate, ne? Da. Kretite iz moje strane. To je bilo ne. jako sadržajno. I... Mislim da je bilo jako dobrih referata i hvala vam, jako ste se iskazali. Mislim, uopće da je hrvatska ekipa bila dobra i uh, da znamo funkcionirati ovako. Moramo, šta ćemo. Jasno. Sad, nas, sad nas još čeka drugi tjedan muzikološko društvo. Dobro, to. Ali mislim da... Samo malo. Još kraća. Dobro, lako, te, tebi ti ćeš izbijeći većinu. <laughs> A možda i neće, možda će biti u Zagrebu. <laughs> A, budući da, da očito audicija Nix. Aha. Jel? Pa ne javljaju se sada. Aha, da, 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 to nemoj nikad, ne možeš znati, možda se jave dan ranije u nadi da... A mislim, malo da se da. sprema koliko može, jer sad krenu nastupi, pa se, evo sad, zato nije ni tu. Trinata, e, još smo live na YouTube-u, samo da znate možda da se... 